if you just do it, it'll turn out okay. Unfortunately, I have COVID right now, so it's not that okay, but I am feeling a little bit better. But how, how is my guest doing today? Uh, I definitely don't have COVID, so that's good. Really sorry to hear that you got COVID. Um, uh, this last a uh, couple uh, this last week has been pretty crazy on like the international news front uh but other than that i've been good yeah and and we're here for a, a much less heavy topic today than the last time i was here <laughs> uh, yes well it's it's still about an invasion, but but not, not with less guns and, and and tanks. Well, is it really about an invasion? We'll answer that here today. <laughs> All right. so welcome everyone to the arrival uh of the Anglo Saxons. Yeah, I, I'd like to actually ask you a question to begin this off. What ideas do you have about the uh, Anglo-Saxon invasion? Like, what do you think happened? Well, well, just from well, just from what I, I've read and heard from other other places, so. I, I I have heard I saw a thing where. The Brits invited some of the Anglo Saxons over here, over there, over here, there, over there. They, they invited them to come over to where they were to help to protect them from the north northern people. Well, and, and also the Irish, but yeah, pretty much. And then they're like, hey, over here, they're like, we like it here. We're gonna stay. <laughs> yeah. Worst de worst deal in the history of deals, <laughs> but um yeah I think that this is a perfect period because uh, we don't know much about what happened actually. Uh, if any part of Europe actually went through a dark age, it is England during this time, and this was this is actually a perfect uh, place to talk about how we learn what happened in history. Uh, how that brings in shortfalls into our understanding of what happened in England after the fall of the Roman Empire, and also a little bit of how um, archaeology and other stuff is helping us tr try to figure it out. All right. So how do we do history? H history... We write down or we draw pictures of it on cave walls. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a lot of people think history is just recitation of uh, of dry facts and dates. Can you actually go to the next slide, please? Oh, I suppose I could. Oh. Um, but that's not actually uh, – history is more of a method than it is learning about dry recitation of facts. Most of the time – when you're in a history course, yeah, you learn about the facts, but you're also doing different assignments to make sure you know how to ev evaluate sources and know what sources to look at. So the biggest, like the, um, if you've got like a hierarchy of sources that you want to use in, in historical research, the highest, like where you've got the king and feudalism, is the primary source. The primary source is an artifact, document, diary, manuscript, autobiography, recording, or any other source of information that was created at the time under study. So um, any books written at the time, that's a primary source. Yes. Um, and, and plus, and plus, I just say this. Sometimes it's also nice to have, have if you can, if, it's not always possible, but to get get the sources from both sides of the of the equation, like get 
like you get sources from the Anglo-Saxon side, sources mm-hmm. from the the, inv- the people that are invading side, so you have a full picture of what's happening. Yes, that that is pretty important. How um How that, that actually the, that actually just, falls sorry. that actually falls under the historiography thing more, but yeah. Uh, you you need your primary sources. The problem is is that Sometimes usually the, the winner only only the winner gets the right stuff down. Yeah, well that and also usually what historians use when we do history. Well, I shouldn't say we. I I, I just have a degree in it, but yeah. Usually what you do is um, you look at literary sources, but for. Britain during this time, you only really have one good literary source, and he's not even that good. Um, so mostly what you have to do is look at um, archaeology, um, the archaeological evidence, even though, it, you know, it, it's not as perfect either. And the problem is, is that before we started using that stuff and when we took the words of the historians um, directly, we actually had a bad, we had a very biased look at um, how this occurred. And in the, and in a way you might not expect, but um, so secondary sources are, are like the next uh, these are people secondary. that they are people that weren't there, but that might know someone that was there. Uh, actually, it's a document or recording that relates or discusses information originally presented elsewhere. So most of your big history books, like the book I was reading f- to research for this, um, the Anglo-Saxon world, that's a secondary source. Um, Bead for this period is a secondary source, but for the periods around the time in which he is writing, he is a primary source. So a secondary source can change even between um, things. Uh, Chaucer would be a secondary source for much of the stuff he's talking about, even though most of what he's talking about didn't actually happen. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he, he'd be a secondary source. Tertiary sources, these ones... Uh, don't cite them in a history paper. Do not. These are encyclopedias and dictionaries. Um, just a collection of secondary and primary sources to um, have the information down. And, uh, you know, like Wikipedia, for all the crap it gets, it's actually pretty good. Um, but it's a tertiary source. Usually, if you're going into a subject you know nothing about, you can go to Wikipedia, find out the base information, and then go to the different um, sources and get deeper information. But one of my one of my favorite parts about doing the history process is historiography. Uh, historiography is trying to get into the uh, headspace of the person writing your primary or secondary source and critiquing them. Uh, finding their biases and using that to make an argument for why you're correct and uh, to ensure that the reader knows the biases, especially of primary sources. So um, we're actually going to do a little historiography. If you go to the next slide about our different sources. Okay. Number one is the sky. Gildas is our only true primary literary source from this period. You have some little writings that might be from St. Patrick, but it doesn't really talk about what's going on. Um, You do have this Gallic Chronicle, but it's mostly talking about what's happening in modern day France at the time. And all it does is say, uh, yeah, a lot of Britain got conquered by the Anglo-Saxons. So Gildas's book is On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain, written sometime between 490... Oh, I am very sorry about that. 
Uh, written sometime between 490 and uh, 550 uh, CE. So we don't really know. Uh, and he's not trying to write a history. What you, what you kind of... There's no chronology to what he's doing. And what he's trying to say, which is something Beat actually reflects in his writings, is the British people have left, like have um, strayed away from God and gone towards wealth and stuff like that. And that is leading and that is leading to their ruination at the hands of the Saxons, essentially. I, so this guy was a monk. Yeah. Well, most of the people writing stuff at this time are monks. Um, Cause they're your, they're your only, literary class. Only ones that could, the ones that could write besides maybe, 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 maybe you're not royalty. Uh, interestingly or, enough, um, later on, Alfred the Great had to teach himself how to write, and so did Charlemagne. I'm pretty sure. So yeah, not even the royalty knew how to write. They, they just had people along with them that they used to write things. But yeah, it's a it's a polemic. Essentially, he's trying to say, uh, crap's gone bad because uh, we need to go back to God, and that's why everything is happening. He does talk about some battles that occurred, um, the F Battle of Mount Baden, which uh, for those people that think that Arthur is a real person, uh, that is a... Uh, it was, uh, they think that's that's one of the battles he fought in. Um, was that the, was, wasn't that the name of the, the the queen's dead husband in England now? Oh, are you thinking of Boudicca? Oh, no, no, no. You're thinking of Mount Batten. No, uh, this is M O. This is Mount B A D O N. Uh, oh, okay. But Mount Batten is something else, based on German. But uh, oh, no. Okay. That guy's not alive anymore. Uh, Prince Philip died. That's why I said, I said his. I said, I said, that's why I said her dead husband. Oh, I didn't hear that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, what's more interesting about Gildas is that he is writing during this period, and that he's writing in really good Latin. He's clearly had a Roman education all the way in the sixth, uh, late fifth, early sixth century. When you'd think that Rome would, all influences of Rome would have been gone by now. But we've clearly got some vestiges of Rome because Gildas was or a at least, Or at least the Roman church, not the Roman government. Yeah, but, you know, Gildas had a Roman education. Yes. And there were clearly apparatuses that remained. Um, The next guy... Kind of looks a lot like me, doesn't it? All right. It, it's you. <laughs> so, uh, Bede is actually writing uh, in the 8th century. He's writing in like the 730s. And there's actually three books that he uh, writes about this early period. The Greater Chronicle, the Lesser Chronicle. <laughs> And uh, the famous one, the Ecclesiastical History of the English People. So, essentially, he uses Gildas a lot. Um, he also uses... Uh, there was this saint. Oh, I forgot what his name was. Um, well, there was this saint that came to Britain. And uh, in the story about him... Uh, the part where he's in Britain only lasts a couple of lines and just essentially says, yeah, there was still a road system. Um, there was still like a government to ensure that this guy was able to do what he was doing and request him to come because there was a big uh, problem with a, a group of heretics called Pelagians, I think. Um, yeah, Pelagians. Um, 
And apparently this saint led a battle against the Saxons and won. So he uses that, but he mostly builds off of Gildas. So essentially, <laughs> but he's trying to write a history. So he's trying to get the chronology out of Gildas where there is no chronology, which is a problem. Um, and he also weaves in some new stories, uh, like the various different kings that founded the um, Anglo-Saxons. He's the one who talks about Hengist and Horsa for the Jutes. Um, the founder of the Mercians is Ichel. Um, the founder of Wessex, the, and this couldn't have been somebody from Germany because his name is Celtic. So that's one of the reasons why you, you know this person's not a real person. Uh, Cheredich. Uh, is actually a Celtic, an Anglicized Celtic name. So he couldn't have been from Germany, and he couldn't have come over to form the Kingdom of Wessex. But this is the supposed ancestor of Queen Elizabeth and the English line. So he's right. working. He's working with scraps. He doesn't really have anything. Uh, but he also, he's not actually a fan of these early English. He says that they only do what because they're pagans at this point. He says they're only able to, to do what they did because the British went away from God. Essentially what Gildas says. And um, a, so, a lot. Huh? So question real fast. So is B writing about the time he's living in now or the time that that the, the previous guy was writing that was living in? He's talking about a time before before he's living in. So he's okay, talking so about when Gildas was alive. Okay, and so not his own time then. No. Uh, he also writes about his own time, but this is this this is like th the beginning of his book talking about cuz he's trying to get the entire history of the English people. So Okay. Yeah. So this is his more secondary source time. Um on Interesting clue for later on is that he says the only thing differentiating the Britons from the English is language. Uh, the Brit, the Britons speak Brythonic and the English speak English. And that's the only thing differentiating them. Um, I don't think it's important to talk about the biases of him right now because... You know, it doesn't really factor in, but... Um, but he was very biased? Uh, yes, because uh, he does not like Mercia, and he really likes his home of Northumbria. <laughs> so the, the, that's essentially... Because they were rivals when he was alive. Mm -hmm. um, so th those are... That's it. That's all we have for literary sources. Our non-literary sources is going to be mostly archaeology and we have some genetic evidence as well and um language and place names differences so there's clearly a change in material goods um but these material goods do have an influence from both germany and from the isles um which later anglo-saxon uh, true Anglo-Saxon material goods definitely have a blend of these things. Um, and if you're thinking that there's a massive migration, you'd think that there'd be some depopulation so that the newcomers could come in. But there's little evidence of this. There's little evidence of any depopulation. Like there's no forces, forest growing back or anything like that. So is, is this picture a, a flood or is this buried under dirt and stuff? This is a Grubenhauser. So uh, essentially what the Anglo-Saxons like to do is they like to build um, houses that were slightly underground. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, these are the um, most common building found in Anglo-Saxon settlements and evidence for other sorts of sunken featured buildings 
Um, you do have evidence of halls, but these are much harder to find because they don't seem to be um, like dug into the ground. They just seem to be like these big buildings. And so it's kind of hard to tell where they are. Um, the genetic evidence is a little confusing because um, the mitochondrial uh, DNA suggests no population change at all. So the people that were living there before are still living there after. But the Y chromosome data does have some similarities, surprisingly, to the Basque region of Spain and France and also just Western Europe in general. But uh, mostly from the Basque region up to West, uh, Western Germany. Uh, and if you know anything about mitochondrial DNA, you only get that from your mom. Uh, y chromosome, you get that from your from your, from your dad. dad, and only if you're a boy. Um, I don't think you. Unless you, I, I think, you might no, I your, think that's only the mitochondrial DNA. You only no, get that from your mom. No, is it Y chromosome th through the? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what this might suggest is a sort of apartheid system where you have some newcomers coming in, taking all the women and stuff like that. But uh, some of the archaeology doesn't really support that either. So more, more research needs to go into that. And then the language and place names, uh, a lot of place names change. You do have some place names that keep... Very Brythonic sounding names. Um, Northumbria is actually made up of two different kingdoms. The northern one is Bernicia, which is a, a Brythonic name. And the southern one is Dyra, which is also a Brythonic name. Um, uh, you have people with... Um, later on, a king of Mercia is named Penda. That's clearly a Brythonic name as well. And the the legendary founder of Wessex, Cheredich, that's also that's um, related to Caraticus, which is a Brythonic name. Um, but most cities, uh, a Grubenhauser, it's a Grubenhauser, yeah. I'm trying to get my German in. I don't know if I've got it right. You'd have to ask a German person. He might be like, no, you got it wrong. But hey, um, only, only a couple of settlements keep their um, earlier names. London is a big example of it. Um, oh, Kent also largely keeps its name as well. Kent is... a uh, that kingdom. Uh, I'll show you in the next thing because it'll be there. But yeah. So this suggests population change or a high status for the incomers. Like um, like a prestige class. Like you, you want to be that. And very little. There's very little. Um, you definitely have um, loan words coming into English. But very little. One of them is a lot of settlements will end their their name in Wich, W-I-C. That comes from Latin. <laughs> uh, Wich comes from uh, Vicus in Latin, and it's usually used to mean a settlement. So, um, Eovor Wich, which is York, is a good example of that. Um, and then you also have Chester, which modern day Chester, uh, that's where it gets his name, comes from Castrum, which is a fortification. Um, but other than that, you don't really get much, um, loan words from Brythonic or Latin into, um, this language. So uh, from all of this, uh, let's try to figure out our his 
let's try to figure out our history. But there's one last thing that I do want to talk about, which is very important for how the the um, uh, settlement occurs. And that's the next slide. And that is geography. Yes, this is a topographic map of the British Isles. Um, as you can see, in the north, you got a mountains. bunch of mountains. You have, uh, which is the Scottish Highlands. You do have some lowland areas there. Um, uh, it's called Lothian today, but I don't. It's between the Scottish Highlands and the next mountains. The the mountains in the middle. Uh oh no. The pet the oh my gosh. Why am I blanking on the name? Um Bert. You see, Wales is very Not mountainous me. as well. Uh the Pennines, the mountain range that goes from Scotland all the way down. Uh, is called the Pennines. Uh, so you notice a trend that in the west it's more mountainous, in the east it's more flat and valley. And that is not all, the flat and valley areas is not only where you get most of the Romanization from when Roman Britain was a thing, but it's also where you get the most Anglicization from um, the English migrations. So a lot of the more Roman parts of Roman Britain get conquered, which, <laughs> yeah. But the parts that stay very British and don't fall into English hands until much later, they're far more mountainous, less fertile. Um, uh, oh. I wish I knew how I could point this out, but there's some areas in here that are just boggy swamp lands that are act that, especially during this time. So Kent is that little dongle in the southeast. The little dongle. That's the only thing I know how to call it. Uh, that that's, just, that's just funny because that means because that could mean something else in, in, in today's in today's thing. Ah. Uh, it's the, it's the place. It's the place closest to France. <laughs> I know you said Kent's a little dongle. Yeah. Uh, Inside joke for people that don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, I guess I don't know. What? No, it doesn't matter. But yeah. Uh, so. And then, so now let's get into our actual history. Hello, shipfish. All right, so, come on. Ro so Roman Britain back to the t back to the time when when they invaded and that black line up there is the wall I'm guessing yeah that's Hadrian's wall um what the wall in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire is based off of so your original invasions of Britain too actually happened in 55 BCE by <laughs> uh, 55 BCE by Julius Caesar. Um, somewhat successful, but not really. Um, he essentially invaded because he said some Gallic leaders were fleeing because. There were actually a lot of Gallic tribes that had recently moved into Britain at the time. And he said that these uh, tribes were essentially harboring uh, some Gallic leaders. So he has to go get them. Uh, he nearly gets his army destroyed both times. He gets out of there. But after that, e economically, Britain is southern Britain especially is tied to Rome. So you actually get early Romanization during this time, especially amongst the elite and the monarchies in the area. You start seeing Roman coins and all of that. Yeah, and I see a city called um, Londinium. I don't ever happened to that city. Never heard of uh, it before. Becomes and, and London, it, and it never it faded away from existence to never be important ever again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Um, actually, a lot of modern c cities are on here. Um, Camilla Dunham is modern day um, Colchester. Eberacum is modern day York. Um, I think I can't. Glevum, right there. That one is um, Gloucester. Um, you so these are the basis of a lot of modern cities. Um, when the Romans finally show up in um, the first century, it's essentially because uh, there was a coup in Rome. You had the first crazy guy who was emperor, Caligula. Oh, um, yeah. So a lot of the names changed during this period with the uh, coming of the... Uh, so Eberacum to York is actually a three-stage process. You have Eberacum, and then when the uh, English arrive, it's Eovorwich. Uh, which actually means boar city, which is kind of weird. And then when the Vikings come in, it becomes Jorvik. And then you finally get York out of that. Um, some of a lot of these cities they lost their names because they were completely destroyed, they were completely abandoned. And then later on, later English settlements sprouted up in these areas and they had new names. Yes, boar city. <laughs> so there was a coup in uh, Rome Caligula gets Caligula actually um, originally goes to invade Britain but it ends up not happening there's a lot of speculation as to what happened and if he actually declared war on the sea and stuff like that um, that's not for this video and then his um uncle claudius who actually had a limp and a stutter i think becomes emperor he was never supposed to be emperor but he was the only one that they didn't really kill out of the imperial family when they overthrew caligula because like that, that, really... was that was that claudius yes claudius and claudius decides he's gonna do what julius caesar couldn't so that he could so that he can cement his position on the imperial throne and he invades britain uh and all the escapades that is ensue i think so i'm not sure um because there was another claudius but He's less famous because he he was one of those emperors in the crisis of the third century. So there were, there were like a million emperors at that time. And his name was Claudius Gothicus. But uh, this is the much more famous Claudius because he's actually a good emperor who didn't die. Because Claudius Gothicus is actually a good emperor, but he died. Um, well, eventually this Claudius did too. But yeah, that's not important. <laughs> So probably, yeah. Um, so he shows up. Originally, uh, originally, Roman Britain was cent centered around what on this map is called Maxima Caesariensis, but this is these are um, later subdivisions that occur. This was about the time of this is when that uh, Boudica thing happened. Uh, Boudica happens under Nero. Which okay. is later next 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 emperor? Yes. Um, funnily enough, uh, Claudius had a son named Britannicus who was supposed to become king. I mean, not king, emperor. Oops. Oh no. <laughs> who was supposed to become emperor? But then, um, uh, Agrippina the younger, Agrippina the younger, who was the wife of claudius and also his cousin i'm pretty sure um who is his second wife and not the mother of britannicus but the mother of nero uh yeah uh she kills 
Britannicus and then later Claudius, and that's how Nero becomes the emperor. Yes, Boudicca is really cool, but we also don't know much about Boudicca, sadly. Um, Because I, I wish we could know a lot more about her. She actually burnt down Camula. The original capital of Roman Britain was Camula Dunham, but she burnt it down. She also burned down Londinium, but they decided to build back up the new capital at Londinium. Um, so the, well, for her, the capital of London today still might be might be a Candimium that can a Candum then. Yeah, modern day Colchester. It could have been. You can act. You can actually go to. Uh, <laughs> I'll just make it all. <laughs> a lot of historians do that. Yes, um, and that's why primary sources are sometimes hard. Um. Primary fan fiction sources. Yeah, sometimes they just make stuff up, you know? Like the whole um, story that Aeneas is the founder of Rome and all that. Well, not the founder, founder of Rome, but, you know. What the, the that's the, the guy, that, I, I think I heard that. He, is, something, he escaped from the Trojan War and found Rome or something. Yeah. Uh, the Britons actually thought that they originated from another person that um, fled the um, Trojan War, Brutus. Um, they thought they were the descendants of Brutus, interestingly enough. So more made-up history. So I've so there's now there's two – I've heard two – off topic real fast, I know, but – so now there's two uh, random uh, – Roman origins. One's, one came, they came from the Sea of Troy. Other one is a random two random twin babies came out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, the twin babies. Um, <laughs> the twin babies are descendants of Aeneas. Oh, okay. They're so Romulus okay. and Remus. They're the actual founders of Rome. But Aeneas, uh, he's the uh, progenitor of the Latins who the Romans are a subset of. But that doesn't that that story doesn't happen until the reign of Augustus. We are getting way off topic. Uh, back, back to Britain. <laughs> so Britain was always on the fringes and was never really conquered. So you always had to have soldiers there. So the economy became ex extremely focused on the military. In the highland zones, like Wales and the Pennines, it's about resource extraction for the army. While in the lowland zones, the richer zones where you get more Romanization, it's about bringing stuff not only to the army, but also to the different imperial administrators that come in, getting them like the wine they want and the other goods from the rest of Rome. Um, so that's why you get more Romanization in these lowland zones where you have administrators and stuff like that. So they want, they want their lives to be as Roman as possible, but you still have a lot of, um, Britons staying Britons, so like Brythonic, which is the language of the Britons, uh, it's it stays the common language, and a lot a lot of people either only spoke Brythonic or would speak Latin to the people they needed to uh, speak Latin to. Also, compared to other provinces of the Roman Empire, there is very little uh, like documents from this time i think only like yeah i don't really remember i just know that it pales in comparison to a province like africa like by a couple times like mul multitudes <laughs> africa has multitudes of documents you could drown in them while you th while the british ones would only be up to your ankles <laughs> and um you can, you can wait you can wait in them yeah um, and a lot of the cities remain small in comparison to the other, um, 
the other provinces. The only real city that ever gets to want, like the status of a of a Gallic city, which Gaul is France, by the way, just to make sure you can actually see it. Gallia. Um, is London, of course, because that's the main administrative capital of Roman Britain. So you never really get full Romanization, and most of the Romanization sticks among the aristocracy and the people living in the cities, which becomes a problem later when you want to actually have um, uh, Rome, like if you want Britain to go the same way France did. Um, so some bad things happen. Rome, so the, the third century of the Roman Empire, the third century really, crisis. Yeah, it's, it's really bad. Um, just endless civil war, endless. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, did you ever see? Did you ever see the uh, the the third century song about this, about the Roman no. Roman stuff? Uh, I gotta share with you that real fast. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. One second. I keep on talking. Oh, um. Uh, so the crisis of the third century sees a mini collapse of the British economy because uh, the troops weren't in Britain for a lot of the time. You still had to have them to, and because of that, lots of bad stuff happens. You get the Picts coming down. The Picts live in modern day Scotland. They like doing their little raiding stuff and you get a mini collapse in Britain. But after them, um, the Romans are, and even for a time, Britain was underneath another empire called the Gallic Empire, which was a breakaway state of Rome. But eventually it gets reincorporated into the Roman Empire. And this is one of the first, first uh, times where Britain decides, I don't want to be part of the Roman Empire. But in rebels, but then the Romans de destroy the rebellion and then they're forced to. And then they're like, okay, Rome, come back. We like you again. We're getting raided and stuff. Our economy's collapsing. Please come. Please come. But, but they couldn't because they are being invaded. <laughs> well, uh, they do come back and that's the dominate, which is the next period, but. Can't really go to the next slide when you're looking for a video. Oh, okay. So you actually get a reorganization of the province. Um, those provincial borders in the last slide were actually from the Dominate. So you get two main capitals at this time. You have Eboricum, modern-day York, and Londinium, modern-day London. Um, the Duke of... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure – oh, never mind. I don't know. But you you have two dukes, essentially. No. The York one was a duke, and the commander of the Saxon Shore was a count. Never mind. Um, so you get the Saxon Shore because you actually get raiders coming from um, what will become the Anglo-Saxons uh, coming across. So you actually have to ha have – Fortifications built down there. Oh, oh. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. There. Oh. Uh, and my like my friend's connection disappeared. Okay. Welcome back. Yeah, okay. So are we going to watch that video now or later? Uh, yeah. Sure. Now, since we're in that part, this is very funny. I got to show it to you. I, I, I hear it or not. 
It hasn't started yet. I see the audio works. Tell me if you can hear it or not. I, I can't hear anything. And a what? What? Two, three. Them rooms. I can hear it. Yeah, I can hear it. What? Okay. I can hear them, it. Yeah. Rome's gonna all stab. Rome's them Rome's gonna all stab around. Third century crass go around. Let's count. The emperor's down. The first got committed. Soon after the sun. These guys they in charge three months. But then they got killed by Praetorians. And I had a pretty good run. But he died in battle or by treason. And that's just the first six years. The next emperor that fighting this dude who battled with us and I screwed. Then his son took away what shrewd out of plague. The next one got murdered by his own. Months later, it happened again. And then came Emperor Larian, captured by the Sassanids. Well, Valari forced to drink hot gold or skinned alive, depending on the. Jails told his son ruled with the need and got trolled its conspiracy murder again. His successor died after one year and who killed the next is unclear. But things evened out because here comes a real yawn. Yeah, yeah. yeah a real And there's the song. A real He doesn't actually end. Um, He doesn't actually end. The third century crisis because he eventually gets killed too. He just reunites the empire after it's split into three different pieces. Um, the guy who actually yeah. ends it is a guy named Domitian, but yeah, and he forms the tetrarchy, which is the rule of four, which doesn't really, he actually doesn't die as emperor in 305. Oh. Okay. And he's done again. Welcome back I'm again. Back. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Domitian actually doesn't die in office. He resigns in 305 and forced his co... So, okay. Yeah, you're so the topic. Tetrarch... That's, that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of important because actually... Because yeah. uh, Constantine... But you get, you have two Augusti and two Caesars. The Caesars are the junior emperors, and the Augusti are the senior emperors. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, eventually one of them is the father of Constantine the Great. You know, the guy who brings Christianity to Rome, and he actually uh, ruled from Britain. Um, ah, so, enough, this, and, so this so this does affect, is this affecting what we're talking about now? Yeah, Constantine is actually a uh, crowned emperor in York. So uh, this is another example of the British Legion saying, eh, we don't like how things are going. We're going to make our own emperor. And then the emperor leaves with all the Come troops, back. which is Come bad. Back. <laughs> Come back. Come need you. Yeah. Yeah. So constant rebellions are depleting the military. You get, you you even get a whole barbarian conspiracy in 367. Although, it's most likely that this was uh, overblown because the dude who put it down was the father of the current emperor while the book was beating, while the guy was writing the book. So it, it could have been overblown. Um, and you start seeing. The elites leaving the cities. They don't want to live here anymore. Uh, the cities are, uh, you know, uh, they're becoming magnets for raiders and stuff like that. We're going to move to our rural estates. Rural. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're like, hey, all the, all the stuff and treasures and gold are in the sea cities. Let's go there. Yeah, and these rural estates become mini cities, and they they're, they're they're like these are the hotbeds of Romanization at the time. But uh, 
still. You don't get it far out from these areas. And military service. So military service. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, shipfish. That's good. <laughs> Uh, the original way the Romans recruited their military was, um, you had non-citizens who wanted to become citizens, so they would join the army as auxiliaries. So at Hadrian's Wall, you, you will have multiple, which was built in 117 CE, by the way. I totally forgot about that. Um, but, um, you will get various different peoples from various parts of the empire that go there because they want to become citizens. There's actually a story about a, um, I think he was an Ethiopian who was serving in the Roman army to become a citizen when one of the emperors, Septimus Severus, came up and was like, oh shit, this guy's a bad omen because he's black. Yeah, he was racist. Da, da, da. <laughs> Which is actually funny because Septimius Severus was one was the first was the first emperor not descended from a Roman family. He was descended from a Syrian family and a Carthaginian family. Funnily enough, Carthage wow. actually won the won in the end. <laughs> Carthage has revenge. Yeah, putting one of his own on the throne. Yeah, he was. He wasn't from Carthage. He was from Lepcus Magna, but he was. He he was from uh, family descended from the Phoenicians, so he was Carthaginian. I'm just gonna call him Carthaginian because it's cool <laughs> and more and more poetic. But then, actually, Septimius Severus's um, son, uh, Caracalla destroys this system by proclaiming every single person living under the empire is now a citizen which did really bad things for recruitment but you know now everybody yeah because before i think if i remember correctly before if if you yet give citizen you're not already yet join the army for so long and then you're, yeah. you're a citizen and so are your descendants yeah and as Romans became more prosperous, they wanted to become part of the army less. Stuff like that happens. You you start getting the Roman Empire. Um, you start getting the Roman Empire uh, recruiting mercenaries into the empire to be the soldiers. That's where you get people like Alaric, who eventually sacks the Roman Empire, which are only loyal as long as you can pay them. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of the times, especially later in the empire, you'd pay these uh, mercenaries by giving them land, which um, <laughs> becomes the basis of many of the kingdoms that spring up after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and military service in Britain actually becomes hereditary, and which is interesting. But... You get multiple different times that uh, a person proclaims himself uh, emperor. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, if you're talking about Caracalla, he was an absolute prick and he ends up getting assassinated. Uh, he killed his brother because he wanted to be the only Roman emperor. And yeah, he, I, I'm pretty sure he said... He died because he said he wanted to go take a piss, and then the Praetorian guard, like, shivved him. So, yeah, he did learn consequences. <laughs> um, yeah, you get multiple different rebellions. Uh, one of these emperors, Magnus Maximus, actually is talked about in Welsh um annals later in history seen as a, a great conqueror and a great person uh but this starts depleting the military quickly um and the final one 
the the one that finally leads to our next slide, which is sub Roman Britain. Um, the what's it called sub? What's it called sub? Um, I have no idea. I don't know. And I know it's, it's after. I know it's after Britain after the Romans left mostly, but like I have no idea where the sub came from. Um, mostly because there's still like some. Some Romanness to it for a bit, maybe. Uh, okay. So you, you still have a bit of Romanness to it until a much later date. So the final one is Constantine the Third. Constantine the Third. He rebels. He goes to Gaul to become emperor in 407. He becomes co-emperor for a bit in 409. I'm pretty sure he's assassinated by uh, the Emperor Honorius. And the Britons were like, okay, when are the Romans going to come back? And they just never do. They're like, they never tell us how to fight. What are we going to do? <laughs> and uh, this is a bad time for the Romans to not come back because, of course, you've got Saxons coming in from the south and the east. You have actually the Irish um, coming in from the uh, west. And uh, the Irish might have actually founded multiple different Welsh kingdoms. Um uh, including the kingdom of Diffed, but that's that's a different story. Um, and then the Picts from the north, and you actually get an Irish kingdom in Scotland. That's a very important one because the tri the Irish tribe that invaded Scotland is known as the Scoti. Yes, the Scots are not or well. Scottish, Gallic, and all of that, they're not originally from Scotland. They're from Ireland because the Irish are awesome and better than the Scots. Oops. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Um, so, yeah, the Picts also start overrunning Hadrian's Wall. You actually get evidence of kingdoms based in and around Hadrian's Wall. There's one place that you can look into called Bert Oswald that has examples of this. Yes, I am on thin ice. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, both are good. <coughs> the Irish are superior. <laughs> um, paganism seems to have survived, actually, to this time. and But as like a substrate. Uh, so that might explain why the transition from sub-Roman Britain to um, the pagan Anglo-Saxons was a little bit easier because a lot of the Christians were the higher-ups and they were the ones who fled um, the area instead of stay because they were like, oh, these pagans, oh, I have to leave now. And a lot of them actually flee um, to Brittany, Monday Brittany, and that's where you get that and stuff like that. So, uh, there's evidence from Gildas that there might have been one ruler at some point, commonly called Vortigern, um, but he never called him that. That's a later name given to him. Um, and we don't know if he's actually a real person, but um, he's the original guy. He's he's given the the you're the one who called the Saxons over to come help us. But why did the Saxons have to come? Uh, a bunch of British Romano British aristocrats actually went to Gaul. Um, if, have you ever heard of Aetius? I have not. Aetius is the guy who defeated Attila the Hun. He's one of the... He is the last... Hey! <laughs> um, it's actually G-E-R-N, but close enough. You got you nearly got it. But... Um, uh, so Aetius was one of the last good like Roman generals, and... Uh, he had defeated um, 
Attila the Hun. He eventually gets assassinated, but the British come to him and is like, hey, can you come to Britain? We really need your help. And he's like, no, I can't. <laughs> We're a bit busy <laughs> dealing with... We got, we got land. <laughs> We're... <laughs> The, the the empire's crumbling. We, we can't really come and help. Really sorry about that. So they hire Saxon mercenaries. Now the story is, yeah, the Saxons decide, oh, we like it here. We don't know if that's what happened. Um, It's possible that's what happened. Um, That's my headcanon. <laughs> yeah. But they definitely would not have been led by two brothers named Hengist and Horsa. Because... Hengist and Horsa means horse and stallion. Um, and in Germanic folklore, you actually get this idea of um, uh, twin twin um, horse deities, essentially. So a lot of people today in the field believe that Hengist and Horsa aren't real people. Uh, they're just, you know... Um, incarnations of these uh twin these uh horse twins essentially because of their names um they they are seen as the first kings of kent and they're seen as the jutes so i guess we should talk about the um different groups that come in uh, according to b the different groups that come in are the jutes from northern denmark the angles from uh like the Danish German border and the Saxons from just below the angles. Yeah, no, I, I know Kent. <laughs> yeah. Kent Hovind. Oh, oh and, and I know uh, the three sex, the three kings from the South are from the Saxon, the Wessex, the Sus the Sussex and the Essex. Uh, yeah, the Saxon kingdoms, according to Bede, is um, Wessex, Sussex, and Essex. Um, West Saxons, South Saxons, East Saxons. Uh, the, the Angles were Northumbria, Mercia, and East Anglia. And the Judish ones, um, there's a... He says that there were Jutes on the Isle of Wight, and Kent was also uh, Jutish. So Kent's a Jute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there's very little evidence that this was actually like, this actually went down this way in a very, and if anything, um, there had to have been some Frisians that came over. Uh, because modern day Frisian is the closest uh, linguistic relative of English. Did you say Frisia came over? No, Frisians. They they're from uh, modern day Netherlands. Uh, I was hoping that an evil space emperor came over to Britain. <laughs> yes, and he spoke a language very close to English. <laughs> um. Uh, you'll actually see in mo more modern maps about the Anglo-Saxon settlement show the Frisians come in as well. Um, yes, Frisian is really cool, it, it, and it and it's very much like uh, like you're looking at old English, but not really. It's interesting. So if you go to the next one, this so is, it's so it's old old English. Um, well. Them and Old English have a common ancestor called Anglo Frisian. <laughs> a lot of the, um, so it's called palatalization, where your cuz become chuz and your uh, scuz, like um, in skeep, become sh for sheep, which is ship, not sheep, you know. Um, that come, sheep would have been pronounced ship in. Old English. Yeah. Yes, Frisian is the legitimate half sibling. Yes. Um, so what we can kind of see is the Britons were in this area were probably assimilated and not conquered and forced off. We actually even have evidence that 
Britons from Wales decided to move to the Anglo-Saxon area to become more prosperous because the West sucked at this time. Um, and the only thing you really needed was a Germanicness. You, you, you had to speak Anglo-Saxon like an Anglo-Saxon. You had you, you had to look like an Anglo-Saxon because if you didn't, um, there was actually there's actually this thing called Wehrgeld, which is man price. You got killed or, or thing. Yeah, if you get killed, they have to pay. They have to pay. Yeah, <laughs> they someone has to pay for your body because you got killed. A Briton's Wehrgeld was half that of an English person's wear guild. Um, and, uh, so how the Anglo-Saxon society was set up is you have these various war bands roaming around. You probably didn't have very big kingdoms. Each, each little settlement was probably its own little kingdom at this time. They might have had some affinities with the other ones. Who knows? You could have had Jute, Saxons, and Angles all right next to each other and in areas you wouldn't have expected them. We don't know the actual ethnic makeup um, down to that. Uh, and uh, because and, uh, go, uh, go fast, and the ones that didn't want to and the ones that didn't want to uh, be uh, incorporated or, or merged together, they went to they went to Brittany and France. Uh, actually, they would become um, slaves. Essentially, they'd be they'd oh. become part of the household. But you do have you do have people fleeing. You do have Britons fleeing west and also to France, which is modern day Brit, which is modern day Brittany to get away. That there had to have been because why does Brittany speak a language closely related to Welsh? If people didn't flee there. So, um, if you didn't want to become like a essentially part of the household, you had to act like an Anglo Saxon and try to fool the Anglo Saxons into thinking, "Oh, he's one of them." And this is why Bede probably says that the main differentiation between these groups is probably language, because see a nebula. Because um, that's how they distinguished each other and through the material culture. And that's why you see a complete turnover in the material culture. But this is just a hypothesis. We don't know. But you have these different war bands going around. Um, the different settlements are their own little societies, kingdoms. And um, they're made up of chorals, which means free. Um Charles is actually related to the world Cheorl, but it comes through French. Um, but uh, Cheorl is also related to Carl. It just means freemen. These freemen, essentially, uh, each had their own little household where they could have various different people living underneath them. Um, and then they would elect their leader from amongst the Chiorals to be the war band leader. And this is this is your Anglo-Saxon society. Little tiny polities um and not these big heptarchies that come up later that people talk about. And uh yeah that, that's essentially how it goes and you just get the kingdoms later. You don't get the people you don't get Hengist and Horsa coming in and forming a kingdom, Ichel coming in and forming a kingdom, Cheredich coming in and forming a kingdom. You just have a bunch of people coming in to take land. <coughs> so the Britons were probably assimilated instead of outright conquered. They are bred out. They were bred out. <laughs> yeah. Or or they decided, I'd rather become English than be a slave. 
and, and, I, and everything was happy and peaceful until the time that they, until the Vikings attacked. <laughs> well, actually, um, you was, have I, more. I, I, was, I, I was just joking about that. I'm pretty oh, sure it wasn't peaceful okay. at all. But, oh, yeah, no, but, it wasn't. <laughs> but then, then after this was the time of the Dane Law, I think. Um, you so after this, you get the formation of the kingdoms that are, um, normally called the Heptarchy. Um, the seven, yeah, the seven kingdoms essentially, uh, Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Essex, Kent, Sussex, and Wessex. Even though Sussex and Essex really didn't do much, I don't know why they're included. Sussex was pretty uh, early on conquered by Wessex, but hey. Um, yeah, and Wessex is the kingdom that is, gave rise to the, the, the full English throne later on that, that we have, have now. Yeah. Um, the Anglo-Saxons, if you can see up at the top, actually settled uh, modern-day Edinburgh. So uh, you have two languages in Scotland. You have Scottish Gaelic, which actually comes from Ireland, and you have Scots. I have the controversial opinion that if you're going to say the northern dialects of English are dialects of English, then Scots is also a dialect of English. If you're... Uh, you can't... You can't... <laughs> But, you know, there's geopolitical stuff that means that the, the people who speak Scots don't want to be seen as a dialect of English. But they are. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, essentially, what I was writing was wrong. And this is how it actually happened. It's good, and, to know you can, good to know you can admit mistakes. <laughs> well, I was writing way afterwards. You know, we had all these myths and stuff. I just had to write it down, man. That's actually a very good way of thinking about it, shitfish. Shitfish. Scots is a linguistic dialect, but a political language. I like that. Um... After this, you get the formation of the kingdoms and consolidation of these little tribal polities. And um, <laughs> um, yeah, language is a dialect with the navy. I like that. Um, even though Scotland isn't technically independent, but you know, they're fierce people. You don't want to mess with them. They'll shout freedom at you and charge you. It's not good. Um, but yeah. And that's the end of the story of the uh, how the Anglo-Saxons came, came, came here. Or there, came there. I keep saying here, but... <laughs> there. Yeah, to, to England. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so these, diff these different households held by the Chorals eventually become a pretty important system under later, later kingdoms called the Hyde, which is just uh, different land allocations um, and how you split up your kingdom, essentially. But yes. So, yeah. I this see. is what we know now. Any questions? Because that's all I have. Q&A time for those in the audience. Uh, let me tell you. Yes. Do you... Why... Okay, here's a question for you. And not, because I, it's not really about the invasions later on. That's that never mind. Be a different top for a different topic, maybe. I guess I, I, guess, I, I, I guess I guess anyways. Why was and on uh, the maps I've seen? Why was North Umbria in the, like usually the biggest kingdom? Because uh, it's t it's two kingdoms that you'll you'll have to watch another episode, Mackenzie. I guess 
<laughs> that will be the next episode, Mackenzie. <laughs> but <Yeah>. um, <laughs> so Northumbria was made up of two different kingdoms, Bernicia and Deira. All right, cool. Well, they affect the modern world because today England is not made up of Britons. It's made up of English people. Uh, You have a complete, uh, and uh, this is the beginning of the enmities between the Welsh and the English and the Scots and the English and all of that jazz. First the Anglo-Saxons came over, took over, and then the Danes came over, and then the Normans came over. Yeah. Uh, so, he, yeah. To your question about the Northumbrians, it's because uh, it's made up of two different kingdoms. Uh, eventually, they just unite later on. That's why. That's okay. That's essentially it. Um, uh, I do want to say I did forget to talk about this. The main reason why. So in France, you actually keep a lot of the Roman um, institutions in place that when the Franks come in, the Germanic peoples come in and take over, they use a lot of the Roman aristocracy that remains and keep them and keep them essentially as administrators, they're the kings. They're going to go off and fight the wars, but they need the Romans that are remaining. And eventually, you know, the Roman people that live there are still the prestige group. So you eventually get the Germanic peoples assimilating into Roman society. You don't have that in Britain because all the administrators left with Constantine and the administrators here were mostly Brythonic after that. You don't have the Roman society remaining to um, be a, to be there so that you to be a, to, to be a subset of the Latin. And that's why Britain's not a subset of Latin like French is. It's a subset of 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 of, of the Anglo Saxons. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that the Welsh don't speak uh, Romance language because the, the the Roman administration was never really entrenched into Roman Britain um, like it was in the other places. And it's probably because, you know, Britain kind of sucked for the Romans. They didn't really like it. You can't grow they wine can't, there. They couldn't they can build a road. To, they couldn't they can build a road to Rome. They, 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 a boat. No, yeah. no bridges, or no, they didn't have that. They didn't have the channel built yet back in Britain days. Surprisingly, though, the the ro- roads that the Romans built in Britain, um, they still have their legacies today in the roads that we have in modern day England, um, because they actually largely survived. But yeah, you. That's also why you don't get major uh, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Right off the bat, you don't. You just don't have the structures like you did in Gaul, f- that the Franks used. Can you? Oh, can you imagine if the Romans did build a channel like we have? The Romans built that channel. Oh like, yeah, that'd be. <laughs> I don't know how they'd do it, but that'd be cool. But then I guess that w- that would really uh, probably help with the either the invasion or the protecting Britain later on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. We'd be speaking a romance language, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if one little channel would help out that much, especially uh, when, yeah. It's a little trade, probably. Yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I heard at least not, it's not important now that then because there's the iron and stuff, but I heard back in the Bronze Age, England, England was, was a good source for, for tin. Yes. Uh, and that's, usually what they extracted out that's what the economy was based off of in the west um you actually get a complete breakdown of trade um the further into sub-roman britain you get um 
there's a possibility that the plague of Justinian had something to do with this. Um, but there's no real way to know because we just don't have any literary sources from this time. Um, there are plague victims that you do see, I'm pretty sure, in Britain. But yeah, uh, just trade complete, completely um, was gone by like the 600s, which, yeah, just be it. And that's trade was literally the only thing linking Rome to Britain. And once that's cut off, there's no point. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, all right. So, whenever, whenever you research the next subject, what, what do you want next to, our next subject to be? Um, the, the, probably up to the Vikings, maybe. Uh, so. So, so we're going from when they from when they arrived to when the Vikings arrived. Yeah, the formation of the actual kingdoms and how that happened, and then, uh, you know, the different things that happened between these different kingdoms up until the Vikings their, said, "What's up, guys? How you doing?" Their loves and their wars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That reminds. It's like a rose and cars that remind people of something I heard one time. That they say in Europe, the car, the car, the the cars were built for the cities. Here in America, the cities were built for the cars. Oh my gosh, I don't want to get into my I don't want to get into my stances on cars here, man. Don't don't bring up cars, man. I don't wanna. <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't get any questions about Arthur. Oh, okay. I, I have a question. Was he supposed to be a, a Briton or an Anglo-Saxon? Well, I don't believe King Arthur existed. Well, so. duh. Like Robin Hood. I, I don't think that there was a historical basis for Arthur. Um, I think that Arthur was more of an ideal... Uh, his name means bear warrior or something like that something something that just sounds a little bit too much like he's uh an embodiment of what a warrior is, is supposed to be and later on he gets placed onto figures like the guy who won the battle of mons badonicus um which well, is well apparently he was well apparently he wasn't a very good husband or lover or husband i guess but his wife kept on leaving him for one of his nights <laughs> At, uh, if you want to learn more about the story of Arthur, there's act I was actually listening to a pretty good video that says that that wasn't originally in the story um, by the Histocrat. He has a, an entire video on Arthur. Um, but yes, I don't think I think Arthur was more of an ideal, and later people tried to find historical figures. Ambrosius Aurelianus, who was a Romano-Briton commander who we know very little about, but he well, he won some battles against the Saxons. A lot of people try to say that he's Arthur. Um, I just think Arthur was more, you know, imprinted onto him afterwards than he's Arthur. But, yeah. Um, we don't even get... The, f the first literary evidence of Arthur is well into um, the time of the Welsh kingdoms. We don't have him in Gildas and we don't have him in Bede, so I just don't think he existed. Right. Too bad. I said I want to pull that, I want to pull that sword out and become the true king of England. Yeah. I actually want to look up the etymology of etymology of Arthur. Yeah, it most likely comes from um, Bear. Bear Man, that's what it meant. Bear Man. Arthur, Arthur is Bear Man in Welsh. So 
yeah, he just seems more like a, you know, embodiment of what a warrior is supposed to be. He could have been a figure in Brythonic mythology as well. We don't know much about Brythonic mythology, sadly, because the Romans, you know, they did, they tried to make uh, Celtic religions look as Roman as possible. So, it's impossible to know, but yeah. I'm on the side of Arthur didn't exist. But check out what? that video by the Histocrat. Well, do. And if you got, you have it coming up on your channel that you, or do you have a channel that you're in? No. Uh, you still watch my, my grandpa's video, please, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go to his grandpa's channel then. Crash Martin. But. <laughs> but Next week, I'll have a guest, Jay, talking about the digital evolution. Not sure what that's about yet, but we'll find out next week. Digital evolution? Apparently, that's what, that's what he wants to talk. That's what, that's what he wants. Can't talk. That's what he wants to talk about. Okay, well, I'll have to figure out what that is. <laughs> right. In the meantime, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you all next time. Bye. All right, just do it. Don't try okay. And here I am again, back with the non with the oh, you're the venerable beat again. Yeah. <laughs> that you're the nine, nine, uh, that you're yeah. the nine. <laughs> That's my YouTube thing, but I just decided to keep especially since we're gonna be talking about uh, beating stuff today a bit. I didn't have a really good uh name to make the title, so like I just you know all these little tiny kingdoms are becoming bigger kingdoms, so that's why I chose this name. So, uh, but yeah, we're just yes. gonna be continuing on with the story. <laughs> yeah, he was. This is this this is his time period. Yes, this is his time period, and we're even uh, gonna go past his death a little bit too. Right. Now, if you remember, guys, last time we were all here, we talked about how these people came to to the British Isles, and now we're going to be seeing what happened after they arrive. But well, first, yeah. uh, VD we have has a special announcement to make. Oh, yeah, we have uh, some updates that we need to talk about when it comes to Ukraine. The first one is earlier um, this month, they announced they're going to be attacking Kherson, which is the only Russian-occupied uh, like major city to the north of the Dnieper River. Uh, so um, essentially what they're trying to do is they're trying to destroy these bridges that you can see right here. So that they can't get the um, supplies to the Russian soldiers. And um, they're going to just have to... Sad Sadly, this area is, sort of sucks when it comes to um, like attacking. Uh, it's a lot of flat, open territory. So it's just going to be a grind fest here, which kind of sucks. Uh, but once they get uh, within... Um, a reliable artillery uh, um, range of those bridges, that's when we're going to start seeing the Russians uh, not being able to get enough supplies. But I haven't been able to figure out a, a, much about what's going on here because something else happened. These Never. mad lads decided to dash across, like, I don't, I, it, it's the next slide, like, uh, mm -hmm. In the east of the country, uh, randomly, uh, there was an assault done. Uh, at first, uh, they... So, some people are saying the Harrison counteroffensive was a feint. I don't think so. I think they were always... Me and the person that I follow on Twitter, uh, Richard Henne, by the way. You guys should check him out. Um, they... I think they were just like probing a little bit 
to take some territory out there. And then all of a sudden they found out the Russians didn't have any reserves over there. So then they just started steamrolling these guys, uh, which is bad for the Russians because um, if you look at the map on the right, Donbass is right there, and that's really what um, the Russians want to take. And essentially, they started heading towards this city called Kupiansk, which uh, is a sit- like a railway hub, I, I'm pretty sure, uh, to get supplies to Izium, which uh, the Russians were using for northern attacks on uh, the remaining Ukrainian-held territories. Uh, the map on the left shows where they were on Friday m- morning, like really early morning when I was making this, probably just after it became Friday. And then if you go to the next picture, uh, uh, this is where they are now. The blue is the uh, retaken territory. Uh, the Russians are completely retreating from Izium, and uh, it looks like it was a complete route, and the Russians are trying to stabilize the line. Uh They've probably left a lot of equipment and bombs and stuff and like just stuff that the Ukrainians can now use to go on <laughs> to help in their defense of Ukraine. Uh, it's just absolutely insane. I don't I wasn't expecting this to happen. Um, I didn't really ex- hear anybody talk about this before it happened. And uh, well, this is really good for the Ukrainians. <laughs> So you think it's coming to an end, or is it not not yet not yet finished? Uh, no, not not yet. I don't think Putin will be willing to uh, give up. But the problem is now. I I just I don't know. I don't I don't know. Well, I don't hope, like making predictions now. Well, I don't like wishing people you know dead or anything. But yeah, maybe uh, a certain president or whatever he is now or dictator basically you know can go the same can go the same can can do what a certain other person had that has done earlier in this week oh yeah another ruler another ruler who technically is a descendant of people we're talking about right now yes she is she was um yeah, I'm a bit miffed because they canceled all the football this weekend just because some old lady died. No offense to any Brits that are royalists in the chat. Sorry, <laughs> I and just by, love football. <laughs> and, and by foot, and by football, you mean you mean what we well the, the the Americans call soccer. I don't know what soccer is. It's football. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but. It's, yeah, yeah, it's soccer. Oh. <laughs> I'm what, 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 what we peasants call soccer. <laughs> yes, what you Ameriboys. I'm an American. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, so this, these are what are called the seven kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, I'd like to paint a more complex story because I... I don't really think there ever really was a period in which there were seven kingdoms all together. And plus there's, Maybe there's, a plus, little. Plus there's also the little Welsh kingdoms too over here on the side. Uh, yeah, there's those as well. Uh, you got the Cornish down in Domnonia, all of that stuff. Essentially, uh, we're going to see the little tribal kingdoms that were set up uh, during the Anglo-Saxon invasion, consolidate into states that look more like this. Um, however, the three, well, the four most important ones are Northumbria, which is technically two different kingdoms that were unified in the uh, 7th century, Mercia, Wessex and Kent. Kent is really important early on, but it loses its. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's Kent, the- Kent loses his. Kent loses its thing after that. After the Hovens take over that, that area. <laughs> oh yes, the, after the Hovens took over, um, East Anglia is also a little bit cool because that's where um, Sutton Hoo 
was found and that's one of these giant uh, uh, burial grounds. It's where that stereotypical mask you think of when you think of the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, that was found in East Anglia as well. But really, uh, the most important ones for the next two centuries that we're talking about is Northumbria and Mercia. But the next couple centuries after that is Wessex. Time to shine. Wessex. And that's where... That's where the that that the, they eventually take take over eventually the whole thing, but not yet. Yeah, uh, the royal family of Wessex eventually becomes the kings of England, but uh, there was no sense of any like common English kingdom at this time. There was a little bit of a, a, an identity of uh, and, English people, but not not that. And much. this is uh, it's also before the the Danes or the Vikings came over. Uh yes. Uh, we're going to go a little bit past that, but they haven't really come into the scene by the time we end. Uh, so our primary sources, so people are starting to write now, which is good. There's actually a bunch of charters. These are really important for figuring out, um, (laughs) 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 yeah. Yes, I, I, no, I'm not, I am not a reptilian, uh, yeah, so charters are actually really important for figuring out, um, the, where different kingdoms, jurisdictions lied, uh, how powerful the kingdoms were, and also the relationships between kingdoms and the churches as well. And then you also have the first laws showing up, especially in the 7th century, uh, especially in Kent, because Kent is the first kingdom to uh, Christianize. It's it's the one that's closest to Europe anyway. And then we have uh, this dude named Bede. Uh, Yeah. Your name's your namesake. (laughs) My namesake. Uh. He is a very biased source, and you have to get past that. Um, so is he writing for the Anglo side or the Britain, Britain side? So he was a bishop at uh, – not a bishop. Oh, my gosh. He was a monk, not a bishop. He was a monk in Northumbria in uh, a place called Jaro. Um, and uh, he – Likes the Northumbrians, of course, because he is one. Uh, And uh, he really doesn't like their rivals, the Mercians, to the point that he largely just doesn't talk about them, except for whenever they come up in respect to uh, the Northumbrians. Uh, And also, he's a really important theologian, actually. Um, Possibly... Um, more important in that than in history. We just think of him more as a historian. Uh, so uh, the years that we're going over are the late 6th centuries to the early 9th centuries. Um, and and we just started the stream like 10 minutes ago. And in the first 10 minutes, we're, we're talking about Ukraine for a minute yeah. so we're, we're, right now we're updated with the england stuff we just started yeah just know that um the arrival of the anglo-saxons isn't as um isn't as it seems it probably wasn't a mass migration of peoples to england um there there was probably at least a bit of um population continuity continuity uh between these times it's just that uh people tried to become more english in order to uh make their way in this new society that was dominated by anglo-saxon warlords um now was this the time of uh was cad the cadbury's was later or before cadbury what Oh, the Canterbury Tales is later. Okay. I said, I said Cadbury, like the egg. <laughs> like, yeah. At least I think they are. 
Um, yeah, I'm pre I'm pretty sure that's Middle English stuff. And then, then what's is is Beowulf English? Yes, Beowulf is Old English. Um, uh, definitely something that these people would be telling stories about during this time, especially when they're pagans. Um, but Bede uh, is also pretty biased in a way towards religion. Um, you'll find that during this period, there are actually three branches of Christianity fighting it, fighting it out uh, in England. And Bede clearly sides with one and clearly thinks that it's the superior one. Um, so he mostly focuses on it. Was this the culture? Uh, that would be the uh, Welsh that would be doing that. Um, which are the people that are indigenous to... Well, not really. It's complicated. They're the ones being invaded by the Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> so, uh, no, they would not be. So, um, if you go to the next one... So, early on, you have small tribal kingdoms. Uh, possibly, uh, these are um, possibly these are uh, preserved in what is called the tribal hydages, but we don't know where all of those went. Where uh, this map on the screen has um, all the ones that we know. Uh, they're mostly consolidated around like rich areas. Uh, the tribal hydage is just like the land of a tribe and it's what it's productive, like what it produces. So it's like an administrative uh, division, a really small, small one. Um, and, and these were probably uh, led by warlords. Uh, that um, that would use their charisma in order to uh, bring people together to fight other people and, you know, take some land. But uh, these weren't really hereditary kings, and they were usually chosen by the freemen of the society. But we start getting some uh, examples of more powerful people starting to become uh starting to uh consolidate power these would be and these people start making these fabulously wealthy graves like the one at sutton who that i talked about earlier and yeah. these are called princely burials so they're going from tribal chieftains to to actually landowning ch chieftains now or something like that uh, just, uh, really rich ones that, uh, it, the, it was a constantly shifting landscape at this time. Uh, it is, so, it's really hard to explain. It's the it's sort of the territory, but it's also like um, the, yeah, it's, let me bring this up so that I can find a tribal, tribal hideage. No, oh, questions are good. Yeah. Questions are always um, good. So we don't know completely. They were definitely different territories that might be uh, the um, the vestiges of these earlier um, kingdoms that um, ultimately just get subsumed into the bigger kingdoms as time goes along. Um, so. Uh, it sort of comes from the, 
it like uh later on Hyde becomes the English an English unit of land measurement as well. Um so that might also that like that's where it kind of gets its name because th they're measured in how many hides they are. Um like so that's saying how big they are. Um so it's just kind of hard to explain because we don't really know. Uh, it's just one hypothesis that the Hyde is these small little kingdoms, like the vestiges of them. Um, uh, one of the main pieces of evidence is that um, later kings would use these to divide their kingdoms for their uh, children to rule a new kingdom. Uh, a Big example of that is Penda of Mercia creates uh, a kingdom called the Kingdom of Middle of the Middle Angles out of some hides to put together. Uh, but that's it. Yeah, it's really hard to explain. But it could also be like a tribute list created by a king, stuff like that. It's just a possible because other than that we don't know what these early little kingdoms would have looked like so um okay <laughs> i'm sorry right. and real fast I, I think we might have talked about this last time but the the, the three different uh different areas are are, are from different invaders the jutes yeah the Angles, and that, the saxons that too um at least traditionally, they're divided into the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. Um, but yeah, uh, if you actually if you look at the map, you can actually see the little tinier, the tinier um, little names. Those are hides. Um, those are the different hides. You've got ones like the Paconsete, the Huicha, um, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you have these uh, princely. You have these princely burials coming in. Yeah, um, I got it off of uh, Wikipedia. Uh, so just search up tribal hideage. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean it. Yeah, um, I was worried about. It. So you do have. So these princely burials seem to actually be a reaction to a new religion. Showing. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. We, we can't yeah. afford the 4K streaming just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you talk about evolution all the time. You should be getting the money from the cabal. What is this? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> 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 um. You, you had shifting powers all the time uh and different members of different royal families that would come in and uh uh go to one hide and then get a bunch of the freemen of the area and then challenge his brother or cousin and take it but yes these princely burials are probably a protestation against a new religion coming in from the south um because they're showing off Wealth and excess, which uh, Christianity does not like. Um, so yeah, it's Christianity. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier, what were the what were the branches of up there and of the English? What what, what, what was the fighting competition of the, the Christian? Was it was one of them Aryan or something? Uh oh, uh, that will come up later. But no, Arianism is not one of them. Um, uh, Arianism is kind it is more in dip. So Arianism was more important amongst Germanic peoples that had already converted to Christianity and okay. the Anglo-Saxons arrived not as Christians. So they okay. didn't really have Arianism here. Um, I, I know this is, I know this is centuries before the, this is, I know this is centuries before the Catholic uh, orthodox split so uh yeah but there's also still lots of different traditions during this time um yeah. 
if you go to the next slide, we do start seeing the reemergence of trade because trade had completely broken down at, after Rome left. However, we do start seeing increased presence of coinages in certain settlements that um, are called emporia. Um, all, the Anglo-Saxon word for this would be weech. Um, uh, it probably came with, it probably started with Kent and moved out uh, because it probably came with some of the Christian missionaries. They're, tr they're trying to uh, convert the English people. And as they're coming up, they're creating monasteries and all of this stuff. And you've got to supply these monasteries with different resources and all of that. So you start getting new trade. Monasteries uh, that would later be exploited for by certain people. Uh, yes, because they were very rich. Um, <laughs> so, um, however, when this comes in, you start losing... Um, the power of the free men, uh, the ch the Cheoro, as they were called, used to be really powerful. They were the ones that uh, selected who the king was, and they were supposed to be. Uh, they had their own households, um, stuff like that. However, under this new system, they lose power, and they're more moving towards uh, the exploited peasant class instead. And in order to supply these emporia, you do begin to get um, crafts workers and stuff. Um, and since it's coming from the south with Christianity, it has a large Frankish influence. The Franks are is a large empire in the south. Um, those coins are what are called sheatas. I don't like what they're called because it sounds like something else, but they are sheatas. <laughs> I am not cursing at you. <laughs> but these emporia would actually become uh, pretty important. One of the emporia is uh, the capital today, uh, London. Uh, York was another emporia. Um, and... And these would be the hubs of this new trade. Now, let's talk a bit about Christianity. And I can talk about the three different forms of Christianity. The next page or this page still? Yes. Yes, what? Uh, the next page. Oh, yeah. did you mention the Frankish stuff? Yeah. Okay. The Franks. I, and... Oh, um, so... Up until recently, we only thought, uh, most scholars only thought there were two forms of Christianity, um, that the Anglo-Saxons had probably destroyed all of the uh, <coughs> uh, local Brit Brythonic church. Um, however, uh, it's possible that it survived and, one, and was one of these forms of... Um, Christianity that was competing. However, because it was early on seen as a heathen uh, group, a heathen group within Christianity, they probably would have just been lumped in with the pagans. Um, so that's why we don't really know much about them. Um, but we do have some people that are named weird things that come from uh, this Brythonic church that makes it seem like it it was still around so and how like, so how i i know i know certain at least the right her no certain uh cultures local cultures influenced and affected the church in the area how, so how did the the britain culture anglo culture affect the english church in the beginning uh so you definitely have the different names that suggest that they're still there um like uh different more hebrew sounding names um it's just more uh trying to counter uh beads narrative that everybody's a um um so polygamism uh that everybody was a pagan because he's 
So uh, the British church believed that original sin did not taint human nature. Um, so, yeah, that's more why they're seen as pagans. Um, but it also shows a little bit of how important the original peoples were oh. to the Anglo-Saxon story, that they weren't just some displaced group and probably brought their religion with them as they um, Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Oh, and I, I might be I, I, might, I might be wrong with this, but this is years, centuries after the the Stonehenge Stonehenge people, right? Stonehenge. Oh yes, Stonehenge is before even the Celts arrive. Uh, they are they are old, 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 probably like happening during Mesopotamia, old. Um, however, this is more like a substrate, and it's not really that important for further on it's just an interesting thing that helps prove the anglo-saxon invasion was not as destructive to the locals as we once thought however the the main two i think they would have does the nicene creed say that um, well, Pelagianism uh, is later because Pelagius lived 355 to 420. So I don't, I don't know if they accepted the Nicene Creed. I'm really sorry about that. I should have figured that out. My bad. Um... But the two churches that we are going to talk about did accept the Nicene Creed. Um, I'm pretty sure that that one did too, unless the Nicene Creed states that we had original sin, which was a big thing. That that yeah. was the, and that was the thing where they all all the bishops came together to say, "Okay, this is our, our deal now. This is what we're doing. Anybody else are are, yeah. are, are outcast or yeah." So I think the only ones that didn't accept uh, ex the Nicene Creed would be like the Arians because the Nicene Creed is made in response to them. Um, and then the uh, other weird earlier forms. Uh, yes, they, they would think that uh, Jesus was like holy and everything. So. Uh, yeah, I think they did. Um so the, the the two that are going to be most important in competing for control over England in the uh, early stages are the Gaelic Church, which uh, is founded off of the traditions of St. Patrick mm -hmm. and later St. Columba. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, the Roman Church. Uh, the Roman Church arrives from the south. The Celtic Church arrives from the north. Um, the Roman church arrives first with Augustine, um, but first we need to talk a little bit about English paganism. Uh, paganism centered on rituals designed to bring benefits to the individual or community. And, um, the priests were very independent, um, very spread out. There's no, um, centralized authority behind it. So we actually see the kings wanting to become Christian in order to uh, more influence the lives of their subjects. And even more importantly, unlike in paganism, uh, you can say that you were put on the throne by God. Now, technically, you do see uh, these early um, families these early royal families try to link themselves to the uh, Germanic um, gods. For example, the actually, I'm pretty sure all all of the families claim descent from Odin, but um, uh, the biggest ones are the Cherdachingas, which are the kings of Wessex. So yes, um, the new King Charles the Third is. 
a descendant of Odin, according to him. Because that's in the official genealogy. However, it it was a lot easier to use Christianity to say that uh, I should be king and so should my children and so should everybody in my family. <laughs> now, did, did, did the... Uh, did the pope did this time did the pope have the power he would have later on to control things or was he still uh no uh no uh definitely not um cuz that's mostly because of things like yeah the church is still really divided at this time you don't really even get like the authority of the Pope until much later with Charlemagne. And then um, he sort of loses it again. And then Otto gets it back and everything. The powers of the Pope has fluctuated throughout the centuries, <laughs> but this is definitely a more like decentralized period. And especially in England, because the Irish church, the Gaelic church was dealing with, with being Catholic, but not being connected. I mean, not Catholic Christian being Christian, but not connected to the rest of the Christian world. So they developed some weird ideas. Easter's on a different day. That becomes a problem later on stuff like that. But um, ultimately Rome, the Roman church wins out and the Roman church is beads, pet church. Bede loves the Roman church. To the point that uh, he says that the minute Augustine shows up, it's good. And he really likes um, this dude named Bishop Theodore because Theodore really sets up. Theodore really um, creates the English church as it will be seen as later. But uh, Augustine essentially comes over in 597 to uh, a receptive Kentish king. I think his name was um, Athelbert. Uh, he married a Frankish princess, so there's connections to F France right there. Um, and essentially, the minute Augustine gets there, he ba he's baptized. He gets all the important people in his kingdom baptized. Boom! Looks good. Uh, we got our first conversion, guys. <laughs> but quickly after that, because um, this conversion was so heavily based on support from the Franks rather than actually from the Pope, um, it falls into harder times because if you don't know anything about the Franks, they were never really, uh, especially the Merovingians, which are the people in power of France at this time, they were never stable because of this stupid thing they did where every single kid would get a slice of the pie, would become their own king. Oh, uh, is this where, this is the time where uh, instead of going to the eldest kid, eldest son, not the eldest kid, eldest son, it it was divided among all the all the other sons. The kingdom was broken up into pieces. This is yeah, so it, it was constant civil war essentially. And uh, soon after Augustine comes and sets up the church, there's a new civil war in France. Even though, yeah, it, it so it, it yeah, falls I, into high, hard, harder times. Yeah, I know. I know. At first, it went from at first. It was like all the all the sons get their own land. And like they're like, wait a minute, I want more land. And so then, finally, then later, it went to the eldest son, which is which is which is, which is what it is in, in most countries now. Of course, except for in England, where we are now, which recently they 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 switched it to the eldest kid, boy or girl. At, um, actually, it has to be. The eldest son, son, son. The only time a daughter can do it is if there is no. No, 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 no. Brother. A, a few, a few, no, 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 no. It changed. I a, a few years ago, the now deceased queen made a rule. It's it's now in it's now in order of birth birth now in England at least in England. So I thought that was Sweden, but well in, no, yeah. in England. 
you know, too. So, so, so the second the the daughter is now above her younger brother. She still has another older brother, but but now it's, it, it it doesn't really matter. But yes, I know. But since it's England, I was I thought they do that. So it's now now it's the eldest person. But back here, it was all the everyone gets something. You get a kingdom. You get a kingdom. You get a kingdom. Which you know, <laughs> yeah, it didn't it for everybody. <laughs> it didn't end well. Um. And that's yeah. well. That's that's how that's how the Charlemagne's kingdom fell apart. <laughs> and to yeah. France and Germany. That's why we don't have a united Western Europe today. Um, because it used to be somewhat united, and then you know the king would die, and all of his sons would take over. Eventually, uh, the sons didn't have enough power to take over the other sons, and it kind of consolidated into France and Germany. So. That's the origin of those kingdoms. But that's a story <laughs> for another day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so because the the uh, Roman mission was so um, uh, tied to France, of course, whenever everything decided to go uh, tits up in France, uh, things didn't go well. So in the 630s, the vacuum of this... Um, the vacuum of the Roman conversion now led to the Gaelic church starting to expand, <laughs> started to expand from the north down to the south and would make it all the way to Essex, which London is in modern day Essex. I mean, yeah. Yeah. London, modern day London was in Wessex, Essex, not Wessex during the time. Yeah, they're all the same, okay? Just Essex, <laughs> they all sound Wessex, the same. Sex, all... sex, 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 Essex, Sussex, Wessex. Why do they have to do this to me? It, uh, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> um. So, yeah, it actually became extremely important. But then a dude named Bishop Theodore comes. Uh, also, he comes with a... a a, another bishop named Hadrian, and they are extremely important because now, this, is, this is different Hadrian than the, the wall guy. Yeah, not that guy. No, that was a long time ago. Uh, long dead at this point. But they um, they show up to Canterbury, which is where the um, most powerful um, the most powerful bishop in England is is located and they see a church that has um the diocese are too big diocese are um the different areas in which bishops control they're too big um the doctrine is all over the place because you got the you got the irish people over here you got the british people over here oh my gosh we got to figure out what 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 we're gonna do with this so he's yes, you get a clusterfuck of Christians, okay? That's what it is. Um <laughs> kind of like it is today. Uh, but uh we'll leave that aside. Uh an important thing occurs in 664, the Synod of Whitby. So this is sponsored by uh Bede's favorite king of all time, the king of Northumbria. Oswiu, um, he brings all the people together in Whitby because at this time they were having problems over when was Easter. I don't know why they cared, but you know, I, I'm not religious. I'm sorry. I don't get why they care. They have to figure out when Easter is. The Irish think it's a different day. The, the Romans think it's another day. We got to figure it out. And you actually see kind of the aspirations of the kings because they, they figured it out not by the they figured out what by, by a sword point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, usually it was only the emperor, the Roman emperor, who was allowed to um, do church councils, as far as I know. Of course, so, of course, at this point. The Western Empire had gone and burned, it, and now it was, it was just the, over there in the, the the 
visit the, the Eastern or visiting people <laughs> or the emperor now. I'm not talking about myself in the third person. I'm talking about my namesake, Nebulin. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, God. Maybe I shouldn't have taken this name. Oh, no. <laughs> but yes. Um, so you see the aspiration of the king. He's trying to model himself in the imperial manner um, by taking control of the synod. In order to figure out this um, problem, quick question, real fast: it Has has the has the time of feudalism happened yet? Not. Uh, feudalism, as people would know it, has not uh, come into existence yet. No. Um, the the Anglo Saxons would have a kind of semi feudal. It it kind of looked like uh, feudalism. You'd have like these sub kings essentially. Um, eventually, as more consolidation happens around the bigger kingdoms, these sub kings are no longer kings, and they become um, what are called ealdormen, which of uh, eventually becomes. Uh, the term Earl, which is what it's essentially what a count is in other countries, but for England and Ireland and all of them. Uh, and you'll actually see that as Mercia annex annexes different ki uh, sub kings and makes them. Um, yes, uh, it also uh, Alderman is also descended from Ealdorman. Uh, Earl, the the term Earl is kind of, I don't remember what the linguistic term is, but when the um, Vikings come in, uh, they have a term called Jarl, uh, J-A-R-L. Um, so it's a bit of like, you know, they're adopting that term a little bit by shortening Eyal Dormen, but uh, it, it stays in some places. Because England isn't really centralized at this time at all, um, or for the coming centuries, really, um, until rather recently compared to this stuff. Um, so at the... <laughs> I haven't... I don't know. Go. I don't know. But they will uh, probably turn you into a blood eagle which look that up it's kind of gross <laughs> um but yes bishop theodore um and oswe are really important for um centralizing the christian church in england um clarifying the doctrine and theodore would further uh divide up the the diocese so that you had uh that they're small enough to be easily administrated. I don't remember if this is when you get the Archbishop of York also, but um, even though there's an Archbishop of York, the Archbishop of Canterbury is technically more important because he was the first one, I guess. Um, uh, and, th and this is later on the, the, the guy that, that crowns the king. Yes, uh, I'm pretty sure that I don't think the formal crownings happened. Yet. I got to tell you, this is a digression, but I'm really mad at this this guy. I was not expecting him uh, to take the regnal name Charles III. Essentially, when you become king or queen, you get to pick a name. And that's your name now. And it has a number at the end. And I was expecting him to become George the Seventh, George the Seventh. Because Charles is seen as a cursed name. The first Charles got his head chopped off because he dissolved Parliament. And the second one was was never had any kids because... Well, or, 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 legal kids. <laughs> yes, legal kids. Never had legal kids. And was full of scandals. And a lot of people think that he converted to... He got baptized to Catholicism. Well, he well, unlike his brother, he was more of a secret. Yeah, secret <laughs> Catholic. Uh, so this is a cursed name, but no, he goes and says, "Ah, 
screw you. I'm going to become Charles the third. What the, the heck, Charles? The first, the first Charles King in like 400 years, 300 years. Yes. The scandal. Oh. Mostly because I'm mad that he took that name. I wanted him to become George the seventh. Well, the other, the, the other Charles had, had my, had my last name. Well, kind of spelled, spelled differently. Oh, Oh, Stuart. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm really mad at him for that. Sorry. <laughs> that was a digression, but, um, yeah. Who, 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 not really because kind well, kind of not really because that Charles is a descendant that people are talking about now. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so we talked about the charters earlier when we were talking about primary sourcing, uh, the kings would use a lot of um, uh, would use these charters to confer um, influence and wealth to these new churches. They'd found new churches, and this is a, this eventually becomes a little bit of a problem that uh, the the church has to deal with in the eighth and the ninth century a little bit. No, no, I want my superstition around the names of kings. I'm mad. <laughs> I'm mad mostly because it was my prediction and he went against it and that makes me mad. Sorry. Gosh darn it, Nebula. And I'm trying to I'm trying to you get in my mind over here, like you messed up. Okay. Okay. So yeah, these charters are really important for that. And it eventually becomes a problem later on. Names could be cursed, okay? <laughs> um, this starts bringing more worldliness to the church. And, of course, this further facilitates this new burgeoning trade. Um, because, you know, these monasteries need things. And these monasteries are actually pretty wealthy. Uh, Bede, on his death, actually... Uh, decided to uh, give people like pepper. Was it pepper? It was some sort of spice that's super rare. And he decided At this time spices are very important because there's no refrigeration. Yeah, and he decided to. This is like a rich gift. He was like, "Hey, all the other monks at Jaro, here you go. Have some spices." Like these, these were wealthy, wealthy um, monasteries and. Monasticism was actually really important uh, to the English church. Um, this is where most of the theological debates would be occurring uh, that would sometimes eventually go up the chain and then you'd have to deal with it with like councils and stuff. So this is all happening um, in the seventh century mostly. Uh, this is a time where Northumbria is ascendant um there's a little bit of time where the mercians are actually real uh, really powerful and eh, i have no idea if they were so sober i don't know if there was a rule against that at the time and, i don't know much about the oh, church and probably alcohol then was not different than alcohol now too uh, yeah i don't i man i'm not a church guy Talk to Dapper about that. I don't know. I don't do stuff about the church. <laughs> I just know why it's important to all of this because essentially, yeah. Um, as people do today, they used religion to gain power. But I might be getting a little bit too controversial. Uh, so this is a time where Northumbria is ascendant. There was a little bit of time. During this time where this guy named Penda rules Mercia and he actually starts bullying all the other kingdoms. He was a he was the last pagan um, king in England, by the way, uh, which makes him very much a villain to Bede. But yes, eventually Northumbria defeats him and Bede's all happy about it and everything. And Bede's like, yeah, screw you, Mercians. Now you guys can understand my jokes about the Mercians. Because they suck. Um, but the next century wouldn't go as well for the Northumbrians. Um, in the next slide, 
this uh this next century has in historiography is commonly called the Mercian supremacies it's not it, it's kind of like an exaggeration to say Mercia was in control uh yes we are now in the 700s um it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say that they were fully uh, like in control of southern england however uh, they definitely started to gain more power. And that is because they began using the Emporia far more than the other kings. Um, they intentionally moved their centers of power to some of the most influential Emporia of the time, especially London. London became the backbone of the Mercian kingdom. Um, so and, the first time since Roman times, London's become important again? Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'd say that. Um, it originally isn't part of the Mercian kingdom, but they, they, um, so this red line that you see on the bottom map is called Watling Street. It still survives today. Uh, it also was built originally by the Romans. So this is a very uh, old road that is right here. This was the hot, this was the main zone of control for the Mercians. And you see them moving to further annex and grow their influence over the territories on Watling street. Um, the Emporia become even more important as more and more churches are founded and um, kings start exploiting the trade, especially the Mercians. Um, you actually get new administrators uh, of these Emporia. Uh, have you ever heard of a sheriff? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, so a I sheriff... think I yeah. think it sounds familiar, but mm. so so a sheriff was. What the Emporia... Well, I can't see that because there's like a weird thing on the Streamlabs thing. Agspell Etain? Huh? Oh, that weird thing is a scannable device. You can scan it. Oh. Oh, okay. It, um, it, goes, it goes to my Amazon wish list. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um... Uh, so the sheriff is a a reeve. A reeve is an official of a small little territory. Um, uh, the officials that ad, uh, administered the emporia were called witch reeves because the emporia were actually called witches in Old English. So you got rich witch reeves. Um, and Ipswich where... Um, so the productive sites that came off of that came a little bit further behind these uh, emporia, they start creating this thing called Ipswich Wear that that starts going. Uh, uh, Sheriff S H E R R I F. Although back at the time it would have been a little bit different, but yes. Um, so these productive sites become incre incredibly more important and further down this productive chain, you actually get more exploitation of the natural resources of England. You get more, um, productive farms. You get people exploiting, uh, uh, local resources and sending them to the Emporia in order to get tra traded. And now we have to talk a little bit. Um, so the the evolution of the sheriff is a little difficult because it's so different throughout the time. Uh, when England becomes united, they divide their their larger um, uh, their larger administrative units into things called shires. And these shires are largely still um, 
still they still exist today. You'll see them. Um, uh, worse, worse, yeah. Screw you, English people, for making this word. Wor Worcestershire, Worcestershire, one of those Gloucester, Gloucestershire, uh, Leicestershire. These these different names. Th these are the um, remnants of those old shires. So they would have a reed controlling them, uh, and eventually. Yes, it becomes the word for the modern law enforcement uh, leader of law enforcement, and but the they had a very different role back then. And the sires were sires controlled by earls or sheriffs? Uh, it's complicated. Earls were earls were more like the hereditary um, owners of it, and the sheriff was below them, and they were. You know, they would be appointed, and they do the more uh, groundwork, Men Men menial stuff. Yes, like um, the like 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 the enforcers. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to the next, oh, uh, actually, that top picture, London used to be two different cities. Uh, you had London Weech, which is the important emporia, and you had London Burg, which yeah. was the fortified city. Yeah, I, I heard there's a London inside London. Is that that what that is? Yeah, the uh, London. It, they eventually coalesce because this becomes a big bloody city, right? <laughs> so the eighth century English church has some problems because these monasteries are getting super wealthy. Uh uh, some, the monks are being very monkey, you know. Oh. They're, they, <laughs> they're becoming very worldly. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, sounds like some modern megachurches we we might know. <laughs> Stop bringing politics into history, okay, Vandalia? What is this? Real world. <laughs> <laughs> um, along with that. Different people would be granted different charters. Uh, these secular people would be granted charters, and they would say they would build a church with this charter. And what they would do is just essentially make a land holding and exploit the property and exploit the wealth of the property to become richer. So that's a big problem. Um. Eh. And then um, pastors are all like the pastors of churches. They're not good enough. They're they're not leading their flock good enough, according to the writers of the time. They didn't like this. Uh, one of the ma main examples is uh, you get um, you get people like Tadmon. Uh, he is pictured in this stone thing, uh, who. Use the more poetic traditions of Anglo-Saxon culture in order to relay the um, the Christian uh, the Christian stories um, to their flock. But uh, of course, that's too pagan for the church. You gotta freaking do it the right way. Um. Uh. So yes, you get and also. Um, you have the ex, so the different monastic traditions, uh, are also a problem. And that's also down to too much wealth in the church, the noblemen gaining land under religious pretexts. And also kings would large, so the way kings would try to control kingdoms during this, like, uh, um, under kingdoms at the time would be um they'd put all of their favorite churchmen in positions of power in the kingdoms that they wanted to have influence over uh mercia was the main one doing this at the time and the church did not like that it, it, so these are all coming to a head at the at the time and don't necessarily get very um, resolved. 
So now we're going to get to talk about the, like, actual talk talk about people. We're going to get to talk about people and their people? reigns. People? People? Yes. Not just big, wide, sweeping things with some mention of people. We're going to talk about the reigns of some Mercian kings. <laughs> so Athelbald is the first person we're going to talk to. He actually had a really long reign. Um, he was, was he bald? <laughs> I don't. I'm. No, he wasn't. That didn't mean bald at the time. I'm pretty sure that means bold. I'm. I kind of want to look that up. Um, dictionary. Eh, screw it. I don't care. I don't care. Who cares? Um. So Athelbald. Um, you're actually going to see, um, so the first two pit, uh, pictures up there are Mercia really under him. Mostly, um, down here is other people. Uh, so Mercia has gotten a lot bigger in it since the this beginning days. Yeah. Um, and he uses the church a lot in order to, um, influence the other kingdoms. Uh, the other green, is things that he essentially is overlord of. Wait, wait, um, wait, 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 we're fast. Politic, kings and politics using the church to do stuff? I don't believe that at all. What What a what a dramatically different world from the one we live in now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, right? So I, I have some questions. Um, it, the, the church here is is still the Catholic church, right? Um. What? Like, okay. Who who is in control of? Who, does the church answer to the kingdoms, or do the kingdoms answer to the church, or does it depend? Is like the church an overarching connecting body that links all the different political mm, entities? Not really. Each different area kind of has a a, an, a more independent church at this time. Um, the Pope still really uh, doesn't have much power. I would. <sighs> the origins of the term Catholic. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. No, I, I I get that. Yeah. That 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 tracks. I I was just wondering if if because because later on you you get this sort of dichot or um, mechanism in at least my understanding of the mechanisms. Some of them in you know. Uh, the Renaissance period are sort of like uh, the church is sort of an interweaving, fairly well organized and fairly well connected in terms of its overall kind of policy making and everything um, over a broad area, even though you have then the political interactions. But that sort of level of in detail, sort of everybody being on the same page networking doesn't exist in the church across England at this point, right? Uh, it, it'd be more across Europe. Uh, the English church, while having problems of its own, is usually dealing with those problems um, by themselves through Canterbury. Um, okay. So whoever controlled the Archbishop of Canterbury, which was usually the Mercians at this time, essentially controlled the church of uh, the English Cool. Now, is this the time? This, this is around the time where the the Vikings started coming over. Or is it or not? not uh, the first Viking raid happens in the next century. Okay. Uh, really early in the next century, but they don't become more of a menace until a little bit later, like mid ninth century, maybe. Any more questions? Not, or, not at this moment. Okay, uh, so Athelbald was not part of the main line of the Mercian family tree, which at the, they were called the Ichlingas because they claimed descent from a guy named Ichel, um, who probably didn't exist, by the way, but that's an aside. They, they made up figures, founding myths, everything like that. Um, he His early life he spent in East Anglia, which kind of suggests that East Anglia was trying to control Mercia during a state of um, 
like internal struggle, they send their candidate over to try to take over Mercia. Doesn't work out for them because Ethelbald ends up controlling East Anglia instead. <laughs> um, uh, he's really the first monarch that starts um, moving to control London and Middlesex, which is the area around London. Um, he annexes it and he sort of moves his base of power along Watling Street, that road from earlier, and especially around uh, London. And he would use the church a lot by uh, taking candidates from um, Mercia that he had a good relationship. And he would um, place them into uh, strategic um, bishoprics and especially the archbishop um, of other kingdoms. Um, he would also uh, place his good friends and positions of power within Mercia. So he had a really strong, um, uh, he had a strong base of power that he eventually loses. And that's why he gets uh, murdered. <laughs> uh, a lot of the people at the time saw him as violent and despotic. The thing about the Mercians, even though they're super powerful, um, if they had people write about their kingdom and their kings, um, those writings don't survive and aren't referenced at all. Uh, so a lot so of the times he, these people are being talked about by others. So was uh, he murdered by his successor or just by a random person? No, he, he was murdered by probably his bodyguards, I think. Uh, so we're going back to the old Roman centurion days where they randomly murdered the king. Emperor. <laughs> yeah. The third century crisis. <laughs> his successor does not last long. I don't remember if it was so his definitely the So definitely the third century crisis. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Um, and he would explain. And because of his reputation for using the church to control other kingdoms, of course, the church didn't like him very much and was like, stop doing that. And he was like, no, why would I do that? And the biggest thing that um, he did that pissed off the church was he rejected monogamy. <laughs> he just fuck a lot of people. Uh, he saw this as a way oh, of... Hold, did, did he marry other people? I don't think he ever married, actually. Okay, because... And I'm I understand how obnoxious this is. Technically, actually, let me I'll just give it to you. Officially. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, the the root yeah. word gammy refers yeah. explicitly to marriage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah he, just, he rejected I'm, I'm it. I'm doing whatever I can to make myself as unlikable as possible here. I mean that's it, my do, it doesn't it doesn't say that he accepted polygamy, it just says he rejected monogamy. That, that that's fair, but if he rejected mm. mon monogamy by marrying one person and cheating on them, that's technically not a rejection of monogamy. You have to marry more than one person. He he didn't marry anybody. Well, then he didn't even. Oh, okay. Actually, you're right. You still you still win. Then you're right. Yeah, he used this winning as by a... default. The best yeah. one of all. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a bit of a win by default because I could go with the uh, still technically uh, the gammy refers to marriage. So it's just a null thing. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, he just uh, he used this as a way to kind of choose whichever son was the best son to become king. Um, didn't really work because his successor died anyway. But yes, he, he's. He's the first monarch of this Mercian supremacy that uh, old historiography talks about. Uh, when he dies, uh, Mercia kind of goes to shit. Uh, Wessex comes in and uh, conquers some Mercian territory. And it gets... Oh, in the next slide, the, the successor is... The name of the successor is on there. Okay, next slide. Uh, eventually, Ulfa who is actually a really, really, like, I don't know. Most people know about Ulfa 
He's in a video game. Uh, Attila I Total War. The of most uh, might need some revision there. Oh, bugger off. Well, there's a big dyke. There's a big dyke uh, named after him. Alpha's dyke. <laughs> What? Is that is that political director of now this game? <laughs> okay, he said it, not me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Where I don't, I've never heard of that. Um, it. If you go back to the last slide, Vandalia. Okay. Yes. Back and forth we go. Uh, if you see the uh, bottom right, that red line. Do you see oh. that? Uh -huh. That is Ofa's Dyke. It completely uh, borders uh, what was then English territory and Welsh territory. What's the definition of, of dyke here? Because when I think of a dyke, I think of a um, uh, like a levee or a gate for handling water. Is uh, it just small? So the, ori the original name in Old English is actually Ofa's Ditch. And it eventually becomes dyke for some reason. Probably because people don't know how to read Old English. So is that what we call a dam now, or is that different? No, uh, it, well, it's it's too big. Look at that. It's all the way it, – it's it's cutting whales uh, the word off, that they, I think, yeah. from the, the rest the, of it. The word that they would have used was ditch, D-I-C, uh, but the C is pronounced as a ch, so – more like a dick. It's just a big like, earthwork that, you know, you, uh, it's hard to, you know, attack through. Okay, so it's, the most obvious way I would uh, build such a thing would be to build a giant ditch and then put all of the earth that I used to build the ditch directly behind it to build like a big berm or wall. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That. I, I have a picture of it later on. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, so yeah, he, he, uh, so a lot of his, uh, so the successor of Ethelbald is Bjornred, and he, de and essentially he's a failure of a king. Um, the Thames Valley starts, uh, and actually we have a, uh, we'll have a map of the Thames Valley coming up, so don't worry, he'll figure out where the Thames Valley is. Uh, they start losing control of the Thames Valley. Uh, so Ofa comes in. He's not part of the this um, line from Athelbald. He's like a cousin, I think. Um, he comes in and takes the throne. And now he has to reverse what's happened um, under Bayonred and has to take back the Thames Valley. Um, and he's actually... Um, he was a mass. He does what Ethelbald does, but better, because he doesn't actually piss off the church doing it. Um, and he actually becomes the most powerful Mercian king ever, because Mercia kind of declines after him. <coughs> um, and he's seen as like the most <coughs> ruler at the time. And this is kind of seen by the fact that he's able to bring about all of these people to um, build a freaking long giant ditch essentially in between him and Wales because he wants to, I mean, sometimes they'd go, you know, it's just a, you know, you got to do it so that they don't have an easy way to come in, you know, <laughs> kind of. Um, he was obsessed with his um, succession, uh, and he tried. His big thing is that he tries to <coughs> end uh, the continental monarchs, especially Charlemagne, because he lives alongside Charlemagne. Um, so he tries to act like Charlemagne. Uh, one of the things that uh, Charlemagne and other continental rulers would do is that they would anoint their son as a co-ruler. So he does that with his son. Uh, that. While it may look like Egfrith is actually pronounced Edgefrith, because for some reason Old English is spelled awful, and I hate I it. I mean, so so is Middle English, so is Modern English. 
English never true. figured that out. Yeah. And while the things that he does in England is cool, I personally like what he does with Charlemagne more. Uh, because it shows a bit of how England has developed. Originally, a bunch of tribal kingdoms, trade isn't happening. Now he's able to say, hey, man, I want to be as prestigious as you now, Charlemagne, you know, the ruler of Western Europe. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to have a trade war. <laughs> as one does. Is that is that is that the new uh, is that the new Netflix show or Trade Wars? <laughs> Trade Wars. Uh, yeah, they just essentially in 789, um, Charlemagne was like, "Hey," he comes to often. And he's like, "Can I have a uh, uh, one of your daughters for my son?" And Off is like, "Okay," but you got to give me one of your daughters. <laughs> and Charlemagne. Is- for one of his sons or for him? No, for his son, Edgefrith. And Charlemagne's like, what? No, you're you're just a little lowly thing. What? Why are you doing this? No, you don't get one of my children. What? So essentially, Charlemagne imposes a trade embargo on English merchants. And Alpha says, okay, I'll do the same. Eventually, things... <laughs> Essentially, the trade war ends the same way a certain trade war that happened uh, within the last couple of years ended. Nothing really happened. Everybody sucked. Uh, it, it all sucked for them. Uh, and they ended up saying, uh, we'll get over it. And I actually have a picture. Uh, three slides away. I probably should have put this a little earlier. If you could go like three, three slides away because I have a fun. I have a funny picture. <laughs> uh, you can decide which one is which. Personally, I think uh, Charlemagne is Trump off of she, maybe? I don't know. I don't know which one had a, had a worse ego. You guys have any... Hmm. Um, I mean, listen, I hate Trump. I do. But I can't compare Trump. If if Trump had the same access to power that Kim's got, oh. then he would be worse. Well, but I, 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 I think he thinks he has that power, but he doesn't. Yeah, well, it, I'm more but, saying yeah, which yeah. one is... Which one is Charlemagne and which one is Alpha? <laughs> um, I mean, Trump's more powerful than Kim, dude. That's she. G- I mean, not not now. All eh, arguably now. But at least at least in this, at least not as not as mighty as he's still president. That's Xi Jinping. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's Xi Jinping. Oh, I I uh, fucking wow. That's really embarrassing, and I feel very bad. <laughs> You're good. Um. Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not sure it's that comparable, though. Is coming to, um, who'd be more offended by that? Like, how dare you try to take one of my daughters? I think it's Trump, personally. Uh, I don't know. I I don't know well, enough well, about. I say, um, I, I, say, I say, no, no. I think Trump would be Charlemagne because he has multiple. He, his kids are divided among the empire. Kids might divide the empire among themselves, like like Charlemagne's kid, grandkids did. <laughs> does she? Does she have a daughter? I have no idea. I I have no idea. I know because I, I I have absolutely no problem thinking that Trump would trade his daughter transactionally, right? I think yeah, but to that someone that he sees as lower than him, huh? To one that he sees as lower than himself. Yeah, honestly, 
because he okay. he's a narcissist. <laughs> I think fundamentally he thinks he 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 feels that he's lower than everybody else, and that's why he acts all the time like he's higher than everybody else. It it's okay. It's like a, and he's Ofa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll take it. I, I think I think unquestionably, um, Xi Jinping is dramatic. She is one of the most competent rulers of a major power in the last thirty years. I don't know, man. Things are going pretty bad in China right now, but uh, yeah, that's not. Are they going bad for Xi Jinping? Xi Jinping, though. Uh, possibly. Uh, he possibly, but I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Memes anyway. aside. Memes aside. Uh, essentially, he tries to make uh, Edgefrith his heir, and Edgefrith ends up dying only a couple months after him. So, let, wow. Let me, let me <laughs> wow. You can see that the... Uh, um, I, again, third century crisis. You can you can see how these these rulers they have good good times, but then their successors have bad times, and then a new guy comes along. Okay, memes aside. <laughs> so if you were wondering what the Thames Valley is, that's the next per that's the next picture. I assume it's the valley, yeah, where the Thames flows through. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, they don't want Wessex coming in on this because it kind of follows the uh, Watling Street. And you don't want them to come in and take London. So that's why that was so important. The next picture is Offa's Dyke. His... Nailed it. Yep. Yep. It's still there. I mean, it's kind of degraded, but, you know, it was built like 1,200 years ago. So, so you don't think it was. Yeah, exactly. You, so you don't, if, think, if you, don't it... think, you don't think it was still uh, protecting the invaders nowadays? <laughs> I mean,. You guys, the thing that you got to understand, which they understood, is that if you want to keep people out, you have to build a wall, okay? Because ladders <laughs> are fictional. <laughs> I mean, it's the Welsh. I mean, I think the English went the other way. They just took it. <laughs> it's it's it, so for for as much as as people knock that. You're, you're right. Individuals, you're not going to stop an individual from getting over a wall with something like this. You're just not. Yeah. Um, if you fill it with if you fill the ditch with water and they can't swim and it's wide enough, you're doing a lot better. But still, you're not you're not doing very well. An army, though, you yeah. can't get armies over walls as fast as you can get individuals. Yeah. The point is to ensure that you had time to build up your army. Exactly. To counter the invading army. Yeah. Or or attack them when they're if you attack them when they're just starting to get over, then they're gonna immediately retreat. Yeah. Because everybody who went over is just immediately killed and the people who are on their way. The yeah. the Great Wall of China, for example, I think a much more success a much more effective um example, but this is a much easier and faster thing to build. Yeah. Um, it could have also been a way of div economically dividing um, England and Wales. We don't yeah. particularly actually know why this was here. Um, but, you know, it could have been defense. It could have been, it could have been multi-purpose, you know, it could have been like a that. fence, frankly. Yeah. Could have been that as well. Uh, Nebulon. I think Creaky should pay for it. Not just Wales. Creaky blinders. <laughs> <laughs> oh nebula that yes <laughs> all right now we're going to talk about the dude who succeeds edgefrith also i gotta say hold on go back oh oh if if this is what it looks like 1200 years later yeah i gotta think it probably was pretty impressive when it was up oh yeah Right, yeah, like it, this it, isn't a thing that it would be trivial to get over. Yeah, so this this is a perfect example of how like uh, England, within two hundred years of the invasion, uh, now has like the wealth of resources and the ability to bring people together um, to do something like this. So, yeah, really good. 
All right, Chen Wolf. He's the guy that comes up uh, after Edgefrith. He is also a distant member of the Ichilingas. So now we're going into the Essex Essex's power. Well, no, he's the Mercian king, but oh. he eventually lays down the found uh, the uh, foundation that the king of Essex, while he was king of Mercia, is the last king of Essex. Uh, he event uh, after. This last king of Essex dies. They become Eldorman. Now, it does sort of come back because I'm pretty... Sh no, that was East Anglia. Never mind. Yeah, it's done. Um, he also uh, did some raids into Wales as well. Uh, Wait, he also so hold on, hold on, hold on. So, so his policy was, okay, there is currently a king or ruler or something of Essex. But that person... As soon as you know, now I'm in charge, and that person is the last one. And when they die, I subsume Essex into Mercia. Yes, and uh, this is really cool. important because London, you know, is super important, and um, having all of that uh, just further uh, insulates London from attack from others. London, I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh so he he while he raids into other territories, um he actually doesn't have very many successes over his rivals in the north, especially Northumbria, which uh starts solidifying the fact that Mercia is starting to um decline in power. And that is because um this idea of controlling kingdoms from afar is good and all but when the kingdoms start um rebelling you know it can be a little uh challenging to get them back east anglia and kent especially kent being the bigger one uh the they rebel and are independent from mercy and influence for actually considerable amounts of time which is bad for him especially with kent uh, he ultimately gets them back. Whatever Kent does is bad. Yeah. Um, w one of the more important. Oh, hmm? Pardon. I was just saying, Hoven. Hoven. Oh, Hoven. 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 <laughs> one of the more important things is near the end of his reign, the King of Kent is actually part of. <laughs> is actually part of the family tree of Wessex. Uh, I can't remember his name. So they marry, they, they marry into it. Uh, yeah, essentially. And actually, it's really uh, interesting. The guy who becomes king of Kent, who's from the Wessex line, is actually the ancestor of Alfred the Great, not the king of Wessex at the time. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is where Wessex really s begins becoming the main rival and actually starts gaining more power than Mercia. And they'll uh, they'll outlast them all. <laughs> uh, they'll outlast them all because something big's coming. That's going to be bad. Uh, you're called the Vikings, you know. But, yeah, Mercia, he's really the last... A uh, person who controls uh, Mercia in the way uh, that could be called Mercian supremacy. After him, things get bad. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that this time I didn't forget to talk about the book that I was researching from. And these are your source. This, this is your source. Who also uh, does a lot of they do a lot of cool things. I'd recommend buying the book. It so if you want to you want to so you guys want to check out the reason is right. There's the book right now. You can check it out and say and say say we were right or you guys got that totally wrong, man. Yeah. Call yeah. us out. Um, they have cool things at the end of their chapters where um, where they go into the primary sources in more depth than they could during the chapter. I yeah, I really like this. Uh, I really like this book personally. So I really recommend it. Question? Yes. Is 
is Mercia related at all to any modern words like mercenary? Uh, it is actually, in Old English, it would be called Mirce, and it is related to March, not uh, uh, mercenary. Okay. okay. Uh, so anybody in chat or in person have, have any last-minute questions for our for our English bead here? Oh, you think I'm bloody English, mate? Okay. Yeah, he doesn't sound like... English to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions, Tapioca Weasel? Or the Eddie? So where does Atlantis fit into all this? Oh, you see, Atlantis kind of, they came in and they invaded later. <laughs> <laughs> Way I mean, to roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> I so, mean, so hey, to, to the English that were getting attacked by the Vikings, they might as well have come from freaking Atlantis. So, so after this is the time of the, the Dane Laws? Uh, the Dane Law is more when uh, Alfred is king because he's the one that makes the... Um, so arrangement but yeah yes um i, I was just going to ask the description of the stream i think says we talk about the seven kingdoms of pre-norman england and um so so just to list those what what are they what are the explicitly the seven because uh, I've seen some maps and I counted them up and some of the maps had more than seven and I was like not sure where England was being defined. Uh, yeah. Um, so the kingdoms are Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex, Sussex, Kent, Essex, East Anglia. Uh, the, the main thing is that uh, the seven kingdoms are kind of older historiography. Modern historiography uh, definitely kind of discards that mostly because some of these kingdoms later on just get subsumed. There used to be even more kingdoms, a uh, uh, prominent is, example. Is there, is there a slide that had, I, I think yeah, there was. Uh, can my we go, thumbnail. Can we see if we can... Slide well, my five th has it, but it, it was the red, it was the red names in slide five. My thumbnail had the, had the seven, I think. Oh, okay. I don't have the, uh, but yeah, the red names on uh, slide five. Uh, it's this that one. The red names are the English. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Northumbria is technically two different kingdoms that eventually come together, Bernicia and Deira. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just a, it's not as simple as having seven. Well, kingdoms. of course, it, it it never is, right? Yeah. Um. That's why yeah. I asked the question. <laughs> Sussex and Essex really don't have that much of a historical um, importance, but you know they're still counted for some reason. You know, um, there used to be an independent kingdom of the, on the Isle of Wight, which were actually uh, traditionally, according to Bede, Jutish, just like the Kent, uh, the kings of Kent were. They were Jutish as well. Is yeah. what is Judish? Uh, so the three different groups that come in are the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. The Jutes uh, supposedly lived in northern Denmark. The Saxons lived in middle Denmark, and the Sac. Wait, the Angles? Did I say the Angles? Oh God! Oh God! I've been up since you said the Ang you said the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. I believe. Yes, the Jutes lived in northern Denmark, according to Bede. Uh, the Angles lived in mi the middle of that peninsula, and the Saxons lived at the bottom of that peninsula. There wow, was also crowded. lots of Frisians, and Frisians are still alive, by the way. But are the Jutes? <sighs> but other than interbreeding, obviously. I mean, clearly they... I mean, uh, their successor kingdom is Kent, and then the people of the Isle of Wight. Uh, to be honest, I don't. Modern people don't really uh, agree with my name. Yeah, no. Uh, 
about the, uh, that's uh, there there are very few places on the planet where modern people agree with remotely with the delineations of 1200 years ago it's not I, zero that's my thumbnail but it's very few yeah um that has wessex as a little bit more powerful than it was but yeah so what's a hep, um, what is a hep arc do you talk about that in the hep hep Hepatarchy. Oh, that is just means to... the rule of seven. Sorry, sorry. It just means the rule of seven. Okay. Hep One, two, is three, four, five, six, uh, or is it hept? Hept is seven. Archie is rule of. It, what was your question, Tapioca Weasel? So where is so whales on that is pink, right? Yes. And that's not one of them, right? No. Okay. They uh, actually had everything to... else other than the orange at the very top and the islands are everything else sums to seven. Yeah. So, uh, yep. Okay. On the map. Sussex, yeah. Sussex, Kent, Essex, Angles, Mercia, and Northumbria. And that it, Northumbria there is sort of connected up to another part of Northumbria. Uh no. What? The top of it. Orange. Where like Scotland. That is Pictland. Uh okay. the the Scottish have yet Well, okay. The Scot okay. That's a very difficult story to talk about. The Scottish are essentially invaders. The original people were called the Picts. Um it's <laughs> It's yeah, hard. well, I'm sure so they were invaders of the original. Here. <laughs> oh yes, but, yes, the picks were originally invaders as well. But yes, um, actually, um, so Scotland today speaks, depending on what government you, um, well, okay, what ethnic, uh, right? It's, a really it's very, yeah, it's it very is. complicated. Can I ask a different question? Yes. So the the years that we we've spanned here today have been mm -hmm. from the early 600s or before maybe I'm not sure to the late 800s the 900s uh, mid seven. early 800s early 800s okay so 600s to 800 800 yeah and um, so but... if like if you were to like try to encapsulate the theme of the history and the trends and forces going on at this time and like you know uh, a, i don't know a summary a greater central as a greater consolidation of the little tiny kingdoms as well as a greater connection to the outside world because uh during the invasion there was uh well quote unquote invasion uh, there was zero connection with the outside world. They were very insulated and very warlike. Also, the bringing in of Christianity is really important because it brings uh, with it writing and uh, the means by which they can organize society better. Excellent. Thank you. So, yeah. so Nebula and Eddie, you have any questions? I, I did want to note that Northumbria actually controlled uh, modern day Edinburgh in Scotland. So, mm -hmm. so they actually speak what I consider a dialect of English in uh, the lowlands called Scots. Uh, these are the, these are the lowlands, not not the highlands. Yeah, not, not not where the not where the immortals come from. I don't know that reference. You ever saw Highlander about to chop, chop, chop people's heads off? Nope. Never TV seen show it. The well, go watch it. It's a good TV show and movies. Okay. All right. So, uh, and then coming up, you guys, you guys want to advertise about, about, about your channels? Do you have anything to advertise? I don't have anything to advertise. I have literally zero things that I've ever posted on my channel. But I I I enjoy being able to hop on and participate and ask questions like this. Nice. 
Uh, let's just hope Ukraine keeps doing better. That's all I care about, baby. Fuck yeah, dude, man, they they are laying it down. Yeah, I talked. Uh, yeah, I talked about that at the beginning. If you want to go back and watch that, a yeah, bit. I'll go. I'll go back and check it out for sure. Well, for me, we will be talking about the movie, the, the, the re- uh, hmm. I don't know if it's just me, Maybe. but I can't. You're breaking up crazy for me. Yeah. I thought that was me. Vandalia, literally everything you said was garbled. Yeah. Uh- Ah. So, Bede, where do you live? I'm not going to tell you. If you want to say, you don't, you don't have to say, yeah. I live in Washington State, Western Washington. <laughs> I just moved to California. Oof. Yeah, it's expensive. Oof. But that's okay. I'm, my new job, I just got out of graduate school, and my new job is paying almost twice as much as my old one, so that's pretty good. Yep. Do you, like, do this for a living? I want to. Fuck yeah. Maybe, you know, can. Like, specifically the uh, the history stuff, or... Yeah. Do, do you mean the history stuff, or did you mean the YouTube stuff, or did you mean the fusion of both? The history stuff. Uh, I just need to get, like, my thoughts a little... My... It's hard for my thoughts to come out. <laughs> right? I mean, practice, right? Oh, okay. Still I don't see. know. I don't know if Fandelia is, like, connected or not. Uh, he said he probably needs to restart. Okay. Well. Yeah. I... Just... Go on. All right. See everybody later. Bye. Just do it. Turn it out okay. And today we are talking about two competing land masses, two competing forces over over one land mass. And who will come out on top? Twice. Uh, but first, introduction here. Who are you again? Uh, you I doing? am the end bead. I, I've shown up on here as like the venerable bead before. The, the, we're, this is a continuation of the the England stuff. Yeah, venerable bead, the Scythian bead, some other beads. Yeah, I'm. This one's gonna stick. Okay, I promise. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Uh, awesome. So. Uh, 
you're re you're ready to get into some more an ancient English history. Yep. Well, that and some other things um, <laughs> at the beginning, really quick. Um, but yeah, so this we're going to be talking about the ninth century in England, which is characterized by the rise of Wessex, as you can see on the screen here. Um, which is one of the kingdoms. But before that, we have an update on Ukraine. Uh, so th this last period has been um, punctuated by some big um, successes for Ukrainian forces, which has caused some political pressure back home in Russia for Putin. Uh, essentially, he did, doesn't have he didn't have enough troops to man the entire line, and that's why he was able to get pushed out of Kharkiv. Um, so on the 21st of September 2022, he does something that he said he wasn't going to do which was general mobilization. It's supposed to be limited. I highly doubt that it's going to stay that way because I don't think um, it's going to be enough to man all of this, especially now that Ukraine is also getting more trained troops in and it's just going to get more, become more of a meat grinder. So is, he, um, so is this like a desperation thing from him? Uh yeah, uh, he thought he could go in with the professional troops, take out Ukraine. Turns out he couldn't, so now he has to bring in more men because the Russian army isn't isn't like the United States army. Um, the United States army is a professional army first, and then like, yeah, we still have the Selective Service Act, but hasn't been used since Vietnam. Um, while um, the Russian army is more based on like m mobilization, so you mobilize your populace to war and only have a few uh, professional troops that once the mobilization occurs can quickly train those mobilized units. Um, so he tried to do it without mobilized units. But, you crank it, but you crank kicked their butt. Uh, yeah, well, they fought harder than he thought they would. Um, on the 30th of September, 2022, just after this, he decides to annex the four oblasts that uh, um, Russia had majority control in, Kherson Oblast in the south, which at the time, this was the only oblast in which they held the uh, capital of the oblast. Um, Zaporizhia Oblast, Donetsk Oblast, and Luhansk Oblast, with Oblast, which they actually had like majority control of at this point. Um, yeah, Herson. Yeah. Um, only a couple days later, um, something happened to a bridge in, in Crimea. Um. So when Putin annexed Crimea, he did it in order to um, secure the port of Sevastopol, which is, there's no other port on the Black Sea like it. Um, it's a drowned river valley from the Ice Age, making it absolutely perfect. Oh, for oh before, we get, before we go on, people don't know, explain what, what an annexation and an ex the annexation is and uh legally taking over uh the land of another country essentially um so when he annexed crimea he did it in order to get sevastopol which is the biggest port on the black sea and essentially the only way for um the russian navy to project power however it was geographically isolated from the rest of Russia, and seeing as they took it from Ukraine, Ukraine wasn't very happy, and wasn't going to let them like send 
send stuff over to it over land. So the only other way they could do it was building a giant bridge. So this is the Kerch Bridge that goes across the Kerch Strait. Um, this was Putin's baby, um, the symbol of the annexation of Crimea. Um, and some dude uh, took a big truck, semi-truck with a bunch of explosives and uh, drove but onto nope. it and then blew it up. <laughs> but nope, 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 no bridge today. Yeah. <laughs> um, they still haven't been able to get the railway bridge, which is where you actually uh, transport like supplies through operating, meaning that now there is only one way. Yeah, it, yeah, it fell. Part of it fell down. Yes, um, but uh, so now there is only one. This further hampered um, Russia's position in Harrison, uh because now there's only one route in which you can get supplies from, and it hurts their position in Crimea, of course. So when we last talked, the Kherson counteroffensive had just begun. Kherson is important because it is the capital of the Kherson Oblast. Uh, it was the only capital of an oblast that the um, Russians had conquered. And uh, Ukraine really wanted it back. And it's in a very tenuous position because it's over the Dnieper River. Um, so if you can bomb the bridges that were being used to transport um transport supplies over the river yeah an oblast is like a country or province county or province yeah um so if you could b bomb these things and make them unusable you, you can essentially make it hard for the army across the river to survive and eventually with multiple different um, blows onto their ability to supply their troops, uh, the Russians decided it, it was better to leave. Which is weird because you can actually see signs in Kherson saying Kherson will forever be Russian kind of things. And it's like... <laughs> so they had just they just annexed it like a month before and then they left because they just couldn't hold on to it anymore. Um, and so, uh, this was really hard fighting. This area is not conducive to offense, um, in a war, it's much better for defense. It's flat, there's no trees. Uh, so you're essentially going, you're attacking enemy positions with no cover, which isn't good. A lot of people died. Uh, I know people who have lost uh, friends trying to capture Kherson. Um, but um, if you go to the next picture, when the Ukrainians actually get inside, why isn't everybody uh, mad that they just got conquered again? Why is there all these flags? Huh? Didn't they vote to join Russia? It's almost like they think they're themselves as Ukrainians. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a bunch of people came out. We're like, yes, thank you. For... Oh, I, uh, the Russians on their way out actually uh, destroyed all of their, um, all of their uh, like heating power and all of that. And they're like, yeah, we don't have we don't have any heat, but no more Russians. <laughs> so they 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 were very happy about this. Uh, so the next important battle that we kind of need to talk about is the Battle of Bakhmut. So bef the purple is what Ukraine got back during the Har Kharkiv counteroffensive. As you can see, Bakhmut used to be extremely important f for uh, taking over... Um, the Donbass, which is Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. However, 
after losing all this purple stuff, it's not that important anymore. However, uh, the attack is being led by the Wagner Group, which is a mercenary group of ultra Russian nationalists. I, they're fascists, um, <laughs> and they're trying to make a statement here at Bakhmut that uh, the regular army couldn't do it, but we could, and we deserve to be um, higher up in in the government and stuff in Russia. Uh, and this battle is also absolutely insane. If you go to the next thing, I I'd like you to guess uh, what war this is from, because... <laughs> Wait, one second. Because, uh, yeah. These are Ukrainian defensive positions in Bakhmut, and... Uh, one or we, two, probably. Gonna... Huh? Is that from World War II? No, one this or, is one or from two? the this is from the Ukrainian war. This is oh. in Bakhmut. Oh, the pictures like like they from the olden times. Yeah, uh, trench color. warfare is str still alive. Um, and it's it it's really bad. Um. It, the Ukrainian defenders are struggling, but uh, they're, they're, they're giving the Russians hell. Um, at, during this time, oh yeah, it, Ukraine has been shelled to hell. Yes. Um, so, after all of this, um, the Russians have decided that they are going to... Um, they're keep, on, gonna, keep, on keep on trying? Oh, no, they're going to start attacking the civilians. They're going to ensure that uh, civilians don't have heat during the winter. That's why I said and, keep up, they're, they're going to keep on trying to say, hey, we're no. conquering you. Give up already. Can you please give up now? <laughs> yeah. Um, rolling blackouts are happening. I've heard stories about um, homeless people dying on the street because they're cold. It's, it's really bad. But... The Russians aren't having a good time either because they're also cold as fuck. Um, uh, that's what and um, yeah, that's what they deserve, I guess. And all the all this because some people in Europe want to join the join NATO. No, don't don't even believe that for one second. This is all about Crimea and securing Crimea. As long as there is territorial disputes, a country cannot join NATO. Ukraine was not joining NATO, ever. So, this was all because Putin was losing control of Crimea. Um, and he just really needs it. Uh, I'm sorry they definitely don't want to join anymore. They, they, I'm sure they definitely don't want to join now. Yes, they, de they definitely want to join now. And Finland and Sweden, which have uh, been extremely neutral countries and trying not to be on one side or the other are now screaming and uh crying let us in let us in to nato now yes because uh because of article 5 uh nato countries it's not on paper it's more of like a a principle thing because of article 5 you don't want to uh countries are scared to bring in countries that have territorial disputes because you're more likely to um you know cause a major war okay. over article five okay wait 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 you're telling me there are territorial disputes in, in europe since when did that oh. ever happen uh always <laughs> since the beginning of time i think uh, Article 5 is an attack against one, is an attack against all. It essentially says that, um, and there was a little bit of issues with this because Poland got hit uh, by a stray missile. Uh, if one of the NATO countries is attacked, uh, all the other NATO countries uh, join in on um, absolutely bullocking the dude who attacked, like, Poland or whatever. So, that... 
essentially, you don't want to bring in Ukraine when they're having territorial disputes with Russia because the likelihood of war with Russia, which would be really bad because it's World War Three, uh, exponentially rises. And uh, so Ukraine was never joining. That's just a, a, a scapegoat to allow Putin to do his imperialism. That's what... That's what he. That's what he. It's either what he he claimed or what he or what, he, what his paranoid brain thought. Yeah. All right. So now but, we can get it. But speaking Pardon? of, but speaking of invading powers trying to trying to live in another in another land. Let's talk about the, let's talk about the Vikings. <laughs> yes, they will. They will eventually come up. Um. So our goals for this talk about the ninth century England is explain why the Viking Age began, explain how the Viking Age affected England, explain the arrival of the Great Heathen Army, which was a big giant army of uh, uh, Vikings that came in and decided that they were going to stay and they were going to create their own kingdoms, um, explain the rise of Wessex and one of the most famous English monarchs, Alfred the Great, and explain why Mercia failed while Wessex seceded, succeeded, not seceded. Oof. Okay, r real fast. Uh, I might be I might be wrong. I usually am, but w is this the first great since Alexander? No, there's been a lot of greats, but this is the only English monarch. To ever get the name the Great, uh, it's not something they like to give their monarchs for some reason. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about our main source for this period because that that's very important. The Anglo-Saxon chronicles are what uh, chronicle a bunch of, of the uh, Viking attacks and the events that lead up to that lead up to this period and it continues on afterwards as well. It's beginning to be compiled under the reign of Alfred the Great. So you can tell that it's going to be biased in favor of one kingdom. Um, Wessex, of course. So it mostly only talks about um, how great Wessex is. There's Viking attacks elsewhere, but it doesn't give a crap because why do I care about them? Yeah. They're not Wessex. Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess I guess he's important. Kind of, I guess I guess he can be important since since I think even the current British monarch is descendant of him. Alfred the Great. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the Wessex kings kind of get a little muddy, so I was just making sure. Um, it misses some events and accelerates others like the decline of Mercia. Mercia probably stayed a pretty powerful kingdom up until um, the arrival of the great heathen army. Yeah, I, it, I, I, sorry, but I think, I, I think last time we left off, I think it was either Mercia or Northumbria and it was the big big boy to play with in the in the seven king, seven kingdoms before. Yeah, uh, Mercia in the last century was the big boy uh, who was throwing its uh, weight around um, Anglo-Saxon England. However, um, Mercia stays a big uh, power uh, up until uh, it gets absolutely destroyed by the uh, great heathen army. Um, but the Anglo-Saxon chronicles make it out like Wessex absolutely was the dominant power by that time, which isn't really true. But, yes, Mercia had lost a lot of its influence. It still probably controlled uh, the London area somewhat jointly with Wessex, which is kind of weird. But um, it's nowhere near the power that it had in the 7th and 8th centuries. So... Let's go on to the economy of the 9th century. So the economy of the 7th and 8th century uh, flowed around the Emporia. Um, the Emporia began to decline during this period, and it's not necessarily because of the Vikings. The Vikings may have 
sped up the process, but this is most likely because of increased centralization around um, nobility. Uh, you want to be near the nobility instead of in these cities away from them. So you're moving to more fortified locations um, around nobles. It'd be like, huh? Be like, huh? The king or or duke or whoever's in charge here has has all has all the soldiers around 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 this area. Let's let's live around this area. That's all the soldiers yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, also, wealth gets concentrated into the churches as well. Um, and there seems to be a differing amount of coins between like Northumbria. I think East Anglia is very similar. Um, they like a uh, low transaction. They had a lot of coins. They intentionally debased their coins in order to have more uh, low transaction uh interactions while uh in the south they tried to limit the they tried to limit the coinage to keep power in the nobility class and stuff like that so elite so the elites are becoming the focus of the economy in southern um england so let's explain why did mm, the decline of Mercia. So after Chen Wolf, the last guy from um, the eighth century, dies, uh, he his successor was named Chol Wolf. Uh, Chol Wolf dies pretty quickly, and uh, after this, you have a bunch of civil wars in Mercia, and this might even be linked to the decline of London. Uh, Lundenwich, which was the Emporia, loses its importance um, in the decline of the Emporia. And London was the power base of the Mercians. So without this, and with multiple civil wars happening between three completely different families over the throne, it allowed for their um, subjugated kingdoms like East Anglia, Essex, Sussex, Kent, these kingdoms were now able to exert their own self-control and even ask for help against the Mercians from people like uh, Wessex. Yeah. And As, London was never important ever again. <laughs> the there's a reason why it's the capital. <laughs> the, the other kingdom that was chomping on the bit to gain more power was Wessex under a king named Edgbert. If you go. I, I forget. If, I think that next, next page. Yeah. So, so I forget if I think I, I think I, I remember I could be wrong. You know, I think he was either, he, he might have been Alfred's either dad or great grandfather. I think it was his great grandfather. He's an ancestor of Alfred, not the direct ancestor, because this is a little bit earlier. But um, one of the, yes, Edgbert. Uh, Old English spelling is funny. That does not say Egbert, it says Edgbert. Yeah. Because the Old English are fucking weird, bro. Um, so King Edgbert is the first king to start um, exerting control over the southern kingdoms. What do you mean the old old England English was was think modern English is hard too? <laughs> yes, but uh, to our modern sensibilities, that does not say Edgbert, <laughs> which uh, means bright edge, by the way. So I think that's kind of cool. Um. He essentially uses one of the sub kings of Mercia. I can't remember if it's Essex or East Anglia. They call for his aid against the Mercians, and he uses this chance to defeat the Mercians and kind of usurp control um, from Mercia. He even goes all the way up into Northumbria and uh, and subjugates them for a, a bit. And he's given the title by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, 
the title Brit Britain Valda, which wasn't an actual title. It just uh, was something that was given to English monarchs who essentially controlled all of England at various times. Bede uses it as well um, in his ecclesiastical history. So uh, he clearly exerted a lot of power and he actually um, begins solidifying more control on the southern Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, which would be Essex, Kent, and uh, Sussex, instead of allowing local dynasties to control these kingdoms, he started trying to put his sons on the throne. And originally, his plan was to divide the kingdom. However, it did not. Um, it ended up not working out that way. And eventually, you just get. Uh, Wessex controlling the entire area by the time Alfred the Great becomes the king. Um, so why Wessex over Mercia? So we have to understand the um, sort of the structures underneath these kingdoms. Mercia um, was originally a bunch of different groups of people that got progressively conquered by a central dynasty. And these kings from these different little kingdoms got to keep their roles, but as Eoldorman, which um, is essentially like a governor, um, they, get, they got to help hold their positions in a hereditary sense. This means that um, Mercia was incredibly decentralized and you have a lot of competing interests fighting over the direction of the country, the direction of wealth within that country. And the, the king, if he's not strong enough, can easily be overruled by these um, competing interests. And we do know that there were three families competing for the throne because um, I can't remember. But there were three different families um, that didn't have any interests in keeping the family, uh, keeping wealth within one royal family. So it caused the kingdom to be incredibly fractured having to spend a lot of resources on civil wars, stuff like that. Wessex, on the other hand, was more centralized. Eldormen were appointed by the king, and um, if you were an important enough Eldormen, you'd become a ministeri, which was a position that held with it a lot of prestige, and you wanted that position. Now, so, Now, is this the, the prequel to the... Term Earl or something different. Yeah, um, that and the uh, Norwegian, uh, well, not Norwegian, the Norse term Jarl, kind of um, mixed together into Earl. So yeah, um, so they're competing amongst each other to benefit the king, so that they can gain prestige from the king. Also. Wessex was ruled by only one family with an interest in stability so that the family could keep its wealth and didn't lose out. Uh, they were called the Cherdichingas, <laughs> which is a very weird name, but yet yeah, uh, that means descendants of Cherdich, which was the, the mythical first king of uh, Wessex. So... A lot of what Alfred will later do is related to how he saw the church. He sees this period as a time of crisis. The literacy in Latin, which is extremely important to the church at this time, was severely lacking. And then, um, even if you did know Latin... Uh, yeah, I, I think you wasn't good Latin. 
even then, and even then, only the very, uh, only if you're really involved in the church or you're a high, high, high noble, even even then, maybe even not even them know Latin. Only only the select of the select. Well, yeah, if you were uh, like a monk, you'd know Latin as well because you're trying to preserve stuff. But you're losing this, and you're having to translate all of this stuff into Old English because they don't know Latin well enough. And Alfred was a man of learning. He loved his learning, so he sees this as a really bad thing. Um, but there doesn't seem to actually be a loss in enthusiasm, so we don't really know why there's a loss. Yeah, uh, so there's no real... We don't really know why there was this move away from Latin. Um, it could be because the churches were usually led by uh, people appointed by local lords that didn't really care about their positions as much. But the the fervor towards Christianity is still there. Uh, they keep building churches, uh, and they keep doing things that they see as necessary in order to fight off people like the Vikings, which come in. They do a lot of things that, um, they do a lot of things to try to, um, combat the Vikings in a religious sense. Like, you know, oh shit, we got to go to Rome. We got to pilgrimage to Rome constantly. Cause if we don't, God will be mad at us, and the Vikings will win. So, uh, so, so yeah, kind of like, uh, say, say that that almost like what the the Muslims do to Mecca. Um. Well, yeah, Rome. Rome is to Catholic Christianity what Mecca is. Not, not exactly, but you know, kind of, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's it's kind of yeah. Religion, religion usually is. Yeah. Uh, so let's finally talk about the Vikings. What? Right. Why? Why did the Viking Age begin? Uh, yes. We see that. Yeah. What? What? I, I was gonna say. I was gonna say. Yes. Why did they decide instead of conquering conquering the land that, and stuff to start, start around this time? I think around this time they start settling down here in England and. In Normandy, they're like, like, they're like, let's sell down now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so during this period, we can see political centralization begin in Scandinavia. Before this, it was a lot of decentralized kingdoms that weren't very population hungry. Uh, we do see a lot of population boom during this time. In Scandinavia, which could have exacerbated this. Um, in order to gain power in Scandinavia, you needed wealth. So you started going abroad to find this wealth, and then you'd take it back and you'd use it to gain power. Later on, we think the people that begin settling in Ireland, um, the British Isles, um, France and all of that stuff were probably losers in the dynastic infighting and so they decided I have this wealth and I have these soldiers I'm just going to go somewhere else and create my own new kingdom um, and I, I've i never seen Vikings but I think I remember see, like seeing a bit of the beginning like they're acting like England didn't exist Scandinavia and England had trading ties during this time. They knew that they existed. In fact, a lot of church people were mad at uh, Northumbrian noblemen for copying the beards and the hair of Scandinavians. So this idea that the Scandinavians didn't know England was there is kind of weird to me. They knew it was there. They wouldn't have gone there if they didn't. And instead of going after these uh, emporia or fortified um, air, these fortified uh, areas with wealth, they went after the religious institutions because there's nobody protecting them. But also, 
a bunch of nobles have their children or their siblings set up in these uh, religious institutions so you can uh, take these people and you can ransom them for even more money than what you got in the raid. Uh, you, there were books like the Codex Aureus that uh, they took away and ransomed the books in order to get even more money. So religious institutions were extremely rich, even though it doesn't seem at first like they were. Um, in this early period, it's sort of overstated how ravaging the Vikings were. The Anglo-Saxons were able to fight them off every once in a while. Yeah, every once in a while you'd lose a king, but it, they were able to fight them off. And a lot of this is we've got God on our side. We've done all these things. We've done our penance and we can beat them. But as the decades go on in the ninth century, more and more and more Vikings are coming and they're coming with more ships. Oh, shit. Finally, in the winter of 865, the Great Heathen Army appears. Uh, on the right, these are the campaigns that occur. Um, it seems to be a loose confederation of multiple different kings, including a dude with the with a really metal name, Ivar the Boneless. Cool ass name. Um, but, but I bet I bet wasn't it wasn't little, huh? But I'm sure it wasn't. I, I bet you it wasn't literal, though. Uh, maybe it'd be cool if it was. But yeah, Ivar the Boneless was one of them. Um, multiple different Viking lords, I guess you could call them, coming yeah, from you. different areas. Ivar was known for operating in Ireland. Um, uh, later on, uh, the Viking stories will tie try to. Uh, tie all of these guys to Ragnar Lodbrok as his sons. Uh, I don't know about the history. I, I'm pretty sure he's a semi-legendary character, not um, strictly historical, and could have just been like made up to um, legitimize these dynasties that show up uh, throughout the uh, throughout the Viking world, they first attack East Anglia, and at first it seems like they're just here for tribute. They go up to they go up to York in 866. They uh, and it looks like Northumbria was in a period of civil war, so they uh, were able to take this um, opportunity. They killed both of the claimants and put their own person on the throne. And then they're like, okay, let's go back to East Anglia. But this time, we're going to conquer it. And this is the first time you get Vikings starting to settle in England here in 869. And they even get powerful enough that they conquer half of Mercia and you you get uh dis two distinct uh entities in this area. Yeah, so so instead so instead of like grabbing this stuff and going back to where they came from, they're like, hey, don't we stay here and keep the stuff here? Yeah, exactly. Uh these guys probably lost out in the dynastic game in Scandinavia. They've been going around uh France, Ireland, getting all this wealth. You know what? Let's just stay here, found our own kingdoms, and uh, start using this wealth. And uh, hey, Mercia was the, gets... Pardon? Say, was, this, was this around the same time that uh, Nor Normandy was, was settled too? Yeah, um, by a different guy, Rollo. Um, and Mercia gets divided between an English dynasty in the West... And these Viking lords in the east of what becomes known as the Dane Law, because this is where the Danes live. Yeah. 
I was make a joke here. I was make a joke. He says, "Well, I guess you don't worry about Roll anymore because Roll's descendants have nothing to do with England ever." <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that comes later. <laughs> Spoilers. Um, in this time, Wessex has a bit of problem. Um, there's some dynastic uh, intrigues that happen. Um, if you go to the next slide, because we're going to talk about the rise of Alfred the Great. Um, there's some problems going on. Uh, there's like a succession of three different monarchs who are all brothers that all die. One is actually survived by a son who becomes a problem for Alfred later. But he's not going to be in this power presentation. Um, but Alfred is the one in 871 that comes to power. Yes, yeah. dynastic. Yeah, I, 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 used to, I used to be all in the ge genealogy and stuff. I think like Alfred was the youngest, or maybe or at least the only surviving, if the youngest or this the surviving member of all his brothers and sisters. Yeah, he was the youngest. Um, and he comes to power in 871, which isn't a great time to come to power because you've got the great heathen army rampaging all the way through England. And that sucks. And they decide to come into um, Wessex. They actually defeat him at the Battle of Wilton the same year he comes to power. Ouch. Timing. It sucks. <laughs> Timing. And uh, exact tribute from him. And, but they leave. They go back to their power base in uh, East Anglia. So he begins to uh, try to increase his power base. But it doesn't really work because in, 860, in 876... Uh, they come back one more time, bugger them again, leave. And then in 877, 877, they decide they want to stay. And they nearly conquer all of Wessex. And these little marshes that you can see, they're a little lighter color. I guess I should have gotten a better map for this. But there's a little island there called Athelney, which is the last place that Alfred is able to have a power base. But he's able to gain his army back up, and in 878, he comes out of Athelney and defeats um, the leader of this Viking horde and is able to get them the fuck out of there for at least 20 years. No, 15 years. And this buys him breathing room to start to reform the kingdom of Wessex and the other kingdoms in southern England to start looking more like um, something we'd call England, but not really. But not yet. <laughs> I think it's very important to note that before Alfred, the idea of a united Anglo-Saxon people did not exist. Um, Alfred is actually incredibly important in creating this idea of an English people. Does this go back to your country versus state debate when you when you're the Scythian deed? Uh kind of. Uh, the idea of a nation didn't really exist at this time, but they're definitely like uh, these people had more allegiances to their kingdoms than to an English identity. But Alfred the Great is going to sort of change that and in his reforms. If you go to the next slide, please. please. Um, Alfred loved learning. Um, there is a possibility that he was set for life in the church because he was the youngest son. We don't know about that. That's a possibility. However, he's also able to take the reins of power pretty easily. Yeah, so I, I, th not... I think that. Yeah, I think that might. I think that was. I, I could be wrong, but I think that was usually the uh, for the youngest child. You know, since they probably had no chance of all ever gaining any real power. They're like, <coughs> you just go do your church stuff. We got we got yeah. five other people above you to, to be king or, or whatever. You know. You be good little learner. Oh, 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 your brothers are all dead. It's your king now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 
while he was a good warrior, he dealt with a lot of problems. I'm trying to remember. It's like an intestinal disease that he had that probably gave him a lot of uh, pain. At uh, So he preferred learning over all these other things. Well, I, actually, that makes sense. You know, since he, he since he, actually that kind of makes sense since he was um, settled to be in the church and that's where they, all the learners went. I guess, I guess, I guess he, it makes sense that he was a, a, one of their smarter kings instead of just, a, just a, instead of just fight out a, just a straight out fighter. Yeah, and uh, he actually mourned the loss of uh, Latin understanding amongst the church. Um. So one of his biggest programs is to encourage education if you had to be in the church you had to have an education if you wanted to be an elderman you had to have an education he demanded a lot of his subjects at this time because he was like you gotta learn you got to motherfucking learn and he loved learning so much that he wrote his own books we have them so we actually can peer into the mind of alfred the great and what he kind of saw himself as um this in light, he he thought of himself <clears throat> as this more enlightened figure. So, question: Would his books be a primary source or not? Since it's it's more of a self. That'd be a primary book. source. I I, I, was, I was wondering that. I don't know if it was or not. Since you know, a book about writing about yourself is. I don't know if that if that would be like a primary source or or biased primary source. Uh, it all primary sources are biased. It's about um, it's about realizing those biases. Uh, his books are more important for trying to figure out the mindset of Alfred the Great okay. than they are for figuring out the history. I don't even think they were <coughs> written about history. I think they were more theological books, but okay. I can't remember. Um, it, in order to better fight off the... Um, Vikings, all of these red dots right here, these are fortified settlements that were founded by, not necessarily founded, but um, these locations that he, through the state, fortified and put soldiers into. So you actually start getting a professional army in England. So this was, uh, this was the start of a Wessex going from a uh, little corn land in the corner to all of England eventually. Yeah. So, uh, so he sets up these um, fortified settlements with their own troops so that, and he tries to make sure that they're near waterways and um, important locations so that if any Viking is ever seen, uh, this small group can, initially engage and wait as more troops come in um usually these would be like uh freemen that come together um just for the time of war to come aid these uh professional soldiers this actually does a lot to strain the economy of wessex and um there's actually a lot of things to suggest that Alfred did a lot of things to extort taxes from religious institutions, funnily enough, which sort of made them mad at him. But in the end, he's still, I mean, this essentially saves Wessex um, and builds a, a base from which his successors can form a new kingdom. Um, he builds his law code off of the legacies of older rulers instead of completely making his own. Um, some of the important ones are Ofa of Mercia from the last time. One of his ancestors, uh, Ina of Wessex. Um, there was a guy, I can't remember. There was like a guy in Kent, I think. Um... Oh, I forgot to say, these fortified settlements are called Burs. Uh, the 
origination of the modern term burro or how we'd say it in America, um, a burg, but yeah. Uh, Bur just means fortified settlement. And you actually get a lot of uh, different cities named that. Edinburgh, for example, is a Bur. Um, Canterbury was a Bur. Um, all of that stuff. And finally, Alfred does a lot to create a combined English identity. And he uses different ter terms. He tries to use Angelkun, which means um, English person, of course. Um, another one that he falls onto is Anglo-Saxon. This is where we get that term first, Anglo-Saxon. And he and he becomes, instead of the King of Wessex, he takes the title the King of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, so he's clearly trying to build in order to expand out. Uh, is it, I just, I don't know why they're called burras in um, England. They just say things wrong, I guess. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, they, I don't know why. That, that's something different, man. <laughs> That's a that's a whole other episode. That that's that's etymology, man. But yeah, it was bur. Um. So when we come back next time, we'll actually start working towards the kingdom of England, the unite, the uniting, and the, talking and a little journey, bit more about the, and the journey of all of Alfred's descendants. Yes. Until we, I think, until we get to the 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 Canudan the Canute invasions. Oh, Canute the Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I, that's how, <laughs> I can't pronounce his name either. Canute. <laughs> yeah. Um. Try try to pronounce how the Canutes. Yeah, <laughs> that's his son. <laughs> but, awesome. Yeah. So. I hope that I I did a little better. I tried a different presentation style this time, and I hope it was a little better. I like it. Lifting weights and learning are always good. So, what are your holiday plans before we? Young it's the bloody plans? World Cup, mate. We're gonna be watching that, and then Christmas. You know. Is England still in it? Because I know America lost already. No, they just got dumped out today, actually. Oh, they so... lost to France today. So England and America are both out? Yes. Um, yeah. So who, who, Does so anybody who, have any questions, though? Shipfish? And by anyone, it means shipfish, since he's the only one in the audience. <laughs> you got any questions? No. I, th I think you answered for me, not not for me. I think you answered all that I know of. I know. We, we, we discovered why the Vikings came. We discovered the little power balance between the, during the the remain the last remaining of the last Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and, and and the Danes. Oh, why was it called the Dane Law? Do we, do we do oh, that? because um, the uh, Vikings were called Danes by the um. English and that's where Dane law was like the laws of the Danes held sway. Were they even were they Danish? Uh, Danish doesn't exist yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Alfred's moves set up increased like the expansion of Wessex into what we would now call the Kingdom of England. Um, eventually incorporating the Dane law. Interesting things actually happen in the Dane law, which were actually very important for modern English language. It's why you say eggs instead of Aaron. And I'm glad we say eggs instead of Aaron. 
And it's also probably why uh, English doesn't have a case system anymore to try to better understand between Old Norse and Old English. That's a hypothesis, but yes. Um, so England's going to become... The Anglo-Saxons are going to unite into a single kingdom, and it's going to be the big... It's going to be the biggest kingdom. Got the most land, has the least mountains to mess with um, agriculture. So it's going to be able to start asserting its dominance over especially Wales and a little bit in Scotland. But some things happen. And we'll get to that next. We'll get to those next time. Yeah, instead of Vikings, we get the, the, the descendants of Vikings coming in and saying, hey, I want to be king. Well, for me, this, unless we that happens, this is most likely the last episode of this season. So, can you, so let's let's tap and congratulations. You are you are our season season finale. Oh I I'm very important then. I am very important. We are around the eight eighties and eight nineties. We're probably gonna pick up we're probably gonna where are we gonna pick up the next time? We might actually, yeah, we we're actually going to talk, because this time we end uh, with Alfred, and the next chapter, while it's going to focus on the creation of England, it's also going to focus on the Scandinavian settlements in the Dane Law. So around eight, eight, eight eighties, eight nineties. So the. So, are you thinking? I was gonna say, are you thinking January or February? Uh, I want to challenge myself. January. All right. Book fell. And then uh, challenge myself. Then you fall down. Uh, yep. Yep. We start. We started this season with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we ended it with the Wessex. To totally compatible. To totally compatible subjects. Yeah. <laughs> Also, I hope Morocco uh, does well. Is that your is that your is that your new pick to, to win it all? No, I, I I'm going Leo Messi, Argentina. Let's go Argentina, but eh. <laughs> it's going to be quite interesting. It's Argentina, Croatia, Argentina versus Croatia, and France versus Morocco. That's a very interesting World Cup lineup. But that's coming back on Tuesday. Well, good, good. Well, good luck, Argentina. And good luck. Eat. Yeah, good, good luck, Morocco, too. I mean, this. I think this is like the furthest an African country has gone in the World Cup ever. So good luck to them as well. Right. Screw France. They already won it in 2018. They don't need it again. <laughs> I. Right. We'll see y'all. We'll see y'all next year, and remember, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye. If you just do it, it'll turn out okay. And today, you're talking about what I guess turned out okay for the last thousand years, at least, the creation of the king, the kingdom of England. Yep. The 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 country that eventually becomes a bloody empire. But now it's just full of turfs. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, coming back again, my guest and knowledgeable about all things England, the bead. Yes. Hello, the end bead. Yes. But yeah, I go by bead. So yeah. before you start, I, th I, think, I think I ever asked—I forget if I asked you this or not. What made your interest in in England in England history? I have no idea. <laughs> that that was a long time ago. I don't really remember what happened. All I know is that eventually, I don't know. It just became something I liked. 
I was able to, um, I memorized the Order of the Kings of England uh, after the Norman Conquest. I'm sorry. The Anglo-Saxon kings of England get really, really muddled. And they've all got like super similar names and they don't have the numbering conventions either. So it's a mess there. So I'm, <laughs> but... Well I don't know about the order of them, the old kings, but of it, but I did one time in like 11th, 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 12th grade. I literally taped together like 20 different, 20 different uh, family trees all the way from off of the great to the current rulers, put them all together of England and Scotland and then taped them together and made a little photocopy of it on my big printer photograph thing in printing class. Yeah. Like, yeah, family tree. Th those family trees start looking more like bushes, though. So, Oof. a lot of crossover with France and Spain and Scotland. A lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, uh, there's some sussy marriages later on in the Kingdom of England. Uh, gladly, the sussiest of them all, which I think they were like second cousins. Uh, did not produce any children, so that I think it was that. The, <laughs> was that William the Third and Mary the Second? Yep. The one they the were last... second. Yeah, they were second cousins, and it was both, gross. Both both grandchildren of Charles the First. Yeah, like wh why? Why would you? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, well, I can't it, do it. At least it wasn't <laughs> as bad as the Hasburgs. That is true. That is true. The Habsburgs did not have a family tree. Uh, they had like a family bramble bush or something. I don't know. Something that like intersects constantly. D disgusting. Right, but they talk before we sorry, go, on, go on. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. So, well, before be we get joke. to before we get to the English problems they have, we got to talk about two other things. Yeah, Ukraine is still a thing. Um, <laughs> not a lot of big movements uh, currently going on. Uh, the Battle of Bakhmut still happening like the last time we talked. Uh, but there's actually been movement going on. Um, they've decided they're no longer going for the city. Uh, they're gonna go they're gonna try to bypass it and surround it. Um, here I've got a map of north of Bakhmut and south of Bakhmut on the bottom. Uh, Bakhmut's the big white blob that uh, is in the that just so happens to be in both pictures, just different sides. And as you can see, uh, the Russians are the red, and as you can see, they they've started to move move uh, to surround. Um, in the north, the big battle is Solidar. It has a bunch of mines. Uh, it looks like uh, the Russians have mostly taken it over. And then the big one in the south, though not as much talking about it, probably because it's a smaller city, is Klishchivka. Uh, and funnily enough, uh, so the Ministry of Defense and the, the big mercenary unit that the russians use wagner uh are competing for who actually took solidar wagner who's been the ones that are really uh who've really done most of the fighting in bakhmut say that they did it but um the ministry of defense i think they said that the vdv took uh solidar and the vdv are uh russia's best troops the paratroopers I do think it's weird that the minute we hear about uh, the VDV arriving near Bakhmut, uh, Solidar begins to fall. But, yeah, they don't like each other. Wagner and the Ministry of Defense do not like each other. Um, another thing is just in the last couple of days, uh, the Russians have attacked Vuhadar. Um, the Russians are claiming massive success. The Ukrainians are saying that they've beaten them back. I've seen a bunch of videos showing a bunch of blown up Russian tanks. So uh, I don't 
I'm pretty sure they haven't done much. But uh, in one of the more... I've had problems with this because I think it's funny. But a lot of people find it morbid that I find it funny. But then again, I've been pretty immersed in this war. So I don't know. Maybe I've just became desensitized to this. Um, on the top right, that city, Makivka, it is in occupied territory. And there were a bunch of Russian conscripts in a school. And on New Year's Eve, they decided that they were going to shoot off weapons in celebration. Um, their commanding officers tried to tell them, don't do that. The Ukrainians will find our positions if you do that. And they were like, no, screw you. I want to celebrate. Um, and then the Ukrainians hit the school. And uh, there's competing numbers and everything. Possibly up to 600 people, I think, uh, died in the explosion. Possibly less. They shouldn't have celebrated. Uh, yeah, celebration during war, <laughs> especially if you're firing off your guns, not a good idea. You're gonna reveal your positions. Yeah, this this ain't this ain't the World War One Christmas truce thing. <laughs> no, and that that that's a pretty rare thing to have happen. And then uh, for the next conflict that I kind of wanted to talk about, mostly because I just heard about the possible high end of the numbers that um, come out as dead. Um, and, uh, there's been a civil war in Ethiopia since 2020. Uh, and essentially, it is extremely complicated, but... The old government used to be the TPLF, the uh, who are a, a Tigrayan uh, militia, essentially. Each of these Ethiopia is full of different ethnic groups, and they've all they all seem to have militias. One of them is the TPLF, and that's the Tigrayan ones. Then you've got the Amharic ones as well. The Oromo also have them. It's a mess. So the TPLF lose power, but um, they lose power to... He's actually ethnically Oromo. I don't remember the name of the president. But when he came to power, people thought he was going to bring change. And his biggest thing was he uh, made official peace with Eritrea to the north of Ethiopia. Eritrea used to be part of Ethiopia, but split off in the 90s. And they've had a border dispute. Uh, but he... Some disputes with the TPLF occur. Uh, he decides to crack down on it in 2020. We've got a war going on. Uh Initially, it looks like the TPLF is going to get defeated. Then all of a sudden, the TPLF uh, com uh, completely uh, reverses. And there was actually a point in which they nearly took the capital. Uh, Eritrea joined the war on the side of Ethiopia which, because most of the people in Eritrea are Tigrayans. So... But they joined in um, a lot. Of, it's been blockaded, so people can't get supplies. Uh, the The different militias are going around cleansing villages. It's really bad. Uh, yes. yes, village cleansing usually is bad. Yes. Uh, it's been uh, described as a genocide. And a lot of this hasn't been helped by... Uh, social media. Uh, people have used social media to ramp up anti uh, the ethnicity they don't like um, rhetoric, and it's and it's just led to a clusterfuck. Uh, the numbers, uh, the high end of the numbers is uh, six hundred thousand dead. Uh, the low end is um, the low end is. 
three hundred and eighty-five thousand. So, a lot of people have died. This is actually so far deadlier than Ukraine. I doubt. <laughs> I still think Ukraine might get deadlier. You know, but but there's more. Uh, attention. But this this is, this one has less attention to it. I'm guessing. Yes, this one has a lot less attention to it. Um, recently, problems between the central government and the Oromo have started up again. The Oromo actually sided with the Tigrayans during the war for a little bit in 2021 and 2022. So uh, there's currently a ceasefire that started in November. Um, we'll see if that sticks. I hope people don't stop killing each other here, but... Uh, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we just gotta hope. <laughs> but speaking of problems in a little tiny area of land, smaller, smaller than this, and smaller than you, smaller than here, and smaller than Ukraine. Um. So we're gonna be talking about the. Uh, 10th century before Ethelred the Unready, so up until the 980s, 990s, but starting in 899. Before, before, yeah, from the, from Alfred the Great's death to about before the all the invasion, before people started like going, let's, let's invade England again. <laughs> so our goals today will be to talk about how. Did Alfred's heirs conquer England, and how did these kings set up administrations for their new kingdoms? Now, I do want to so, make. I, I was gonna say when we last left off, Alfred was a, was a little was a little, little, little Wessex, and the and the Danes had the had the east coast of England all to themselves. Yeah. Well. Uh... It was actually called Greater Wessex because he essentially controlled everything uh, south of the Thames, but uh, and he essentially controlled Mercia as well. Um, but yes, the Danes controlled a lot. But um, yeah, I do want to make sure that we know these kings were not going out to set up. A kingdom of England. They were essentially just trying to expand their power. There was no idea of a kingdom of England at this time, at this eight ninety nine stage. So there was. So they were still. They are just West Wessexans. Yeah, West Saxons and Mercians stuff like that. And we'll actually see that cool uh, loyalties cause some issues when they try to conquer those areas, but. The, the, Feudalism versus head again? Uh, not feudalism. Just these places had been their own separate kingdoms for so long that they they just kept a strong independent streak, and it took a lot of um, social engineering from the kings to ensure that they didn't um, break away, and it didn't always work either. Uh, <laughs> but as we'll see later on in other presentations, but yeah. But yeah. Awesome. That's something I didn't like from, what was it? Um, with Uhtred of Babenbur. They, they made it out like they wanted to create England. No, they just wanted... that. The, the, there was a... The, Alfred started this idea of an England, but... The, you know, it, it took, a, took a while, huh? It took, it took a while to get, get everyone, everyone on the board. Yeah, it took a while, and I don't even think that the, the king they had doing it was Edward the Elder, and I don't even think Edward the Elder cared about making a kingdom of England. But you know, yeah. All right, so how did the Indian settlement happen? We don't know. End of story. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no real written sources. Um, it's clear though that because there's very little material changes that happened, that the ethnic makeups were fluid and pragmatic, and oh, 
the the Danes mostly took a lot from the Anglo Saxons. There's a little bit of seeming inspiration from Scandinavia, but we're not sure if that's because it's an active we're trying to be like Scandinavia or if it's like a, a convergence thing. Uh, but they've done uh, genetic studies on this area, and it's clearly more related to Norway and Denmark than it is to the rest of England. So clearly something happened. We just don't know what. Just like with the Anglo-Saxons, but this is a much shorter period, and it, you know, it's dominated more by hey, look, our written sources are most definitely more dominated by hey, this is what the Kingdom of Wessex is doing because that's where all our sources come from. So they don't really care about so, the Dane law. <laughs> So, the, so no, no Dane writings, no five bureaus writing, no Mercia writings, no York writings. Uh, there is one little thing from Mercia, but it's um, it it mostly just corroborates what's going on in in the there. There's like an a different version of the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, but it's not that extensive because Mercia doesn't survive very long. But yeah, no, I do want to point out the five boroughs up here because this will become an area of pretty big um, like fighting because these are during this time these are like the big trading settlements of the area. Um, it's Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, Stanford, and Lincoln, uh, known as the five boroughs. Um, and these are, they're going to be fought over for a little while. The, the bottom of the map looks like what, what, what will be London is on the corner of three kingdoms. Yes, uh, because that's also a rich settlement, but it was controlled by Mercia because uh, Alfred the Great gave it to Mercia. For now. For, for now, yeah. <laughs> so in 899, if we go to the next slide, in 899, Alfred the Great dies and his son Edward the Elder takes the throne. Now, Alfred the Great ha had a nephew who was still alive, Athelwold. Athelwold decides that he is going to initiate a civil war. Uh, England and their civil wars with the kingdoms. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's clear that at the beginning of this, both sides had equal legitimacy, and neither side really had a disadvantage. But eventually, Edward, um, Edward takes the. Uh, the initiative, he invades, e Ethelwold goes to East Anglia. Somehow, Edward's forces are there. Um, the Danes with Ethelwold. The Danes with Ethelwold attack the army that was left in East Anglia. They beat it, but they, they lose a bunch of men. And Rip. Done. Goodbye. And then from there on, that most of the, then from there on, most of the, m most, if not all of the, in, uh, the kings come from Alfred's line. Hello? Yeah. So I hear uh, they all yeah, they come from Alfred's line. Um Mercia Mercia wasn't under the control of Wessex though. Um it was under the control of uh they call him an Elderman, so he he was clearly some sub, uh, subordinate 
subordinate to Wessex, but uh, it was Alfred's son-in-law, Athelrad, um, who was married to uh, Alfred's eldest daughter, Athelflad. Okay. He, uh, and they actually do their conquests separately, but they essentially work together. Right, so instead, instead of so instead of conquering it per se, they married into it, into Hello? into owning it. Yeah, they into Mercia instead of militarily. Like, like, but why conquer that with will bullets? change soon. Well, well not bullets. Uh, bullets. Initially, Edward takes a more defensive stance. Okay. That's like a joke. Why conquer with with uh, not bullets? Because the bullets haven't been here yet. With swords, when you can con and swords and arrows, when you can conquer with your sperm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but Edward initially takes a, a defensive approach, but that will change actually with the death of Athelred in 9-11. C-E, not, not, oh God, I just realized, oh no. <laughs> not B-C-E? Uh, not B -C -E. <laughs> <laughs> Is everything you still there? Uh, is the connection okay? Yeah, you're you're slow. It's just like I don't like you. You come quiet for every so often. Is the connection okay? Yeah, I I can. It's him. I probably think, but you stopped talking for you stopped talking for periods of time. You didn't. You didn't hear me talking about uh nine eleven. Yeah, you made See, a joke about. Yeah, I heard that joke, and then you stopped talking. Uh Okay. Okay. All right. Next slide. <laughs> I, I am on next it's slide just, already. Uh, yeah, next slide. I did. I was I was here. Oh, I can't see it. That's weird. And I'm uh, here. Something's going on. It, yeah, uh, you, you're all like, you're all laggy for me for some uh, that's reason. That's not good. That's not good at all. My. Slides his expansion of Edward the Elder. Yeah, you keep breaking up. Should I leave and rejoin? Maybe. All right, I'll be ready. We we'll back to these messages. <laughs> A commercial for places times like this. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Hmm. I have can you hear learned. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. It Nah, you are still wow. Uh, wow. Well, I guess one of your you streams is having connection issues. Hmm. Yeah. I need a new computer. That's not good. Well, let you talk, and hopefully, people hear you. I'll I'll be quiet for a while. Okay. Um. All right, so um, in 911 CE, uh, Athelred dies, and um, Mercia comes under the control of Athelflaed, 
Um, both of their strategy, they, they go more on to the aggressive stage of conquest. Both of their strategies were to take chunks of territory, build bursh, like, and then hold that for a little bit and then go again. So it's this real piecemeal uh, consolidation. But they eventually um, control all the territory south of the Humber. So everything except for Northumbria. Um, and they actually let many of the Danish leaders keep their autonomy at uh, during this initial stage because it's a lot more rule over like vassals than it is to integrate the territory and then have to deal with all of that uh you know uh. um in 918 Athelflaed dies and Edward the Elder integrates Mercia into um into Wessex for a little bit so for for now they are um, the same so kingdom. In the next slide, yes. So Edward dies in June of nine twenty four, and he initially divides his kingdom between Alfweard and Athelstan. Uh, Athelstan controls Wessex, while Alfweard controls Mercia. Uh, Alfweard dies soon after coming to the throne. Uh, but this is this initial idea that not everything is, uh, is seen as the same kingdom yet. Uh, they'll do this dividing the kingdom upon so, death and then integration. Yep. So this, this is so this is around the time yeah. of instead of I think the eldest son you 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 get you give your kingdom to all, all to all your kids everyone everyone has a piece of it not necessarily all of your kids but um I just don't think they really thought of these two kingdoms as the same thing so okay. he decided to um, divide uh, the kingdom. It also seemed as if Alfweard was really popular in Mercia because he had he had campaigned there with his aunt. Okay, um, I was wondering if so it was he just seemed to be more popular there. Might as well divide was, the kingdom. They, they just don't see them as the same. Okay, I, I was wondering if it was like uh, Charlemagne when he gave. The, when his kingdom was divided among his three grandkids over in France and Germany. And it was like, you get France, you get Germany, and then have fun of it. Instead of Athelstan. The yeah, and then Athelstan uh, takes over. And Athelstan uh, will do the initial conquest of Northumbria. Okay. If you... Go to the next slide. Yes, Master. So it seems the initial conquest was surprisingly peaceful in 927. Uh, and he brings together all of the all of the different kings and uh, princes and everything with uh, interest in the area to a place called Aemont. Uh It's not important that it's there, but yeah. So Aemont, at Aemont, they all decide, we're going to be peaceful. We're not going to do anything, okay? We're not going to fight each other. And this lasts for a while. And then we don't really know what happens for some reason. And Athelstan is uh, invading Scotland in 934. Who, who knows why? For some because I, I know why. Because England, England likes to invade Scotland. It's their thing. Ah, that is, that is true. That is true. They do like invading Scotland. It could have been that Scotland had decided to support maybe somebody who who uh, had interest in taking Northumbria. Uh, just, we don't know why, but this happens. 
And interestingly enough, it does look as though Scotland and a bunch of different Viking forces, including the King of Dublin, who will become important later, uh, come together and fight as a force, but are defeated in 937 at Brunanbur. This this is uh, this is a battle that that they made poem about because it was such a great. They love this battle. They're like, oh yeah. Who loves oh, it? The Scottish. This is our. Uh, oh, the English one. The English one, and, and essentially, for the rest of Athel uh, Athelstan's reign, uh, secured Northumbria. Uh, uh, this was their um, Battle of Elysia. This was their. Uh, this was their Battle of Pharsalus. Just. Something that they, you know, talked about in poems and everything. But, yeah, you've defeated all of your rivals now. But uh, what happens when you die? Which. Well, hopefully you have a secure success in line waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. Incident. He did. But sadly, wasn't able to control Northumbria. Uh, he dies in 939 and is succeeded by Edmund. Yes, all of these kings' names are going to get confusing. I don't expect you to remember them. It's just unless important to know. Yeah. Unless succession. You're, unless you're like a, a England, England history freak, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's just important to know a succession occurs. A little bit of that royal authority is lost, and in the process, Northumbria is gone. And it actually seems that this is our first cropping up of local allegiance. Well, not our first, because technically it does seem as if the Mercians were wanting the division of the kingdom earlier. But this is, I guess, the second time. The Archbishop of York and many of the local elites in Northumbria didn't want Edmund is their king. So they invite the king of Dublin, who had fought at Brunenburg and was one of the losers. He invades in 940. His name is Olaf Guthfriedsson. I hope I pronounced that somewhat correctly. <laughs> um, well, he's able to for, take... I, said, I guess for once, Ireland took over, was invading... England's the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Dublin was a bit was actually a pretty prosperous kingdom at the time. It's probably why Dublin eventually becomes the capital, but um uh, <sighs> uh lots of slavery happened there, but also a lot of commerce, so it became really rich and had uh pretty good ties with Northumbria, which is why Olaf probably was able to um, invade so easily. Uh, he also takes control of the five boroughs. So th this event was enough to push England all the way back, at, not only out of Northumbria, but also losing some of its uh, conquered territory in the Danelaw. And this isn't the first time they actually lose both Northumbria and the five boroughs. But in 941, Olaf dies. Nice. Thank God. Um, next slide. Uh, yes. And the, uh, Edmund is able to reestablish his authority over the five boroughs in 942. And this is also uh, the, uh, the people at the time saw this with the, uh, as a, an achievement that rivaled Brunenburg. I don't really think it does. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, um, and then in 944, he reinvades Northumbria, but then, Comes more Vikings. No. But this is under Edmund's success. Edmund was his name, right? 
Yeah. Edmund's successor, Eadred. And it's another Olaf. Olaf Sithtrixun and Eric Bloodaxe. And they're able to control the five boroughs as well. Uh, but this will be the last time Northumbria asserts its independence in the creation phase. I'm trying to remember if they assert it later. They, uh, I, not really. They don't. They don't really do that. But by 954, Northumbria is fully under the control of England, and Eadred and his six. It's and his successors are able to now begin the process of creating a common identity. <laughs> something to, something to unite them. So in nine fifty five, Edred dies. So is this when they become what you call a state or a nation yet? Or the what? Things to, what? I didn't quite hear you because so this, this one the they become what you what you either as a nation or a state like you like your like your thing from a few a few months ago a common people yet or not yeah um yeah it does kind of come into that I did see a claim that uh no it's neither at this point um. It's it's going to be a while before we get get any sort of nation out of this. Though I have seen some historians claim that England under um, Edgar is a nation state. I think they're stupid. Um, <laughs> I think calling England in the 10th century a nation state is just dumb. Um, so next slide. So we have another division of the kingdom after, um, Eadred dies, um, between Edgar and Eadwy. That says Eadwy, not Eadwig. Don't say Eadwig, it's Eadwy. Not Earwig. Old English, yeah. Old English is stupid. In 955, uh, I'm pretty sure it's divided. Uh, I can't remember. Edgar might have controlled Northumbria and Eadwy controlled the south. And then Eadwy dies and Edgar re reunifies the kingdom in 959. Edgar will be the... If Alfred the Great is seen as the beginner of this resurgence in Anglo-Saxon culture. Edgar is the golden age. And he brings... He's probably the most powerful Anglo-Saxon monarch that doesn't fuck up his entire reign. Sorry, that is a bad word. I'm sorry. <laughs> Because I'm talking about um, Athelred the Unready, um, who's next time. His name is the Unready for a reason, and it's not for it's not for the reason why you might think. Um, but yeah, for some reason he waits until 973 to be coronated, and he's coronated in Bath, and he brings all of the other kings of Britain to Bath. This image right here of him in the boat, all the all those oarsmen are the kings of, in Britain. Now, question. So he goes out on he goes out. Is yeah. was Bath an old Roman settlement where they took where the plumbing was? Um, yeah, it was Aque Sulis, and that's, I think the Baths of Caracalla were there. There was a big bath complex there, of baths, um, and 
it's probably because of its prestige that he chose Bath to be coronated. Um, and he's coronated as the, above all the kings of Britain. And he came out on the water in this boat. And he's the one in the front, and they're all the oarsmen. If that doesn't tell you how much power Edgar had, I don't know what does. Because, uh, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I, I'm your, I'm your supreme king. His time king as now. king. Bowed had... me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his. Time as king would would be he would essentially set up all of the structures that will eventually be used by future rulers. He's the one who sets up many of hit he's the one that finalizes many of the laws that govern the different administrations, laws that govern the church. Um, and we'll see that in the next slide. This isn't just, by the way, when I'm talking about administering the kingdom. This was a gradual process. He just has the more out of all of them uh, and uses it especially for um, church reforms. Uh, so we have an immense expansion of legal activity during this time. Be issued constantly. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that they're named after the king and then they have a, a Roman numeral right after them to say which law code it was so for example athelstan one athelstan two athelstan three athelstan Athel Athel four that kind of thing seems more that these law codes were kind of like negotiation tools uh all the nobles would come together they'd make a law code they'd see if it works then they'd come back together again and reassess and issue another law code so that's why oh. there's a bunch of law codes so is, is that is those you know, is, is that kind of like the pirates of the caribbean like they're not rules more like guidelines check from that movie i forget how it went yeah yeah they're more like guidelines that we're constantly Changing to ensure that the running of the kingdom is smooth and also to keep up the idea that Edgar or, or any of these kings of England are, are uh, the superior to everybody else. And we're going to see a lot of activity through... Uh, these administrative divisions, the shires and the hundreds. Um, these will be controlled by local nobility, and they're the ones that have to administer the laws in the area, as well as many of the freemen in the area. So clearly there has to be cooperation between the king and the local nobility for any of this to work. So this is more like feudalism then? Proto-feudalism. Okay. <laughs> feudalism is a, re is a really weird term. It, it, I could get in a whole rant about uh, the term feudalism and why... It's not really a good term and does okay and doesn't really describe really any government ever. But I don't want to, so okay. so <laughs> I <have> to. <laughs> we'll, we'll so, save that. We'll save that for our fifty dollars Patreons. No, just kidding. Oh, I don't have any of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> uh, we'll say that for a different time. Uh, so the lower, lowest. So go to the next slide. Uh, the lowest of these administrative dis- divisions was the hundred. Uh, in the more northern areas, there's a lot less hundreds and they control more territory in the south there's a bunch of these things and they could and sometimes it's only like two cities um so that that, uh they'd hold a hundred court every month where everybody comes to one meeting place um usually prominent uh landscape uh features or like ancient ruins stonehenge i think was one of these uh distinctive features that they would um go to and this was all about administering justice they'd wish witness the transactions that would happen that month and they decide there's a criminal and we have to pursue him together uh uh, there's probably there might be more more um, like rich people that can tr- that are oh wait yeah there there is a reef there yeah they do have a head and the head is supposed to administer all of this but it's all about administering justice they meet a lot more than the Shire Court does. And in the Danish areas, it's not called a hundred, it's called a wapentake. So a little bit of some of the um, cultural uh, influence of the Danes, because it's not called the hundred there, it's called the wapentake. And now we're going to talk about the cool... The two, the, the the cool ones that bring us the sheriff. It's the term Shire. Yes, the Shire. Um, these are the historical counties of England, and they run along the lines of historical shires. Um, it does seem that Wessex had these. It does seem that Wessex had these under the reign of King Ina. And it looks as with the changing needs of the state, the shires also changed. At first, it's just an administrative thing. During the conquest, it becomes more of a military structure. Um, but eventually under Edgar and his successors, we start seeing the more medieval uh, idea of the Shire, uh, where the Shire the Shire court meets twice a year. Um, it would be held by the secular leader of the Shire, the Eil Dorman, and the religious leader of the Shire, the bishop of the area, um, and they would present all of the laws. Because the laws are constantly changing, they have to ensure that all of these new laws are transmitted to the populace so that they know what they're doing. Eventually, uh, you'd get more power being wrested away from the Eldorman and being held by the Shire which is the origin of our term sheriff. It's also unknown when Mercia was divided into shires. However, the theory that the book I'm reading uh, mostly uh, goes down with is that it was divided under Edward the Elder because it seems as if local... um, powerful communities get divided in weird ways to ensure that uh, their powers are lessened. 
No, I guess even the sheriffs back then had more power than the sheriffs do it in America. And the closest to the king is the royal court. Um, I mean, I guess the, the, the power of the sheriff was more just you're, you're appointed by the king and your power is essentially like you're gonna, um, administer the law in the area. So yeah, it'd be more like a, the power of a governor than it would be our current sheriffs. Okay. Clad. This was really where uh, the kings of England would get their uh, the loyalty of their subjects. Mostly the nobility. It doesn't matter. They don't care what the peasants think. They care what the nobles think. The royal court, which was always centered within Wessex and later in London. So, so one central location. Essentially, all the nobles throughout the kingdom would have to travel to the capital where the royal court was in order to see the king. It's a way of getting them away from their power bases so that they can't challenge your rule or they can't build up local loyalties. Um, they would frequently hold feasts and celebrations to encourage a shared identity amongst uh, the various nobles in a way that, um, you know, like build friendships, build... Uh, Build a sense of community to ensure that they don't want to rebel and fight each other. Um, We're all friends Another here. way to control... Yeah. Yeah. Was that... Was that was one of the things they did by one saying... One of the ways in which he was able to not only... Um, I can just, sorry, I can ask I can't, it. Can't sorry, uh, sorry, I was gonna ask. Uh, it's one of the ways, like they do, they do even nowadays. This, hey, instead of fighting each other, let's fight a, a common enemy. Let's all team up against that guy over there. He's not us. <laughs> or they're not. Uh, us. Yeah, they definitely had that when they were trying to conquer the Dane Law, and when they were trying to conquer Northumbria. Yeah, they definitely try used an outside enemy more during that time but this was a time of peace so they didn't really have that damn peace um they it was a time where they had to build this up uh through through things like feasts uh another way to more pit nobles against each other instead of against the king and also to uh, also the what you know humans are very weird you know yeah they, they like prestige for some reason and like prestige Prestige can sometimes be more important than wealth, and that's probably because a wealth accumulation is easier when you have higher prestige. So, definitely the king would use his ability to grant titles and things uh, to uh, and grant titles and lands in order to keep the more powerful people on his side, so that if the so that they don't want to rebel, and if somebody does rebel, he's got very powerful armies on his side, while the, the person who does rebel 
doesn't. And we actually do see a lot of uh, powerful families rise during this time. And it's, it's actually quite interesting. It seems like there was a deliberate policy to give nobles lands in random areas throughout the kingdom. So not keep them all together. Um, make sure that if another reason for, for this is if they want to rebel, their lands are um, are not centrally located, so you can't have the central area to bring all your forces to. Your forces are scattered if you try to rebel. This is another way of trying to essentially control your subjects that have to uh, fight you so that they don't fight you. And if they do fight you, they lose. Um, know, the, know your winning side. Yeah. And the final way that Ed Edgar especially, because this mostly happens under Edgar, uh, tries to control his kingdom is through religion. Um, so the next... What you mean? People control control the religion. They control the people. That, that's that. That's that. Would, wow, that would never happen nowadays. <laughs> uh, it's more he um he encouraged certain movements within the kingdom that reduced the power of people that had throughout uh throughout history used um patronages of church property to gain power and wealth. He encouraged reforms that ended that power and more made it so that instead of gaining wealth from uh, these churches, you were sapping wealth by giving money to these churches instead and not gaining wealth, but you were gaining prestige instead. So, yeah, kind of, you kind of, you know, using the... The, the the religion to control people. Um, so the Benedictine reforms were all about how is the church going to be run? They saw um, the time of Bede and the monasteries where monks were, po were powerful and seen as moral upstanding monks that didn't, you know do bad things <laughs> that they weren't <laughs> supposed to do. They saw this as this golden age that they wanted to go back to. They wanted these monasteries to no longer be held by secular um, secular powers that were using them for wealth instead and didn't encourage knowledge. So this is this was essentially so started yeah. I can make a joke. So, so was this the was this the make England great again time of like make England yes. great again? <laughs> make the English Church great again. And there are three big reformers. Um, two of them went to the continent to make uh, went to the continent to study and um, gain ideas. The other sent someone. To the continent instead of going himself. Um, funnily enough, the one that did not go to the continent was the most vigorous of the of the uh, three reformers. Um, so the three reformers are Dunstan, who becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury, Athelwold, who was Bishop of Winchester, um, which is the traditional capital of Wessex, and Oswald, who is Bishop of Wor Wor Ugh. Wor Worcester, Worcester. Yes, I know that doesn't look like it's pronounced Worcester. Don't fight me. Fight the British on this one. This isn't my fault. And he was also Archbishop of York. Athelwold was... Dunstan and Oswald wanted a more gradual... Reformation, where they, where they, gradually brought in new monks and let the old, let the old church people leave. Athelwold wasn't having it. He said, 
get the fuck out right now. <laughs> you're you're gone. <laughs> and brought in the new guys. And he seems to actually have gotten the consent of um, Edgar to do this. So clearly Edgar, um, he was either a true believer or he kn knew the power of these what the power of these reforms would do um or he could have been both i always say both um they saw a change to urban centers especially in um winchester because they had to build walls to block off the the uh what's called the new minster in winchester uh from the public because it, it, it's kind of this retreating of the monks before they were all worldly and trading and everything. Now they're going to be going back into the, the monasteries and uh, reading all the time and not going to be interacting with the rest of the world as much anymore. Um, and instead of allowing nobles to profit off of um, church land, uh, instead they had to build churches on the end and they had to pay for it and all they got out of it was prestige good old prestige yeah humans are weird i i don't get it but you know it's a good way of manipulating people to ensure that um you know they listen to you <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing that doesn't happen nowadays in, in today's society at, at all what no. What? Yeah, the these three figures are were pretty powerful. Um, some of them wrote actually wrote law codes about how monks were supposed to uh, act. I can't. I think that was Athelwold. Athelwold was the most liked out of them, even though he was never uh, like. Uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, which was the big boy in Eng in the English church. He's only the Bishop of Winchester. But that might have been because the capital was still in Winchester. So, you know, he's next to the king and everything. I don't really remember when they actually changed the capital to London. But, yeah, there you go. And that's the it for this part of history. Now, it's very important to note that his uh, successor, I think it's his successor, one of the kings after him decides to screw it all up. <laughs> and, you know, his name's Athelred the Unready. <laughs> but that's a story for another time. Yeah. Oh, my God. He screws it all up. Oh, more for his family than for the Kingdom of England. Yeah, England survives, and technically his fa his family survives. Yeah. Wait. I'm, per with I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he, his, his great-granddaughter marries... Uh, Henry yeah. the First of England, or yeah, great, great granddaughter. Yeah, they fled to Hungary after um, this mad mad lad named uh, Kenneth conquers. They flee to Hungary. They live there for a little bit, and, and then uh, later on, Scotland. Yeah, but like again. Yeah. That's a story for next time. Yeah. Are there any quitch chones? I don't think I have any, and I don't think there's, I don't think my chat person is have is have anything. But I actually I do have a, one question. Well, not about this, but so what do you think of the at the end of if, if you do it once a month, you keep it up at the end of at the last Saturday of each month we do this, the England sure. day. Sure, England Day. The England Day last. Okay, people, you want to hear about England? Come the last Saturday of each month. You hear it live, 
and bring your questions. Yeah. Damn. I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I said so. So overall, what is your opinion of this time in England history? English history. My opinion. Um, I think this is the most powerful. Yeah. Uh, the House of Wessex ever was. Uh, yeah, Edward the Confessor had a lot of power, but he was also a really weak king. Um, Athelred the Unready just screws it all up for the House of Wessex. That that'll be his. That'll be Edward's dad, daddy. I think, right? Yeah, Edward the Confessor's father. Yeah. Um, and if anything, um, A Athelred the Unready actually does screw it up for England if you don't like the Normans stupid Normans yeah um since yeah he married, since he married someone a little a little a little lady called Emma it got that blood in the in the mixture there yeah um also this is the most powerful power this is one of the most powerful the kings were um more and more these local families, even though their land holdings are more spread out, um, it eventually gets to the point that sometimes these noble families are more powerful than the king. And while they're not going to rebel against the king, uh, they're willing to use the king more as a puppet, like uh, how the Godwinsons used Edward the Confessor kind of thing. Um Canute, of course, controls more power, but he's also controlling like three different kingdoms, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> he he doesn't really count. Yeah. But yeah, whoever said that, like, I don't get it. He said uh, that this period of England was a nation state, so essentially a state comprised mostly like that. The nation state is a incredibly modern term, and I don't know why he decided to use it on the Kingdom of England, especially when many of the various parts of the kingdom had different loyalties that just happened to, like, still send king. I, I so really they, they don't like it. So it wasn't a nation of people yet. It was this, this at this point. It was still this nation of we're we're Wessexians, we're, we're Northumbrians, we're, we're Visians, yeah, Mercians. Yeah, yeah. The kings held a lot of power, but a nation state. I'm sorry, that really got me. <laughs> yeah, that so that wasn't a thing until the 1800s. Then really yet. Yeah, nation states are. Definitely like a, uh, you know, um, nation states are usually highly centralized. Um, but, but I guess of all, I'm guessing of all the countries of Europe, this one was the, was probably the, the more nation state of all, of all of the rest of Europe at this point, I think. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say that because this is, the Carolingians are still around and they're, they're currently having their crises where, like, yeah. multiple and, different families are competing for the throne of West Francia and everything. And Spain's oh. still controlled by the Moors and barely kingdom there. And there's and there's the Holy Roman Empire, so that's all, all over the place. And and, and Italy's not, not, not a thing yet. So. Um, so with the Holy Roman Empire, a lot of people like to... Uh, I don't know. I think that the Holy Roman Empire's foundation is under Otto... The Great, so a little bit later, some people give it to Charlemagne because his title was Emperor of the Romans. But um, at that time, it's just a it's just a different state than the Holy Roman Empire was for for me personally. But you can have there's different historians have different opinions on yeah. that. So all I'm saying is right now. England is the most put together of all the year right right now. I think England's the most put together of all the rest of the rest of Europe at this point. Yeah, it quickly goes down the shitter though. So <laughs> you mean something something that doesn't go well in Europe? I don't believe that at all. What? No. 
But well, thanks for being on. Next week we learn we learn about why Alfred wasn't why Alfred wasn't ready for what it, what was coming, and we learn about the baby Warner possibly two invasions by a little by the by the descendants of the of the Danish people. Yeah, the Scandinavians and the Normans. Well, there was actually two invasions by Denmark. Svein Forkbeard was the first one, and then Canute the Great. But I thought I thought Vane, I thought Vane, I thought Forkbeard was Canute's father. Yeah, Svein invades first, then he gets kicked for a little bit. Well, he dies, and the Danes are kicked out. And then, then Canute of- comes. Yeah, it's like it's, his son's like, hey, this is this is my, this is my dad. This is my this is still, this is still this is my fa- This was my dad. This is, so this is mine now. Yeah. So three invasions of Scandinavia. Well, I, well, I, I, I guess, guess it's it's gonna... it, we get technical about it. I, I can. I always thought you know it was the sense of Shane family. Ah, uh, yeah. Re- reconquering. <laughs> but again, we'll learn about that next time. Any last words you want to talk about? Anything? I, I was I, I can say anything on your channel, but you don't have the channel really. <laughs> uh, nothing but Slava Ukraine. I enjoy. I everyone. If you want to learn more about this yourself, what books that what, what book are you reading? They can they can read if they want to. It's called The Anglo-Saxon World by Nicholas J. Higgum and Martin J. Ryan. It's very technical, though, so I don't know if it's for. Uh, There's some good. Uh, what history times got some good videos about this period, too. So you can go there. All right. As for me, we'll be back here next in about a month for the thing. But also, go to my community poll and vote for the what trilogy you want to you want me to talk about next. Up for vote, we have the uh, the Sam the Sam Raimi Spider Man trilogy, the Christian Bale Batman trilogy, or the Iron Man trilogy for Robert, for Robert Daniel Jr. That's all for all for a uh, vote on my community tab and my Twitter page. So, whichever one we're talking about next next later next month, go vote. But until then, never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. Bye. If you just do it, that'll turn out okay. And today we are nearing the we are at the penultimate episode of the Anglo Saxon trials of England. Yup. Uh yeah, we are. Soon the the at least Saxon kings are done. I don't know about saying Anglo Saxon England is, but well, uh, even today uh, their blood is still in in the is in there a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Very right. diluted, but still there. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could say that. Uh, people like being all like, "Oh, I'm an Anglo Saxon." Okay, good for you. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> put 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 on a helm and get a shield. Then I don't know. Right. So, how do you feel about our journey almost coming to an end? It's been a long. I... Uh, it, yeah, it's been a journey for sure. And this is this is your time frame. This is where you're from. So anything that. Anything past this part is a, a spoiler alert, alert for you. Oh man, technically right now this is spoiler alerts for me. Holy shit, a Viking takes over England. What the hell? Oh god, the heathens. Wait, weren't were you still a heathen by then, or were you a good Christian? I died. Boy? I died a long time ago. And I was a Christian. I, uh, so you were you already been converted by then? Yeah, I was a monk my whole life. What? 
All right. Speaking of monks and stuff and Vikings, let's talk about today's topic. Athelred and Canute. The feud they shared a what they shared a wife. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, they did. Uh well, I did not. I did not know they had great color photography back then in in, in England. They had what color photography? Uh, this is in England. <laughs> As of uh, it has been a year since Putin declared his quote unquote special military operation in Ukraine. These are photos from uh. A couple of these are from the first day. I think the top left ones from the first or second day, and uh, the the bottom left is aftermath of, you know, the battles around Kiev, and this is all Russian equipment. Like, look at Jesus! Woo, that's a lot of that's a lot of vehicles gone. Yeah. Actually, uh, the the top middle picture, one of the first, uh, was a photo taken from a live of the border checkpoints in Crimea. That dude is current running away as a bunch of tanks are coming at him, uh, and that's one of the first people shared. And it's like uh, the war has begun. Oh shit. Normally, I'd say happy anniversary, but that's not, this isn't very happy. No, uh, I kind of wanted to talk a bit about the numbers if it will come up, and it does. Um, military casualties so far uh, probably around 200,000 ca casualties for Russia, and I can see probably similar for Ukraine. Uh, about 60,000 dead Russians. I don't know about... I don't know about Ukrainian dead. Uh, so that is a lot. Uh, the the biggest loss it took, uh, um, Afghanistan, they only lost 15,000 troops during the entirety of a 10-year conflict in Afghanistan. So that's insane. And they've lost uh, how many in one year? In one year? Uh, one hundred thousand killed and wounded. Sixty thousand killed. Wow! So they like tripled or quadrupled their whatever that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, when you move the uh most populated countries in Europe going at each other, it's gonna be deadly. Um, 799 Ukrainian civilians have been killed, while 11,756 have been injured. Um, 8 million Ukrainians have fled the conflict. Um, 5.3 3 are, are still in Ukraine, but have fled the combat zone. And... Uh, It does. I thought it told me that the, the amount. Oh, here, six thousand Ukrainian children have been taken to camp inside of Russia from Russian-occupied territory. And, and uh, did you know people out here saying that there is a? Oh, I got it from CBS News. Um, but uh, yeah. There are people currently out there right now saying that this war isn't happening because there isn't any war footage on the news on TV. Uh, I don't know what you want to be showing you on TV. Uh, I've seen some of the war footage. I don't think that shit should be on the TV because it's gory and yeah. not very nice. Yeah, uh, that's it. That's how we learned about the Vietnam thing. TV, they TV, they TV, TVized it over here in America. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's a it's a blood war. I've seen some pretty what? terrible things. 
including things that have happened to children. So I don't think that should be on the news. Yeah, bloody, so bloody war, really? That wars aren't bloody. So, wars aren't bloody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know what these people want. Uh. Yeah, of course, but in this climate, you don't want to have kids looking at like what I've seen. Okay, uh, they they have they have shown all of the uh, blown up uh, tanks and stuff. I think that's I'm fine. I'm surprised at this point they don't have like a. Like a like a like a like a streaming service for for war videos like like war flicks or war Hulu. Yeah, it's not like it it not okay, but it's like these things aren't able to be found. I find them. I've found the these videos. They're not that hard to find. You you can literally find them of people literally dying stuff and pretty bad photos just, just i don't know i don't know what, what do you really want to have a five-year-old see a three-year-old autistic girl with her stomach eviscerated and her mom's unattached I, foot right I, next to her I certainly no but i've seen people bring up a, a kindergartner to the passion of the christ movie back in the 2000s so people do weird things Okay, uh, well, the war is not going to end until uh, the Ukrainians want it to end. The Ukrainians are currently living it, so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah so I want the war to end, too. Uh, Russia, please go home. Yeah, <laughs> so in a year, besides the death count, count what's been the land thing that have... Have they got the land back by all the land back by now? Is Russia taking more land? Uh, well, Russia came in from four sides. They got bogged down. They were forced to leave Kiev. Um, uh, Ukraine has actually taken back a lot of, of land. Currently, Ukraine back foot for a little bit. Um, but because they're preparing for an offensive in a different area, and they're just trying to stall Russian advances currently. Um, uh, Ukraine is about to get a of modern tanks that help them in an offensive to try to take back land and really hope that this war is over soon and that, uh, Russia decides, let's leave. Is there any chance any other country can get involved or just one-on-one? -on -one, so me one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, I, I don't think any other country should get involved that would just cause more death and suffering that True. doesn't need to happen um nukes i don't like nukes i don't want to be nuked yes, do you want to be nuked? not personally no <laughs> yeah nuking no fun i don't want to get in. so i mean this is ukraine this is ukraine 1776 let them fight it but Help them fight it, just like the French helped us fight our 1776. Uh, but I guess speaking of countries invading other countries, let's talk about let's talk about what happened a thousand years ago. And he's okay. And he's back. There are there are people that don't believe nukes exist. Wow, that's insane. Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so last time we left off with a pretty powerful, um, and centralized, seemingly centralized, uh, English state uh, around King Edgar. Um, and Edgar wielded the state and the church effectively in order to, um, 
in order to solidify his power. However, he just so happened to decide that he he didn't want to live past like 35 or something like that. So uh, he died on the 8th of July, 975. And he ends, and they're both young. I'm pretty sure his first son is 13 or 14, and his second son is eight, somewhere around eight. So this isn't good uh, for the kingdom. Is his second son okay? Oh no, I might have to go onto my phone, uh, but we'll just see. If that happens, I was asking, was the second son from the second wife and a future king confessor person? Uh, this is this is Edward the Confessor's grandpa, uh, actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, so as soon as Edgar dies, we see a bunch of noblemen try to take some power back. I'd lost a lot of power and land and wealth to the church. And now the church no longer had its chief um, benefactor, Edgar. So they were like, give me my land back. Um, the Benedictine reformers saw this as, uh, oh no. Uh, they saw them as, as anti-Christian. The but of course, this is just a slander against their political opponents. As clearly, even the people trying to take their land back were pro monat They liked monasticism. They just didn't like their land taken away. Um, so you have these two, two kids, and they're trying to figure out who's going to become the king. Um, there are claims that the first son, who's named Edward the Martyr, his mom was just a, what was it, was just like a, was a nun, I think? Oh no. Yes, rumors he was the son of a nun, so he, rumors that he was a bastard, essentially. Um. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so wouldn't it, actually wouldn't it, if a son of a nun would that be like, like you think that'd be like a whole a holy thing? It's a son of a religious figure. It's super holy, <laughs> super holy. Um, but yeah, there were rumors that Edward the bastard, uh, but he ends up becoming king anyway because he's the eldest. Um. And there doesn't seem to be a power struggle here. It seems fine, kind of. Uh, later sources try to claim that Edward was cruel, uh, along, along with the slander about the bastard dumb thing. And uh, in order to boost Athelred, who's the uh, second son, to boost his credit. Uh, eventually, on the 8th of March 979, Edward the Martyr was visiting Ethel, and he uh, finally finally figure out why his name is Edward the Martyr. Uh, he dies. <laughs> uh, and this is why he's called the Martyr, because he dies, kind of. Uh, there's claims that he was murdered by... Uh, Athelred's thanes. Thanes are like uh, Anglo-Saxon knights. This is their names. Uh. Thanes. Um, there's claims of that. We don't know. Something that might strengthen the idea that uh, uh, Edward was murdered by Athelred's uh, supporters uh, is that he venerated his brother when he when he came to power. Um, and gave him a feast and everything. Kind of was like, oh no. Oh no, I'm sorry that I murdered you. Like, whoever killed my brother is in big trouble. I'm not honoring him. But now, but now that I'm king, you know what? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, Athelred becomes king. His mother was a consecrated queen. So he's seen as more legitimate. And later writers also say that uh, he's he was gentle and kind, unlike his brother. So now we have Athelred in the next slide. Athelred's reign is seen as a low point for Anglo-Saxon England, mostly because um, we know the outcome of his reign. He eventually loses power to a foreign uh, monarch that takes his that takes control of England. So, a lot of sources essentially are like, "Oh my God, Athelred sucks! Athelred sucks!" Um, it's quite possible that Athelred was already uh, was dealing with just normal court politics and because he was so young he 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 had to he was chafing against this political system that wasn't of his own um and these and these people at court had deep rooted interests that they didn't give up so of course there's multiple conflicts during his reign in which the king and his nobles do not agree. And it comes to dominate his later reign that this will eventually hurt England's ability to fight back against the Viking threat. Um, early on in his reign, uh, uh, Bishop Athelwold and his mother at the center of his power structure. Of, of course, he's not ruling on his own because he's too young. He, does, he doesn't he uh, does take his full power until 985. And in 985, uh, he starts utilizing this power by siding with one of the... There, there are two factions. One seems to be um, centered in the south, and the other seems to be centered in the north. That's another thing we talked about last time. The north, while it was now part of England, wasn't necessarily um, fully integrated into the system. And the north and the south seem to have their own factions. At first, he sides with the southern faction, and he begins seizing land and redistributing it to his allies in order to try to uh, shore up his position and make it so that he can start to reign more like his father, Edgar, and, and have this centralized state. However, it looks like the other faction uh, was not very happy with that. Uh, the other faction is le led by Eldorman Athelweard. Um, you mean he didn't, want to share the he didn't want to share the power? Well, they weren't really sharing the power. They were losing power, and it was being to other people. So, but the Earl, the, the Elderman of Northumbria, essentially in 993, is able to have a palace coup against the other faction, which was led by the Elderman of Hampshire, Alfrich. Hampshire is Hampshire is essentially the heart heartland of the old kingdom of wessex by the way um that's where winch uh yeah winchester is uh so in 993 the northumbrian party as i will call them uh takes power and is enforces athelred to uh take back all of the land that he took and gave it back to the people he took it from. Uh, in orders that said, sorry, I acted unjustly. It was because I got, guys, it's not, not because of me. It was because I got bad advice. And this is actually the reason why he gets his name. Because if you know anything about Athelred, his name is Ethelred the Unready. Yeah, you know, to be honest, I I did not I, I did not realize Northumbrian was still a major player at this point in the in the game. 
Yeah, it's its own El- Eldorman. It, uh, it's its own. Uh, I forgot what it. It's its own province. So oh, yeah, so it's it, not it's, like a. Not its own. Ki- it's not broken. South. It's not a kingdom, but it's not broken up like the south. Okay. Um, Ethelred is known as Ethelred the Unready. In modern English, Ethelred the Unready makes it sound like, oh shit, he was ready for what comes later in his reign. It's actually a play on his name in Old English. Ethelred means noble council. Unready comes from um, Unrad, which means ill-counseled. And it's probably because in a bunch of charters, he was saying, hey, guys, 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 it's not my fault. It's because I, w- I had bad I had bad counsel. I'm sorry, guys. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> uh, so his old counsel was bad. Yeah, my old counsel is bad. My new counsel are my buddies. Please don't hurt me. Did they, they listen? Uh, well, we'll see in the next slide. All right. Coming up. In 980, a major thing happens. For a long time, Viking raids were still happening, but they were not big enough for the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles to accord. But 980... Southampton was sacked, and this is the beginning of the relentless Viking attacks. You have one that attacks Cornwall and Devon in 981, Portland, uh, Watchet. A bunch of different coastal cities are sacked throughout this pure period. In 991, Olaf Tryggvas, who later becomes king of Norway, and Svein Forkbeard, for later, remember his name, lead a, a Viking army, and he is met by the Eldorman of Essex, whose name is Burtnoth. In a, it's a kind of famous battle. There's a there's a poem about it. It's called the Battle of Malden. Uh, the English lose in this battle, really, and um, the Eldorman of uh, Essex is killed. But the Vikings also took heavy casualties. Um, Athelred was forced to pay ten thousand pounds to uh, the Vikings, but he began building his own fleet. Here we see the beginning of some of the f- factional rivalries as he, as he's chasing down the Viking forces one of the Eldormans who is the leader of the party that had just lost a- out uh, who is about to lose out and it's possible that his power because of this uh, Alfrich Eldorman of Hampshire Allows the Vikings to escape. That never, that never, letting your enemy escape ne- never turns out bad at all. Yeah, and uh, from here it begins. Uh, you have in 994 Olaf Tryggvason and Svein Forkbeard return and ravage most of Essex, all the way to Hampshire. So this is the east eastern coast all the way to the middle of the country and Athelred is forced to pay uh, 16,000 pounds and pro- provide all of the provisions for the Viking army but in return Olaf Tossen is baptized so at least I got a soul for for good in the, uh, in the exchange even though I had to pay a lot of money, <laughs> and a bunch of shit got um, blown up. Actually, so um, um, this means a bunch of different payments. 
We've got 24,000 pounds to a Viking force in 1002, 36,000 pounds in 1007, 21,000 in 1014, and then in 1018, 72,000 and a further 10,500. So England's clearly a rich country that can shell out all of this money to Viking forces, which is why they're coming, and why eventually uh, we'll see a certain dude decide, hey, I want to become king of England. Actually, a couple somebody, but yeah. Now, you might be thinking, what else are they getting out of this? They're, they're just paying them to go away? No, they're actually using some of the Vikings that they pay off from destroying their land to help them defend against the next Vikings that come along. Uh, and this will be used to great effect. That was sarcasm later on. <laughs> um, this also was popular, though you might think, oh, you're paying all this money. No, people were that called? People, I think it was, people were fine with it. Was that called the Dane Guild? Uh, no. Yes, people call it that, but it's more. Bring me back. Sorry. Uh, it's more um apt to call it Hera Yield. Uh, which means army gold, uh. then Dane Yield, which would be Dane gold. But yeah, people have called it that. Um, it. Oh, shit. I wish I would have put down the date. Essentially, to ensure that the Vikings stopped having safe ports to um, attack England, not only did. Uh, Athelred shore up occasions, and we see that he transferred mints to uh, where they made money to more defensible locations, and he made a very important marriage alliance that was very important for later on in in uh, English history. England's history has always been tied to Normandy, as it is a place where you can easily. Stage attack uh, against uh, England. So he married a, married a little, little, little someone called Emma. Yes, he marries Emma of Normandy in order to secure secure an alliance with the Duke of Normandy and, and ensure that Vikings were no longer allowed to be in Norman ports, so that they can't have an easy place to attack. Um. Uh. uh they didn't have a place that they could easily attack England from because Normandy is just across the channel and it's pretty easy to get to England from there. So it's nice to have a, an ally that won't Vikings rest up there. Maybe it will keep the Vikings away. And then one of the more uh, controversial does is on the 13th of November 1002 ordered the slaying of all Danish men in England fearing that he was going to be overthrown by, by um, English uh, by some Danish people the St. Bryce's Day Massacre uh, Hello you you guys. Some... He Hello he Hello Hello is your mic not working? Oh, my my mic is working. I'm wondering about RJ. That's what I was talking to. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Okay, I guess I'll continue. Uh, a lot of the problems that uh, were being faced by the English when they were fighting the Vikings during this time was ineffective um, ineffectiveness of the nobility in action, sometimes by the nobility, and treachery by the English nobility, trying to gain more power in this power 
politics between Seth in uh in you know politics uh in in the next slide we'll start talking about the end of Athelred the ruin of him before we do uh do the name Forkbeard mean anything yes Fain Forkbeard he's been uh he was with Olaf Tryggvason at the Battle of Malden and he's been raiding the English for a while. Uh, He'll I, show up later. I mean, does this, this, is this name, do you have a fork in his beard or is his beard like a fork or what? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Probably, yeah. Uh, my beard kind of does that too. I guess I can be B fork beard. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know that. They had, it, yeah. They had very descriptive names. Uh, uh, like Olaf I Tryggvason's son is named Harald Bluetooth, which, yes, where we get the word Bluetooth from for like connecting things, but probably because he had some rotted teeth. Nasty. Yeah. Names back then and names now we told totally different things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So and 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 when is Saint Bryce Day? I don't think we celebrate that that day anymore. I remember thirteenth of November, because that's when when they did all the when all the Danish people. Okay, how come we don't celebrate that anymore? I have no idea. Who knows? I don't even know who Saint Bryce is. <laughs> this apparently it's the saint of killing Danish people. I guess. Uh, sure. Yeah. All right. So next slide. In oh, oh, taken. There we go. Uh. So in ten oh nine, I say in that makes it sound small. No, this was massive. Uh. I think it was something like 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 there was a bunch of ships. Okay. I'm sorry. There was a bunch of ships in 1009 uh, with Thorkill, uh, and he landed in England. England had just gone through uh, some pro problems. Uh, the southern faction was now back in the ascendancy because in 1006, uh, Eldorman Alfhelm of Northumbria uh, was killed and his sons were blinded by another person that is very important for later because he is Irish dickbag. Oh, sorry. Erdrich Streona. He, he was uh, Eldorman of uh, Mercia. So you've got some problems that will show up later because now you've got a divided kingdom. Uh, Thorkel's invasion however was expected because there was massive militarization occurring in England however Edrich Streona uh, helped cause some fracturing amongst this ma massive force that made it that made this military able to uh, fight off the Vikings in the coming year. 20 ships uh, uh, were lost when Edrich Streona and his family accused a, a guy whose family becomes important for later. Shield. He is the father of Godwin, who is the father of Harold Godwinson. Um, they accuse him of unspecified offenses and he gets mad and he takes 20 ships and he decides you know what I'm going to raid myself I'm going to raid Sussex uh, so Thorkill Thorkill arrives soon after in 1010 he reaches the heart of Wessex and ravages there and then he besieges Canterbury Canterbury is a very big um, place for English 
religion, where the Archbishop of Canterbury is. And even back then, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury was seen as the most important uh, churchman of his day. In the siege, the Archbishop and prisoner, and mm -hmm. Thorkel, Thorkel's men, Thorkel tried his hardest to stop this. But his men kill the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, can I, uh, once? What happened? I think we have some technical difficulties, folks. Sorry, my family was being loud and I could okay. uh, and I was getting distracted. Uh he tried to stop this, but the Archbishop of Canterbury was killed. This is a big no no. This is bad. This is seen as a bad thing. Uh bad omen, essentially. Um killing the but, highest highest religious figure in the country. Yeah. Um Thorkel is eventually bought off and actually comes to serve Athelred. However, as, as his uh, Vikings that didn't want to stay in England um, leave, they're recruited by uh, the dude on screen, Svein Forkbeard. And Svein Forkbeard is like, you know what? I'm going to come. And try to raid England, but then he decides, you know what? Let's become king of England. He's already the I'd king like of it here. Denmark. By the way. You know, yeah, he's already king of Denmark. You know, instead of, like, instead of bringing my tr the treasure back to where I am, why don't just stay here and keep the treasure, treasure right here? Be in charge of it. Yeah. Um, and here is where the 1006 uh, coup, palace coup, uh, by Edrich Seona bites Athelred in the back, uh, in the butt. Um, Svein Forkbeard um, lands in the north and immediately accepts the surrender of various Eldormen in the area and the Northumbrians. And he quickly moves south. Um, uh, the North will, for a while now, become the strong of the Danish forces as they try to take control of England because they're mad about um, the 1006 Palace by Eidrich Strelna. Um, Canute marries his son to the daughter of the of Althelm, the previous the murdered Eldorman of Northumbria, Alf Yifu of Northampton. She's important for later as well. Um uh Spain and he, immediate and immediate said, well, sorry. Go ahead. I said and he and he also did he marry his son, or did son marry himself to the king's ex? Now the king's now widow. That's much later. Okay. Uh, right now, he he gains the support of the northern provinces through the marriage with Alfievu of Northampton. Um, he then quickly moves south and receives the surrender of the western provinces, and Athelred is forced to flee to Normandy. But this is a very short, um, short victory for Spain because he dies almost immediately after, on the third of February, ten fourteen. The Danish army that had come with him elect his son Canute as king. The Anglo-Saxon nobility actually like decides to bring back Athelred. Uh, like Athelred essentially was like, you know what? I'm gonna give you all the reforms you want. Let, let's just, come on, please, please let me come back. Please, 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 please. Be like, be like, huh? 
a foreign conqueror or this guy. It's, that's a, yeah. <laughs> either way. Yeah. So uh, Athelred comes back and promises reform. However, he immediately goes back into some tyrannical stuff. In 1015, he uh, began punishing the noblemen of the north who had supported Svein Forkbeard. Uh, he kills two thanes called Siefirth and Morkar and seize their lands. Athelred's first son, Edmund Ironside, uh, decided that it was his chance. Athelred was getting more and more sick, more close to death. He's now doing this. And uh, Edmund Ironside, one of the elder sons of Athelred, also is in a similar situation to his uncle. He's the son of a non-consecrated woman. Uh, the sons of, of Normandy are going to have stronger claims to the throne. So if he sees it as his... He heads but, north and... But, but it's like, hmm? the, let's, I have a weaker claim, but I'm in the right place at the right time. And I, have, and I got the army with me. Yeah. Yeah, he moves north. And uh, of course, the north was made out a lot of things, and it keeps getting worse for the north. So he moves north, he marries the widow of one of the thanes that was killed, and immediately receives the submission of the north. Uh, uh, the son that was gaining uh, prominence, including uh, uh, helping negotiating the settlement in 1014 to, for Athens. Athelred to come back to the throne was Emma's first son, Edward the Confessor. So this kind of uh, this kind of Edmund Ironside sees his power uh, weakening, and he thinks that he needs to seize whatever whatever um, power he can get. Yeah, but Canute has also decided he's going to come back. And Edmund and Edric Sreona, along with Thorkel, who's from earlier, raise armies to face Canute. Um, on the 23rd of April, 1016, Athelred the Unready dies. And now we've got a success struggle between Canute and Edmund. Edric Sreona switches sides. The bastard. <laughs> so, so, why was he called Ironsides? Um, I do not remember. Let's see. Uh, why isn't? Oh my god, that's stupid. Uh, Edward Ironside. I could be wrong, but I doubt he had a. I doubt he had an iron implant in, in, inside of him. Uh, no, he did not. Why? Please have something close, close, please, please. Uh, it was given to him because of his valor in resisting the Danish and led by Canute. Yeah, he resisted, but. Nothing happened because <laughs> and we had a, a a year of power. He was, yeah, he was betrayed by uh, Edric Streona, who is a bastard and should die. He does die eventually. Uh, <laughs> um, he actually is able to uh, divide the kingdom with Canute. Canute rules the north and he rules the south, but he dies of unknown causes on the thirtieth of November. So now Canute. Controls the whole of the kingdom, and then, and then he, before he dies, or I guess after he, but after he dies, or before he dies, or some more time, thing, he, his kids get the his kids go get to marry into the family of Scotland. Uh, yeah. Uh, his kids. I'm pretty sure his kids fled to Hungary. 
it's it's over here. It's over here. Edmund Ironside's sons were exiled and ended up in Hungary. Yeah, they go to Hungary and then they eventually go to Scotland and then yeah, it's a big whole thing. Yeah, Hungary. <laughs> that's like that's like, that's way over there at this point. Yeah. Um. So the next slide. We're gonna talk about a bit about the society of this time. Right. So a very important figure for this coming time is Archbishop Wolfstan of York. He he writes a lot of things about the feeling of the of the religious laity of the time and stuff like that. Uh, and he becomes very important for King Canute's reign. He writes a lot. About Fearing the year 1000, uh, he saw it as a as a sign of the coming Antichrist. So uh, he thought it was going to be the end of the world in the year 1000, and it's not helping that we've got a bunch of Vikings swarming the kingdom and, and losing, and he wasn't really a fan of some of the social things happening. Um, he He saw the Vikings... Being able to uh, take much stuff as they have because of a fundamental problem within English society. He said the king was supposed to follow the, the precepts of God. Uh, he was a big fan of Edgar. Athelred's father, Ath uh, Edgar, of course, was a big uh, supporter of the Benedictine reforms. And what are those? Uh, we talked about them last time, uh, bringing back monasteries, forcing monasteries to have a strict code, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, essentially, the, the church really loved those. Um, Wolfstein saw Athelred as not doing enough about that. Um he saw the Vikings also as a consequence of the sins of the English people, the moral cowardice and their debauchery. And he uses Gildas uh, from way back in the beginning of our series, who uh, essentially was saying, uh, the Britons, we're losing all of this territory because we're not godly enough. The Anglo-Saxons are taking us over and we deserve it because we're not godly enough. He's saying, if we don't get godly enough, if we don't get godly enough, uh, we're the Anglo-Saxons, the English, are going to go the way of the Britons. And the Vikings will be the new Anglo-Saxons. And while we have a bunch of prob problems going on, uh, we also have some actual, like... Um, cultural achievements many of the wall paintings and sculptural programs are from this time of of um Athelred's reign and Canute's reign um old English poetry the majority of this time on the screen is Beowulf written during this time um and also a bunch of different works that were used to explain the crisis of the time Expanding the literary, uh, the literature of the of the English, and kind of solidifying the English language as uh, something that is literary instead of just Latin. Okay, so next we'll talk about the reign of Canute. So. So what was the what was in the, how was the world ending right, right now? What was the big apocalypse? They thought they thought that because it was the millennia, you know, it's the year one thousand oh. after death, that that Other... was like a big that that meant that it was over, you know. Oh. That their computers Jesus couldn't handle it. Back. Their computer the computers couldn't handle it like like ours couldn't back in two thousand. Yeah, essentially, it, it, it's just like the scare in 2000. Would that be Y1K then? Yeah. 
Uh, Y one K. They're they're epic. They're what's the what's that word? Abacus. Uh, yeah, it just couldn't get. It just couldn't go. What? The year one thousand and one. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, but um, Canute's reign is a little bit weird because uh, we don't have a lot of written sources. He didn't even uh write a lot of like royal decrees and stuff like that. Um, he did wish to rule England as an English monarch, and he essentially had the government in the control of Wolfstan, who we were just talking about. Uh, Wolfstan essentially puts all of the stuff from this idea that the Viking we, we gotta get we gotta make England great again. We gotta get them back to godliness. Okay. Speaking of great, is that how he got, is that how he got the name Canute the Great? He gets it because of the the map on the screen. He controlled all three of those kingdoms. So he's the great, the North Sea Empire. Um, early on in his reign, uh, he portrays himself as a restorer of order and justice. Essentially, saying, "I'm bringing it back to Edgar. I'm bringing this." He's essentially, uh, you know, make America great again, but for England. <laughs> and he's a foreigner. But uh, uh, he divides the kingdom uh, among some of his supporters, Edris, Treona, and Thoril. However, early on, he purges a lot of the old nobility of England. This is the death of the old nobility of England. The old families of Mercia, Wessex, all of these areas... They're done for. They're purged. They're killed. E. And Edrich Treona gets what he deserved. <laughs> uh, he Early on in his reign, he brings in a lot of uh, uh, Scandinavians to rule, uh, to become nobility. But he'll eventually uh, get rid of that in the 1030s as he he brings in Englishmen to take over power. It will be a new generation, a new nobility. Uh, some big names. Earl Godwin, father of Harold Godwinson, and uh, Leofrich. Uh, these people gain power. And the word Eldorman was being replaced by Earl. So that's why today they're called Earls instead of the Alderman. Um, so they went from an English, old English word to a more like a Danish Viking word? Uh, it's just Eldorman, but influenced by the Old Norse word Jarl. So it just shortens it up and makes it Earl in Old English. Now it's Earl. Um, Canute wasn't in England all that much. Uh, he campaigned in Denmark a lot uh, in 1019 to 1020 and in 1023. Uh, in the 1020s, he was always in Scandinavia trying to solidify his new empire. Um. And in 1027, he went to Rome. Uh, so he wasn't really in England much, but uh, he solidified his position by being a generous benefactor to the church, being lavish even for a ruler, like just given vast quantities of wealth. Uh, and then he also marries... Emma of Normandy in 1017, a year after he conquers England. Oh, that's, uh, he that's, makes... funny. <laughs> that's funny for a second. The, hey, hey, you know that deal you had with the old king to keep our keep away from your ports? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know that now. Like, he might have me away from these ports. <laughs> yeah. Um, he made an agreement with Emma. Uh, that only one of her sons would rule after him. This is important. 
for later. Because um let's say Canute has two different has two sons from two different parents. Um just like the last king. Yeah, <laughs> that happens a lot. Uh he was also a big promoter of uh, the cult of Edward just like uh, uh Athelred was uh possibly trying to uh you know be like hey Athelred killed this guy come on please but of course because we don't have many sources this is all we can really say about it we, we've got new nobility uh new power brokers and in uh on the 12th of November 1035 Kenneth dies um, you remember that, uh, you remember that agreement that he made with Emma? Uh, it's immediately, yeah. uh, it's immediately, uh, kicked in the rear Long by, wood. yeah. Uh, so he had two sons. Harold Harefoot, uh, was the son of his first wife. Harald the Canute was the son of Emma. The second first the wife, canute. that would that be the wife that he his father may have married from the north of England or something like that? Yeah. Um so Harald the Canute was supposed to take over England, but Harold, uh along with his supporter uh, Leofrich, essentially um takes over. North and Harald the Canute uh was ruling in the south. However, he was in Denmark because he's trying to become king of Denmark as well. And Harold takes takes the throne and forces uh, Emma to flee to Normandy. Um, so again, it was the right place, right time thing. I'm here in this yeah. area, so might as well be, might as well take over. Yeah, Harald the Canute was actually supported by Godwin. Um, oh, Godwin. We're, we're going to hear that name next chapter, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, his son. Well, I mean, he's pretty important for Edward the Confessor's reign, too. Uh, but eventually in 1040, uh, Harald the Canute comes back to England and uh, uh, because Harefoot dies. Um, and he immediately digs up his brother's body and then desecrates it by throwing it into a bog. <laughs> and so, revenge. So I guess unlike... Uh... Ethelred, he didn't make his brother a martyr. No, he, he he wasn't happy with his brother. He was also an adult. Um, so all of this turmoil is important because the old order is gone and the new order is here to sh is here to stay. So next slide. We actually see a massive amount of social mobility during this time, which kind of is, is weird because, you know, you're paying all this money to the Vikings. It just kind of shows how rich uh, the Kingdom of England really was. Um, a bunch of, they're called Charles, which actually um, Charles, named Charles, comes from uh, Charles in France, which ultimately comes from Carl, which means free men. Charles are free men um, in England. They eventually gain statuses of thanes because they're much land. And you start getting all this ostentatious like shows of wealth. All this clothing and they're eating nice food like porpoise. Who thought... Uh, Porpoise. Whales, porpoises. Why? Why are you eating those? Stop it. Uh, deer and fowl were also uh, big uh, foods that they used to show their wealth because, of course, they were the only ones that had time to hunt. Everybody else is farming. Oh, God. Oh. The uh, wool stand. Yeah, gotta have that wheat and more wheat. Yeah. Wool stand. Um, being a staunch conservative is like, stop it! No! He tries to reinstate the old social order by making rules 
to try to make it harder for these Chorals to become Thanes. Uh, it doesn't really work, but yeah. he tries. Yeah, you, you remember the good old days in the 950, in the, in the, in the, in the 10, 1020s when, these, the, when this was happening? Let's go back to the 1020 days. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, so, you know how in Germany, Reich means uh, empire? Yeah. Um, this word, Riche, had a very similar meaning, power and powerful uh, in England. Uh, a lot of the kingdoms in England were called uh, Riches. Um, West Saxna Riche. The kingdom of Wests uh, of the West Saxons, for example, Richa is the ancestor to the word rich, and uh -huh. it's during this it's during this time that we start seeing it shift from just meaning powerful to also being wealthy. And then later it became the name for a little white grain, a little white grain. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, that's why our word for what uh, wealth and stuff is, is the same as like when a German person talk about like the Reich, uh, which I guess isn't very nice, but you know. Um, and you actually see a bunch of uh, estates being broken up uh, on the map. Shapwick uh, used to be this pretty big um, manor. And it was eventually, and there were multiple towns within it, and it eventually got broken up into six different estates. And all of the towns that were on this um, big property got put together as, like, becomes the town of Shapwick today. Um, and, and this happens across England during this time. And that is it. <laughs> that. This, so you said this place of wealth became more important. Like before, they were important before, but now they're like super important. Originally, you showed your wealth through building stuff. When I say displays of wealth become more important, I'm talking about like the clothing you you wear. Uh, okay. Earlier on, it was like don't do. How is conflict solved then? I don't know what you mean. Are you talking about the current? It it does the current conflict doesn't get solved for a while. That happens in the next chapter. Because a new conflict shows up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And the next chapter is actually the last one. So yeah. So essentially, uh, during this time, the old, the old nobility of England is gone. The new nobility is is here to stay. Oh. Well for now at least yes for now at least <laughs> also don't have a king full of warring factions it will come to bite you in the ass and other dude will have your throne <laughs> what was that saying a king a nation divided cannot stand or a kingdom divided, i guess at this point a kingdom divided cannot stand yeah honestly this this conflict between the north and south isn't is still in effect to this day. Northerners are, are seen the same way we in the United States see Southerners, like backwards, funny accents, stuff like that. They're, like, in order to advance in society as a northern Northerner in England, you have to learn how to talk like us, and you've got to move to the South. Yeah, and, and but, it, but you know they may be the, the dumb northern Englanders, but they're at least they're not at least they're not Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. But yeah, that that's England's hick town, the north. But uh, so technically, this conflict isn't solved. 
Uh, the North always gets less funding than the South, stuff like that. There's even a dude today saying that the North should secede from England. Bring back Northumbria. Essentially, yeah. He he, he wants to call the new country Northumbria. So. <laughs> all, all power to him. Bring it back! It, it, is that the only question? I guess so. Any any other question? Do you I, have any questions, Wendalia? I guess, I guess. Can you give us a, a sneak peek of, of next month's epic fi grand finale? Uh, it's the end of Anglo-Saxon England and the beginning. Of the mo the the more kingdom of England. They even they even don't recognize. Like, of course, guys, the Anglo-Saxon kings of England, but they don't recognize them in the numbering. Uh, start the numbering after William the Conqueror. There's even a couple Edwards, but uh, Edward the First isn't Edward... What? It would be Edward the Fourth? Yeah. Uh, if if we counted the Anglo-Saxon kings, but no, his his name is Edward the First. Yeah. So a it's fun... A Mental massive change. Yeah, the confessor that count. He's a, he's a confessor, but not Edward the first or negative first. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the beginning of Norman England, and then eventually, Tagenets, which we have talked about during our War of the Roses episode of a year last year. Yeah, the the end of the Plantagenets actually on that one. Beginning of the Tudors. And then the Stuarts, then the Hanovers, and then the the Sax Saxakurg und Gotha. Gotha. Uh, who eventually changed their name to Windsor because it their name sounded too German. Yeah. But uh, but that'll have to wait till the end of March. Yep. And if you want to help help out here, click on this click on this code here, and like do a little sh little shopping to help us with a little upgrade, so we don't get kicked so he don't get kicked off the stream all, all, all the time like 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 this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't and know if that's my internet or yours, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Internet upgrades, you know, computer upgrades. It only helps keep the stream going good. Yeah. If only I had good internet. <laughs> yeah. But, all right. You have, this, you have anything else to say? I, I did forget to say the Normans later on would comment on how much the English ate. Because the English saw food also as a way of showing their way. So they were like, Jesus Christ. It's like it's like Europeans when they come to America and see fast food portion, proportions, and they're like, Jesus Christ, how do you eat all this? <laughs> the Normans did a very similar thing to the English. <laughs> well, they were... the. We'll get to that next... But Yeah, we'll get to the more details of that next time. Yeah. I... I... For but for now, oh, oh, next week, join 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 me next week as as me and my friends we talking about the trilogy of the Christian Bell Batman two thousands. In my opinion, one of the last good DC movies that there there has been before the current run. Rip Heath Ledger. But until then. Never stop learning. Enjoy the randomness. I'll see you next time. Bye. If you just do it, it'll turn out okay. However, it didn't turn out okay, really, for who we're talking about today. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, well, it depends on... Uh where you're looking but yeah uh it doesn't end well for the house of wessex at least well 
at least for their power, well, at least for their power, their bloodline turned out okay. Eh, some of it, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, at least. But yep, today we are finally ending our little mini series of the Anglo Saxons. Yep, all good things have to come to an end at some point, and uh, Anglo Saxon England, depending on your definition of that, ends today. But so, before that, so, so as, oh, as we, before that, we go, we go to your uh, current events thing. So, you've been reading this book overall. What was with this? What was your opinion of this book in this in this series? Uh it was. It's a really good book. Um, I mean, these two, the two authors are like some of the best in the field of Anglo-Saxon history. It's a bit dry because it's a historical work. Um, for non-historically trained people, it might get confusing because part part of writing in history is about making argumentation. So sometimes you're like, you might think that, oh, I figured this out. And then it's like, no, that's just one argument. Now I'm going to bring forth this other argument and you're just confused again. But um, it's a good book for some. Awesome. Recommend 10 out of 10. Thumbs up. Uh. Seven out of ten, just because uh, its accessibility is a little iffy. Ah, uh, so th sometimes the the ones you want to read always are. It, it more just like you know, it's it, it might be hard for some people to follow, kind of thing. But, but uh, I originally wasn't. I originally wasn't going to do this, uh, do one of these today, but uh, while I was at work today, I got a notification that uh, as Azerbaijan troops were uh, <laughs> were conducting offensive operations, so I thought I might as well talk about it because <laughs> this is a interesting, shitty situation. So... This map shows the different ethnicities within Azerbaijan. Uh, as you can see, there is a massive uh, cluster of Armenians living in the southwest, but they're not in Armenia. This ultimately, and this area is called uh, Karabakh. The deepest red is called Nagorno-Karabakh because it's more mountainous. It, yeah, stuff like that. Uh, so essentially, during the Soviet Union, uh, a council was convened to figure out who would own what in the area. And originally, the Soviet council was going to give Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia because it's majority Armenian. But Stalin decided to say, no, I'm giving it to Azerbaijan. And this was probably done to destabilize the area, make it so that uh, independence movements couldn't spring up. Uh this leads to the problems of today. And as soon as the Soviet Union's breaking up, in the next slide you'll see there is a war over this area. Uh, essentially, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, declare independence. Uh, the war had been brewing, brewing for three years at this point, but at, in 1991, the Soviet Union... Uh, of course, collapses. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I told them to be quiet, but they're not being quiet. <laughs> um, the, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh declare independence as the Republic of Artsakh. Uh, and essentially, a war breaks out called the First Nagorno-Karabakh War. The Armenians are involved in it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ethnic cleansing on both sides, which is not good, of course. The Armenians win this, though, and the orange area eventually becomes 
controlled essentially by the Armenians. And in 1994, the war ends. Russia brokers the peace. Russia and Armenia are allied. Azerbaijan and Turkey are allied. Um, and originally, Georgia was, uh, you know, facilitating Russia getting uh, weapons and aid to Armenia. However, in 2008, uh, Russia decides to invade Georgia. And this will become important in 2020 because Georgia refuses to let uh, Russians, the Russians send military aid through their territory, essentially ensuring that Armenia is isolated and by itself. Uh, so in 2020, if you go to the next slide, Okay. While everybody is talking about uh, the pandemic and the election and everything, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia go to war in the second Nagorno-Karabakh war. And this is an absolute disaster for Armenia. Uh, it loses most of the territory it controlled. Uh, Artsakh and Armenia are nearly cut off from each other, except for this small little area called the Lat... Lacking corridor. I don't know how to say it. Um, but the Russian and Georgia, of course, pissed off about 2008, doesn't let the Russians send support to Armenia. Uh, there's ethnic cleansing, but this time because the Armenians aren't winning, uh, it's mostly against Armenian uh, civilians in Nagorno Karabakh, uh, which isn't good. <laughs> ethnic, ethnic cleansing usually, usually isn't. Yeah, it usually isn't. Um, the Russians end up uh, creating a ceasefire in which they uh, become peacekeepers in the Lachan Corridor, ensuring that Armenia can uh, help get food and stuff and, and uh, essential goods into Nagorno-Karabakh. Of course, uh, in 2022, Russia decides to do a thing in Ukraine that causes a lot of troops to not be in the area. And Azerbaijan starts um, essentially flouting the ceasefire uh, early at, in September. There was... Um, artillery shelling and some uh, fighting occurring between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And for the last two months, it might be longer than that. I can't quite remember. Uh, Azerbaijan has essentially blockaded Nagorno-Karabakh, ensuring that they don't get food, they don't get medicine, they don't get anything. Uh, the uh, uh, they've even blocked off the road in the Lacken corridor. From what I could tell, the Armenians were using some uh, dirt roads to get food into uh, Nagorno Karabakh, and this was being facilitated by the Russians. However, Azerbaijan is saying that instead of food or other medical equipment and stuff, the Armenians were smuggling weapons into Nagorno-Karabakh and have now used this as a justification to assault uh, positions in the area and now block off this road. They're essentially trying to ensure that Nagorno-Karabakh surrenders. And that's not a good thing because... Uh, these two countries don't have a good history when it comes to whenever they take control of territory uh, with the other uh, ethnicity living inside it. So, yeah, this isn't good. Uh, I heard something about the Russians put uh, peacekeepers pushing that as their Azerbaijan forces back. I, I don't know about that. Um, so yeah, this is a developing situation and it's a bad one. And most people don't talk about it because I didn't hear it. Nobody talked about the second Nagorno-Karabakh war at all. So, I didn't know yeah. about it until today. Yeah. Uh, 
this area is really, it really bad. Uh, I, they were talk. Uh, the president of Armenia was talking like they were about, or was it prime minister? What one of the uh the leader of Armenia was essentially saying that they were about to sign a peace treaty with Azerbaijan, and then today they're, they're fighting each other, and it's like, oh my gosh, I don't know. Uh, and it, yeah, not good, not good. But all right. So how do we yeah. how do we connect that? To, to, to the to, to the what the, the 10th century 11th century uh we don't uh, <laughs> uh because uh surprisingly none of these actors are as bad as the, the Azerbaijan government or the Armenian government yay <laughs> uh <laughs> so so going from the war between the the, uh, the Armenians and the other eight name to the war between the Vikings and the Saxons. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I want so in this we're going to talk a little bit about a guy who always gets overlooked in every history about Anglo-Saxon England. Nobody ever talks about this dude, except in the context of did he give the crown to Harold Godwinson or did he give the crown to William uh, of Normandy? Oh, the, oh, Nobody talks. I, I think with the guy before him, the I think with the guy before him, we know who Edward the Confessor is, but. Yeah, but nobody talks about him. Nobody talks about his reign. His reign is actually pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, and a, a really big prelude to what occurs later on with uh, William, but nobody before, talked about him. Before we get to him, do we talk about his half brother? Uh, yeah, his half brother uh, essentially lets him come back to England. Uh, he'd been in Norman uh, N Normandy for twenty four years, so Edward was. Had a lot of friends in Normandy and stuff. Oh, like that. Before, before we go on, I must, I must, I must clarify. His half brother on his mother's side is currently king. Yeah. Not his half brother on his father's side, who was king. All, yeah, all yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Yeah, part of the Canute was his name. Uh, his reign isn't really that important. In, uh, as you can see in this map down here, you have two families entrenching themselves into politics. The fa the family of Leofrich of Mercia and the family of uh, Godwin uh, of Wessex. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I think I don't have a, I don't know if we talked about last time or it happens yet, but I think it was. I think it was. Either, it was. I think it was. The, but probably during his father's reign, that Edward the Confessor's half brother got his eye not, not full full brother got his eyes poked out by Godwinson's daddy. Right? Is that the rumor? I don't. Case? Yeah, I don't remember that happening. But uh... <laughs> really, I heard I, there's a thing. I, I don't know if it's just a rumor or not, or a, a, a folk tale where where. It, I forget, I forget whose reign it was in. Edward the Confessor and his full brother, you know, in, went, went up there, and and Harold, Harold Godwinson's dad, the current Earl of Wessex, uh, poked like his his eyes out so he couldn't be king. Uh, maybe I don't know. I really? yeah, I, I don't know what. Uh, what do I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. <coughs> maybe, maybe like maybe just a rumor, then not true. Then, yeah. Uh, how did the Canute never had any heirs? So, uh, essentially, uh, he brought Edward the Confessor back to England to become his heir. 
uh, the the year before he dies. Um, and Edward's returning to this kingdom, bringing his Norman friends with him. And uh, he didn't speak. He spoke a lot of French with his uh, Norman buddies. Uh, and uh, so he's not very English. Um, and the kingdom is divided between these two great families. And they will become very important in Edward's reign. Um, they have, they each have competing interests. Uh, Leia Fritch's family is more, uh, allied with the Welsh. Uh, Godwin is more, uh, allied with Denmark and, uh, married in, he, he actually married into the Danish Royal family. But, uh, and that comes up later, but Harther Canute dies in 1042 and we have a restoration of the House of Wessex. So, next slide. Right. Yeah, I guess the only thing that but that's important that the for Hearth that can do it for the future is his mother's family was Norman. Yeah. So was Edwards, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so Edward becomes king after Hartha Canute dies, bringing back the House of Wessex. Uh, he essentially has to accommodate this new aristocracy. Uh, and he does so by allying himself mostly with Godwin. He marries Godwin's daughter, Edith, in 1045. Uh, he gives a lot... He, he gave a lot of earldoms to... Godwin and his sons. Um, he ultimately gained some uh, popularity by disbanding the fleet, but he also brought in a lot of these Normans to important positions, especially on the border regions with Wales, becoming marcher lords. Uh, and this will ultimately come to bite Edward in the ass. Uh, and this is why I kind of say that he's a prelude to the uh, Norman conquest because he brings in all these Normans with him because he yeah. spent so much time. And there's all, uh, I don't know, and he didn't I know it's true or not but I don't think that he, that he didn't he married that his that daughter-in-law or something for the for convenience sake not not because he actually loved her. Yeah uh, he later tries to Force her into becoming a nun, but uh, that's later. Uh, early on, he's dealing with a lot of problems with Godwin. Godwin has a son named Svein Godwinson who's doing a bunch of crazy shit. He abducts the abbess of Leominster, and later on, uh, he does even more crazy. He murders someone. I can't. And is that Can the is, is that the one that later did something in, in 1066 too? No, that's Toasty. The other, but, uh, the other brother. He, yeah, he has a lot of sons. <laughs> he was... Yeah. Uh, damn, I should have should have put that in. Is there, so Spain does that, and then uh, Godwin, who is allied to the Danish throne early on, wants to help the king of Denmark, Svein Estrithson, uh, against who's going to become important. Right. Hello? I think his mic died. Or my headphones died. Hello? Uh, you can hear, I can hear you again. Um, so, uh, so, uh, sorry, someone was trying to call me. I think that's what happened. Um, okay. Edward. <laughs> um, so 
Spain. So Harald Hardrada w- was a um, Varangian guard, and he gained a lot of fame in the service of the Byzantine Empire. And he eventually becomes king of Norway, and now he moves to conquer Denmark. Um, so he he invades Denmark, and Godwin wants Edward to support the king of Denmark. But Edward doesn't want to do it. So Harald Hardrada eventually conquers Denmark. Godwin loses a big ally in this. And this this will hurt his relationship with Edward. Godwin now starts looking for allies in Flanders. Um, But the continual appointment of... Norman, Normans, especially the clerical positions, will eventually lead to a falling out between the two in 1051, which is the next slide. All right, one second. All right. So, Edward appoints a Norman as the Archbishop of Canterbury, essentially the biggest church person in the land. Godwin doesn't like this, and eventually uh, there's a backlash. Godwin wants all the Normans out, but Godwin is forced to flee with his uh, Harold Godwinson, who's very important, uh, flees to Ireland, and uh, Godwin flees to Flanders. This is when uh, Edward's like, I don't like this Edith bitch. I'm going to uh, put her in a nunnery. <laughs> I'm going to make her a nun. And this is really when Edward's... This is the only time where Edward actually gets to reign like he wants to. And he accelerates the Norman appointments. This now alienates Leia Fritch's family and the others. Because... They don't like losing power, of course. People like Nobody. People, people like losing power. That's a, is that is that a new thing or an old thing? No, people, people don't like that anymore. Uh, uh, this tapestry right here. Um, I think it's a tapestry. I don't know. Depicts um Godwin and Harold's return to England in 1052. Um, and they essentially. They force Edward into peace. The Nor- most of the Normans were forced out of power. And Godwin and his family now came to control 80% of England. This is when Northumbria comes under the control of one of Godwin's sons named Tosti. You might know him as to- Tostig, but that's not how you pronounce his name. It's Tosti. Uh, because Old English is funky that way. <laughs> um, yeah, this and, is English, uh, yeah, this is Eng- English before the a little we got a little French uh, influence. Well, surprisingly enough, French doesn't actually influence English very much phonologically. Um, maybe more with spelling and stuff. Yeah. Some words. And also, I think I think links I found in the private chat. If you want to check them out, either now or in the future, about Edward the Confessor's brother that got blinded by Godwinson. Oh, Alfred Atheling. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that because the God Godwin was a power hungry guy. Um. So that's pro- and like I said that's probably why he hated them. Like, oh, you, you, I, the, I, you bonded my brother, and I, I, I listened to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm friends with you for sure. <laughs> yeah, they were more allies out of political convenience, but Edward still kind of chafed under that. You know, he didn't really enjoy. He he wanted more of his Norman buddies, and that eventually led to this big spat. But 
Godwin doesn't survive much longer. He dies in 1053. And in the next slide, we're going to get the rise of his eldest son, Harold Godwinson. So because Edith and Edward don't like each other, they were really bad at doing the kingly duty of uh, having a son. So there's no real heir. Uh, Edward invites one of, I think, his nephew, right? Yeah, his nephew, Edward the Exile, who had been exiled to Hungary. The uh, Iron, I think Edmund Ironside's kid from his yeah. dad's side. Yeah, in 1057, uh, he invites them back, but Edward the Exile dies essentially as soon as he returns to England, yeah. which isn't good. Uh, he does have a son named Edgar Atheling, but most people don't really care about him. Atheling, by the way, Atheling, by the way, means uh, crown prince. I was going to say, but people do care about his daughter, who might have married into the Scottish family. Yes, um, yes, but um, Edgar Atheling, I think that was actually his sister, but um, yeah, um, Edgar Atheling, uh, essentially, nobody cares about him, and Harold Godwinson now, uh, so. Harold, Leofwin, and Gurth on the map. These are three of uh, Godwin's kids. The other one isn't on the map because this shows after he fell from power. Um, uh, you've got Tosti, who controlled Northumbria, but the Northumbrian thanes uh, didn't like him. They saw him kind of tyrannic as, as a tyrant. So it, uh, that happens. But Harold decides to ally himself with the grandsons of Leofric, Edwin and Morkar. You can see them on the uh, map as well. He allies with them to, to essentially shore up his chances to become king. And then in 1064, Harold travels to Normandy. During that whole debacle between Godwin and, uh, and Edward, if Edward ever promised the throne to William the Conqueror, that is when it happened. And it's disputed on if that actually happened. Some people try to say that the events in 1064 where Harold Godwinson travels to Normandy mm -hmm. uh, support that. Uh, William had been nominated the heir by Edward. Um, but it's also possible that uh, Harold Godwinson had relatives who were held hostage by Normandy and he's trying to ransom them back. Right. Of course again let me bring it up. Of course at this time his last name wasn't Conqueror, but I think people called him Bastard. Yeah, William the Bastard because he was he was a bastard. Uh yeah. Um Harold when he arrives in Normandy, however, was captured by the Count of Ponty, but he was rescued by William. And Harold, during this time, swears an oath to William. We don't really know what this means. The Normans later on say that it was Harold invalidating Harold's claim to the throne and giving it to William as a propaganda thing. It could have just been like, uh, we're buddies now kind of thing. And Harold heads back to England. And in 1065, a revolt happens against uh, Tosti, who was seen as overstepping his powers by the no Northumbrian nobility. Um, Edward the Confessor actually wanted to go and fight the 
rebels and help Toasty. Harold, however, says no. This shows that he has an immense power because he's telling the king what, he, what the king can and can't do. <laughs> and um, he also kind of backstabs his brother here, which is important for later. Uh, Toasty is essentially forced out of power by the Northumbrians and... Uh, one of Leofric's grandsons, Morkar, becomes the Earl of Northumbria. Mm. So this, in, every single Earl is now allied with Harold Godwinson. Cool. And it's 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 funny though, no, not like funny, funny that, or ironic maybe, not funny, but it, it, the the power base of the Godwinsons. Is where the current Anglo-Saxon king's power originally came from, the Wessex. Yeah, that is true. That the, uh, their power originates from being earls of Wessex. Now, technically, um, earldoms were not hereditary, but in practice, they were. Um, and you, uh, they were given royal estates for as long as they were the Earl. It wasn't theirs, but in practice, it wasn't like that, so that's why they're able to gain so much power. Well, technically, I think that at this time, the the kingdom wasn't hereditary. It wasn't, what was it called? The the council or something? Uh, the Witten and Yemot? What? The, the Witten the Witten yeah, the Witten and Gave him the power, kind of. I heard. Yeah, they usually elected the monarch, um, but the, even though it was technically hereditary election, but yeah, it, stuff like that. Um, it is suggested by some that not being allowed to go after the rebels caused immense stress to Edward the Confessor that would lead to his death soon after in 1066, which is in the next slide. Because this is a very, very, very important year. Edward dies with no heir in January of 1066. Technically, right. there's... What? I was going to say, wow, you mean not having sex, sex with the woman you, you don't like made you have no heir? That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was Edgar Atheling, of course, but nobody cared about him. <laughs> and Harold well, was the one... Well, because he was blind anyway, so... No. <laughs> ha Edgar wasn't blind, no. Oh, sorry, I, I, meant, I meant Alfred. His Edward's yeah. half-brother was... Uh, but Harold had most of the support. Essentially, all of the earls were on his side, um, and he had immense military and political power. So he quickly coronates himself as king. Now, William says that he's supposed to be king because he was promised in 1052 by Edward, according to him, uh, that now he was king. And so, he also, what? Yeah, I can say that you're going to say it. Like he's like, I'm to be king. Hey, hey, Mister Pope. You, you, you know this guy made a promise, he broke it. So I'm king, right? And Pope's like, yeah, sure, sure, whatever. Yeah, the Pope supports William's claim to the throne. Uh, William also cites 1064 as Harold essentially saying that he wasn't allowed to become king anymore. But Harold says that on Edward's deathbed. He told he said that Harold was supposed to become king. It wasn't, uh, of course, Edward's choice. But yeah, you know. say, don't you just love like yeah? He told us it before right before he died. I was I, I was a witness. He told he told me to be king. <laughs> you can trust yeah, him. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So these are the two strongest claims to the throne, and the Pope ends up backing uh, William of Normandy. So. Essentially, a bunch of people in France now flock to the Norman side to head across 
uh, the uh, and head head across the channel. I say, but first, meanwhile, we had a little problem with Harold's Harold's brother up north. <laughs> yeah, so Harold was actually on the south coast with the army, uh, waiting for William to come, but the winds weren't favorable and. Uh, William wasn't able to cross the channel. So on the 8th of September of the of 1066, Harold disbands the army. When suddenly up north, uh, Toasty is getting a uh, picked up in Scotland by a dude from earlier, Harold Hardrada, who has the weakest claim to the throne, but he's like, eh, let's try it anyway. <laughs> Because sometimes, uh, and he, like I say, sometimes it's not the claim; it's the, it's the army. It's the army behind the claim. Yeah, exactly. That's how it kind of was with Harold as well. But you know, you know, they they, they got their schemes. They've got their their justifications. Harold Andrade is just like an old school Viking, and he's like, "Yeah, let's conquer this bitch." Um, and eight days after Har Harold disbands the army. Here is Harald Hardrada in uh, Northumbria. Harald now has to rapidly bring his forces back together and march quickly up into Northumbria. Edwin and Morcar, the grand the grandsons of Leofric, they uh, have a force up in Northumbria that meets um, Harald Hardrada at Fulford on the 20th of September, but the army is absolutely massacred. This isn't, a, this isn't a good start for the English, uh, but only four days after the battle of Fulford in immense, like amazing speed, Harold reaches the area. And the next day he squares off with Harold Hardrada and his brother Tosti who decided to support Harald Hardrada. Not because he was bitter. Don't, don't, don't you say it was because he was bitter. Okay, it was because he was bitter. <laughs> uh, and the Battle of Stamford Bridge happens. And the, the Norse are absolutely... Uh, the treatment they gave to the English at Fulford, they now got back from the English at Stamford Bridge. Awesome. Uh, barely any ships were able to escape. Harald Hardrada, a man who had fought all across the Mediterranean, dies. Tosti also dies, and 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 then as I said, and then meanwhile, while he was up north, the winds down south suddenly changed. Yes, and now because the fleet, uh, Harald's fleet. And uh, his army is up north. The next day, the 26th of September, without fear of being harassed at all, William now crosses the channel at night. And is like, oh, shit. Now I have to go all the way back down there? Oh. If only, if only my dad was able to convince Edward to stop Harald Hardrada from taking Denmark. Ugh. That's probably what he's thinking right now. Like, oh my gosh. Because there's a good chance that if he didn't have to go up north, he might have been able to defeat William. Yeah. Or, or maybe he might of value. Or maybe, or maybe if my brother's from such pricks. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. Um... To be fair, he was kind of a prick to his brother. His brother's getting revolted against him. He's like, no, 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 don't act. Don't act. This is to my advantage. <laughs> so now Harold has to march all the way back down. And on the 14th of October, this is all happening really quick, by the way. Is, this is insane. Harold has marched up and down in only a matter of like a month. And That's insane. Yeah, and well, this and this is the time before cars, you know. So 
traveling, even even across a small country, got let's uh, England was, took a while. Yeah, uh, they're moving one hundred times faster than the Russian army in Ukraine. Insane. <laughs> A uh, little dig at Russia. I'm sorry. Um, so a battle occurs. Essentially, the Anglo-Saxons, who are re- renowned infantry, they, they're in a shield wall. They're up on the hill. And uh, William of Normandy with his Normans, who are mostly cavalry-based, they have to charge uphill. And they constantly charge uphill with horses. But horses don't like going after people with sticks pointed at them and with a lot of essentially a forest of spears. Horses won't do that. Horses will not do that. So they're constantly retreating and everything. Eventually the English think they've won the battle. People are talking about William dying in battle. So they're like, Oh, this is our chance. This is our chance to chase after the enemy, destroy them, uh, take, take captives, get some money, which is, will be nice, and they run after the Norman cavalry into a swamp, man. A swamp. And a they, swamp! And they, plus, they broke their defense. <laughs> plus, they broke it. their renowned defense, and now, all of a sudden, uh, the cavalry turns back, smashes into the English. Uh, their excellent defense against the bows that are being shot at them that's gone. People are getting shot. Harold eventually gets shot in the eye. Harold's siblings die. Uh, it's bad. Harold dies. The English have lost. Oh, they were uh, doing so good. Uh, you, I, I just thought of something right there. If you believe in what's it called? Irony or or karma and stuff? Not really, but you know, it's like uh, it, like it was it was Harold's dad that bl- blinded the eye of the one guy, and now he, his son gets blinded the eye. <laughs> yeah, but oh my gosh, they were doing so well, and then they lost discipline, and now this wasn't actually the final move in this war. A lot of people think that this is when William becomes king. No, the survivors actually flee to London. And they now make Edgar Atheling king. The guy nobody cared about is now king. Uh, supported by Edwin, Morcar, and the Archbishop of York. Uh, William moves east, actually, and starts solidifying his control of the south. And then pushes north. And it seems that the uh, supporters of Edgar are just like, Ugh, we're screwed. We're just going to surrender. And that's when William is crowned king uh, on Christmas Day of 1066. Um, It is said that William was being crowned as his guards were sacking and setting fire to the suburbs west of London, by the way. So... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I, I heard the thing that said said they were... Again, I know that people they say people were cheering for him. They thought it was a revolt, so they killed him. <laughs> yeah. William does a lot of bad things. Like, like yay! Uh, like, yay! William! Like, oh, I, don't, I don't understand. Are they saying yay or boo? It must be boo. Let's kill him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, now we come into the reign of William. The first of the Norman family tree. So William tries to make himself out as the legitimate heir of Edward the Confessor. And this is why I put a question mark in the beginning. Does Anglo-Saxon England actually end? It depends on your definition. If you mean Anglo-Saxons ruling England, well, yeah. No more Anglo-Saxons ever come to the throne. And technically, no no family originally born in England ever comes back to the throne. The closest you get is the Tudors are from Wales. That's the closest you get. 
However, ultimately, most of the institutions stay in place. A lot of the English are no, long, are no yeah. longer in these why, institutions. Why Rockwell is it broken? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, there's some changes, but ultimately you get the Earl, the Sheriff, the Shire. These are the thing. These are the institutions that are kept in place. Ultimately, yeah, yeah, I think the only change is is he is he he really really, really does is he brings the bear his barons down in Normandy replaced the earls up in England. <laughs> Originally, he doesn't even do that. He try. He actually leaves Edwin and Morcar in power, and a lot of English landholders keep. Their land. Now he does levy a fine for confirmation that they hold the land, uh, and this, the, these uh, fines are heavy. So a lot of people end up losing all their money and having to sell their lands to Normans anyway. But still, they they ultimately uh, keep keep their lands at first. Uh, the family that loses most out of this are the Godwinsons. They lose all of their land and, and yeah, I wonder why. why. (laughs) Yeah. And all of their lands are in, uh, redistributed to the incoming Mormons. Mormons. Oh my God. (laughs) Normans. Close. No. (laughs) Yeah. The Mormon barons. Uh, (laughs) so, to the Normans. But then a disturbance begins in the north. A disturbance in the force. And that's, and that's when he starts his castle building? Well, he started his castle building almost immediately. Where he landed in Pevensey, uh, he built a castle immediately. He builds a lot of castles, but a lot of it is actually castles built by the incoming Nor- Norman lords that build castles on their territory instead. And it's been uh, said of this time that this was a a big pa- a big uh, tool of colonization of England. Uh, they use these castles as a weapon, not as a defense, but as a weapon, essentially. But, yeah. Um, in 1069, Morcar and Edwin had fled the court by now um, with Edgar, Atheling, uh, and the North, North rises up in rebellion. And William is very brutal in putting down this rebellion. Uh, initially, the rebels actually take York, but... It doesn't last, and William comes in and burns everything to the ground. Uh, it's actually uh, you. William gave us a great primary source for the changes from Anglo-Saxon landhold uh, landholders to Norman landholders with uh, what's called the Domus Day Book, or in modern English, it'd be the Doomsday Book because. You can't escape it except for if the doomsday happens. That's why it's called that. Um, and it records this massive devastation that there's very little estates, and the estates that are left are kind of poor up in the area because he he really messes them up. And this convinces him, this essentially convinces him to remove all, almost all Englishmen from power. Now all the clergy is mostly Norman. Most of the landholders are Norman. Um, I think by the, excuse me, by the end of this, only 5% of land, of land will be owned by English aristocrats. Now that doesn't mean there weren't English people that supported him. Uh, there were actually English uh, thanes, which the Anglo-Saxon word for knight, essentially. There were thanes that did support him and even campaigned with him in France. But 
most of them are now gone are gone but the ones who survive they do support him and there's only five percent of them so <laughs> so it's either get with the program or get loose out with the loose starts to your power yeah uh by 1087 only one uh bishop was english um so all of these important positions uh gone Uh, and now we get to, in 1072, he campaigns in Scotland to force Scotland to stop supporting rebels. Um, in 1085, the king of Denmark actually was like, I'm going to conquer England now. But then he was murdered before he could even leave. That was fun. Um, <laughs> poor guy. Uh... He, William campaigned a lot in uh, France, of course, because the French king didn't like that William now was a king, but also his vassal, but also not his vassal because he's a king. Yeah, uh, very confusing. Yeah, well, I, 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 well, in the future, French and their and their vassals, in the future, half of France would be half of France's. Half the 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 France vassal land would be one of the king of England in a few hundred years, hundred years or so. Yeah, uh, France since the beginning of the Capetians had a big problem with their vassals having more power than them. Um, uh, I think like when Hugh Capet, the founder of the Capetian dynasty, was king, uh, the king only really held direct control over the Ile de France, which is the area around Paris. So... Because I think he was the kind of Paris before. Yeah. Uh, and essentially, if he ever left Paris, he was going to get captured and stuff like that. So, the French monarchs ha were working uphill from the beginning of the Capetians to actually controlled uh, their kingdom more than the dukes. And this is just another one of those examples where a powerful duke now goes off and becomes king of, of one of the wealthiest kingdoms at the time, which is includes. Um, William dies while on campaign in France. He, I think he was thrown from his horse and he's fat and he's ugly. Because he's stupid. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, he was really fat. Uh, he's, yeah. the, he's the first English monarch, by the way, to be buried outside of England. So there's that. Yeah. Wasn't there a thing where they say he couldn't could fit inside the old coffin or something? Or something like, I forget. Yeah, uh, he couldn't fit inside the coffin. And they were forcing, in the, they were forcing him into it. And they punctured his body. So now all of this nasty bile and blech is just, so they cut they cut his funeral short because nobody could stand the smell. That's just funny, you know, like <laughs> so even a bigger coffin now, just stuff him in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um after his death of his four sons. Three of them challenge for the throne, but only two at first. Yeah. The it's, third? It's, it's, it's weird, though. They have the power. They all got it eventually, but he, he, I guess in the... For, I don't know what, what it was. Like, 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 okay, I'll give my oldest son this part and my uh, next son this part instead of giving all the one king. Like, now it was... It was the, they did that a lot in, in the French... In, 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 in some of the family tree, families back then. Get everything to one kid now. Let's divide it up. <laughs> well, it actually more seems like William be William Rufus William the Second became king just because he so happened to be in England at the time, yeah. so okay. he was able to get the throne and over uh, Normandy. So he got the got Norman Normandy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the third son played a more sneaky game. Before he becomes king, he played the wrong Henry. He played, he played the long game because eventually he got power of both. 
Yeah. Um, uh, William Rufus took control of England. Him and his brother, Robert Curtos, um, they, they fought a lot. But eventually, uh, William is murdered, probably, by his third brother, Henry, who becomes Henry I in 1100. And quickly, Henry, to solidify his power, marries a Scottish princess named Edith. Who happened to but, be the the the, the grand either the, the like the granddaughter of the Edward the Exile, I think. He, yep, and uh, this was a way of increasing his legitimacy. His nobles were like, "No, don't do it. She's uh, she's English. Don't do it. Her name's Edith. That's an English name." Uh, oh, so so she's Matilda. forced to, yeah. So she's forced to change her name to Matilda. Like, yeah, like she like she may be English, but you know. You know the, the English people might, might might enjoy the fact that she's the bloodline of the the, the the Saxons, you know. So you know, legitimacy and all that stuff. Like like later on, on our future thing, we talked about Henry the Seventh, how he conquered England by by the conquest, but you know, he's still like, no, I'm going to marry the the daughter of Edward the Fourth, just 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 because. Yeah, propaganda. It's in, it's very important in legitimacy stuff like that. Um. Eventually, he triumphs over Robert in 1106 and unites the realm. Uh, and uh, Robert, I think, actually essentially sold him the duchy in order to go on yeah, crusade. He, well, I think he actually sold it. He sold it to uh, his brother William. But then, when William died, Henry's like, "It's my debt now." <laughs> yeah. So uh, Henry ends this, the king and duke, and he's got everything. Sadly, his son dies in a freak accident. Probably not actually a freak accident. Everybody on the boat was drunk as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, his son dies in a... But, but luckily or unluckily, his nephew got off the boat beforehand. <laughs> Was yes, Stefan of Blois, yeah. Um, uh, eventually that creates a new period, but yeah, the, the Norman dynasty doesn't last very long. <sighs> so now... Yeah, I guess I say, but again, we go into more detail in the future, but I said he, uh, but he marries his daughter off to another landowner in France. <laughs> Yes, Geoffrey Plantagenet. Uh, so now let's talk about how Eng how much England changed and how much it didn't change. Uh, elite discourse used to be in English, of course. Now it's in Norman French. Uh, most of the government documents were in English, some were in Latin, but now Latin becomes the language of government. This centralized standard old English language is no longer used, and because of that, even the parts of the Anglo Saxon chronicles that survive until the 1070s, they was it the 1070s? It, yeah, it was the 1070s. No, I didn't write it down. Who cares? Uh, essentially, part of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles continues, but instead of being in this standardized Old English, it's now written in local vernacular. People, this centralization of languages that sort of happens in, in strong countries where standardized languages occur, it breaks up, and now you have multiple different um, dialects of English running rampant and being used even by the people like the the more elite people uh, when they're especially um, priests and stuff as they start um, trying to write about the past and are writing in English because funnily enough the church lost a lot of land during the Norman conquest and they 
they used their connection to the English past to try to get their land back. <laughs> so this is why they have this is why we get histories of England later on where we actually get focused on England before the Norman conquest and why we don't really completely forget about it. We forget about a lot, but we don't completely forget about it in uh, the way the English see themselves. Because the people who write histories, of course, they have a vested interest in remembering Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, I already talked about how only 5% of landowners were now English. Um, another thing that William did was he broke up the larger earldoms. So now instead of Wessex, you have all of the different shires within the Wessex. Instead of Mercia, you have the, all the different shires in Mercia. They each have their own earl. And, or did they, I, I have a question about that though. Is the term earl still around or were they replaced by the term barons at this time? Barons are smaller landholders than earls. I, I was I was wondering if the I was, okay I was wondering if the barons that came up from uh, Normandy this became replaced the earls of the earldom like we're barons we're just barons now instead of earls. So in England, uh, the hierarchy is king, duke, earl, baron. Okay. That, that's the hierarchy. Okay, I, I didn't know if the, like I said I didn't know if the the baron this became the earls. The new barons from the, the, the you know what I'm saying to say the barons from normally became yeah yeah but ultimately okay. uh, earls the title of earl was more ceremonial now the people who actually held power were the sheriffs the shire reeves these people who are, are now the people who have the real power in the shires and. You start getting stories about how these sheriffs really fucking suck. <laughs> like, like a little, like a little future, like, like say, like a little future sheriff of, of a certain of, mythology. Yeah, Nottingham, <laughs> Nottingham. Uh, yeah, the sheriffs were essentially corrupt and used a lot of their power in a, in order to help their political friends gain power in their in their shire stuff like that. Um, all. All of this land that had now come into the possession of William, he had to give it up to different people. And instead of putting it, instead of putting one large landholder in a locality where they can gain power there, he instead he instead bundles up estates where multiple different families now live in this area so that n n one of them can't get too powerful essentially ensuring that the king has more power now I, 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 even to this uh, or the and this is he also did well, uh, the, what was it called the doomsday book yeah the domesday book uh domesday, and this is this, this is how we learn a lot about who owned land uh how many English landholders survived, stuff like that. And, and also, I think, I, I think it was him, I could be wrong, though, but he, instead of, you know, every, instead of people going, instead of people uh, pledging allegiance to their most local prominent lord, he had everyone pledge allegiance to him directly. Yeah. Um, not only that, um, we start getting feudalism in England at this time. Essentially now, each estate had to provide military assistance to the king. Yeah. And, of course, now that the king has obligations on the continent, you're having war a lot more. And so these, these estates and even church estates have to figure out how they're going to give the king men. So they give out land in return for service. So that's. 
I just, I just thought about one thing out, but one thing of difference between the feudalism there and, and in France, the unlike the the dukes and whatever of France that that might have more similar or more power than the king the king of France, I guess William made sure that his feudalism subject never had much power as he did. Yeah, that that's one of the benefits of of gaining all this land at once so that you can give it out. You know, you make sure in one locality there's not one person that now has now is more rich than the others unlike in france where uh the capetians sort of inherited their situation and there's in the situation of the carolingians had been deteriorating for a long time before that yeah were the normans the the andrews and later on the uh whatever 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 reason that the Aqua oh. the Aquator's power had was more powerful than <laughs> Richard and Aquitaine. Uh, Anjou at the time was only a county, actually. Um, the, the powerful ones were Toulouse, Aquitaine. Um, but like I said, we, we, we can go into more detail on that. Like, when, if we go into more, yeah. More. Yeah. Um, you actually get a loss of a lot of the local you actually get a loss of a lot of local saints and stuff people who had founded churches founded abbeys and everything um the this was discouraged by the normans and they were now forced to have cults towards more well-known saints more universal saints so now the english saints are repressed. Another interesting thing, a lot of French newcomers were being murdered, of course, because the English weren't very happy. But William now introduced something. For if uh, you found a, if you found a French corpse in a community, uh, you could get fined with a fine called murdrum. The ancestor of murder. Uh, so this uh, d this keeps them from doing that. Of course, English, the English language changes a bit. It's a lot of people overstate the amount that French has influenced English. English largely stays grammatically well, Germanic. I, I, well, I think it's not. It's more like the terms and stuff, like like what beef and stuff. Yeah, um, the meat has a French name. The the animal has an English name. You get loan words, but I heard someone call English a Germanic French pigeon language. No, Eng English is still a Germanic language, and the influence of French is mostly just loan words. There's no real grim. There's some grammatical things that happen because of it, but you can even argue that's more because of the people from Scandinavia that moved in early on, that that caused more of the changes well, I, than I, 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 French. Yeah, I mentioned this in. Well, I, I did mention this in, in our, in like we talked with Dap the Dapper about uh, language evolution. That it was it was it's a, it was more of a horizontal gene transfer of influence than than actual yeah exactly evolution of english like a little, little, little a little subtle little thing <laughs> yeah and this is mostly because um norman society and english society these were s separated from each other yeah like um, like 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 the what was it called the the high society called it this but the the Dirty peasants called it this. <laughs> yeah, uh, the English population was mostly rural, and you don't get a lot of uh, Normans coming into this rural space. They stay on their estates. They stay in their castles, uh, rather than <laughs> rather than heading into this mingling, rural area, mingling, mingling with the common folk. Yeah, and this allows English, of course, to survive and eventually become the language 
of the government later on. And you, you actually see early on that the Normans no longer called themselves just Normans. They wanted to distinguish themselves from the continental Normans. So they called themselves Anglo Normans, stuff like that. Um, because they're starting to have more of an allegiance to their new homes. A lot of the n newcomers originally had names based off of localities in Normandy, but they start changing their last names to English localities uh, course, pretty that, soon. Of course, afterwards. of course, that didn't really come into full effect until the really until Edward the Third when he, I think, that's when it full force. I think, if I remember correctly. Richard II was the first English king to speak to his subjects in English. So okay, but that's true. Grandson. Yeah. Um, also, we see castles changing. Castles no longer have their own English flair to them. They're rebuilt in more continental styles. Uh, so, did Anglo-Saxon England end or did it just sort of have a new coat of paint paint i'm guessing it, it's up to you i personally think it's just a new coat of paint it's still it's still england it just has new rulers yeah this it's 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 like like people that buy it a donut shop or something like in my area that they they didn't think about they they kept the name they kept the the bakery they kept the type of donut they sell but it's under new ownership. Yeah, exactly. I, I people and and you can kind of see this with Edward's reign as well. People kind of overstate how much changed. What really changed was <laughs> who who had power over the kingdom and you kind of see with edward he was trying to bring in no more norman people and this is because he lived in normandy for 24 years of course um but like, like i said once both once both edward Ethelred the unready and canute married married under, and into the norman family it was all that's, that's really that's all she wrote <laughs> it was all down the hill from there <laughs> But yeah, ultimately, England now is more involved in continental politics, but it's it's just it's still England. So this is what I wrote my uh, uh, this is what I wrote my uh, college paper on. So your thesis, your thesis for your master's or your doctorate? No, no, I only have a bachelor's degree. Uh. But uh, you have to write a final paper for that too. I, my whole thing was about um, uh, this idea that um, there was this sharp shift from Anglo-Saxon England to Norman England. I, I, I argued against that. All right, cool. All right, so. And there it ends. There's our little series on the Anglo-Saxons. Yep. So, yep. Now that, so now that the time of the bead has come to his, at least his time frames come to an end, how, how do you feel? Are you talking to me or are you talking to the chat? Well, you, since you are, you are the bead. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I I detest the Normans. They suck. Ah, bring back the true rulers. Screw these Norman pigs. That's how I feel. No, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's just interesting. I enjoy this period very much because it it it, it has multiple different intense societal changes and it all comes a lot from the continent and this constant flow of continent to the islands and it's very interesting and it gets it gets less interesting as you go along but you know yeah it also gets I, less mysterious but that might be why 
yeah, I think around this time, if I remember the the also if I remember the the climate around this time, England was pretty. England was, was still little, England up there was was still, was a little a little warm area. It wasn't the cold England we have today? Um, I don't know about that. I know that um, large portions of East Anglia were were just swamp. I know that. Um, <laughs> so, so also around York there was a massive swamp, but that's oh really? Because I I heard I heard it was before before that for up north for a while they even had I, I think around this time they even had grapes that rivaled the grapes of France. Uh, that could that could be possible. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I saw. I think I I saw when I read a book about the cool little ice age of of Europe of the, the 1500s. Yeah, well, that's um, more climate history than government history, but. Yeah, but I, yeah, we get it gets a lot less mysterious from here, and the mystery is sort of fun. But you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I, for, 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 we haven't talked about we talked about this a little bit. In the future, we can talk about either the fa each of the individual families of English dynasty, like the Normans, the Plet. Tazanis, the Tudors, the Stuarts, the Hanovers, and all, all of them, or we can also go into in, into the individual reigns of each king, because unlike the uh, previous Anglo-Saxon ones, we probably have a lot more information now going forward now of each than we had beforehand. If you actually full whole episode up, yeah, um, I thought it would be kind of cool to like rank monarchs of different kingdoms or even like like kingdoms that we might have lesser knowledge on but like, like a, just have like, me me sit here and rank them and then be like, like this is a, why a, this one's good and this is why this one fucking sucks yeah <laughs> you know that, that. so look forward to that but we well we, for the at least we did it beforehand, our first tier chart on Talking Time with Caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> S rank to why were they from, from, sorry, from the highest of S rank to the bottom of why were they king again? <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are definitely some kings there just because they happen to be kids, but, <laughs> but, but that right. will be in a future date. Next, right. For next week, April the first. I I have nothing planned for April Fool's Day episode, but who knows? Things can change. And then two weeks from now, we we'll, we'll be going back to the entertainment industry. Where we talk about Tommy McGuire and his Spider-Man trilogy. But but if you want to help the, help the stream out, click. Scan either the donate link up there, the Amazon wish list to help, to help, help, help upgrade the studio a little bit. So we're not, I'm not, so we're not running on, on Wi-Fi, but until, but until the beat is back again, never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>